Good morning, gamers. We're back for another really long podcast, maybe. <laughs> you know, I posted the previous thing and um, immediately got a whole bunch of really positive comments. People really like these. I'm quite happy to keep making them. It takes up much less space on my hard drive than uh, video, like phone videos, even though it's basically the same thing. And it also means I don't have to use my phone, which is the phone is really annoying because I'm playing TF2 at the same time. If you can hear like keyboard noises, um, yeah. Having to use a phone is really annoying. Like, the last thing I needed my phone for, <laughs> unless I'm going out, was recording video. And it's annoying to have to get the video off the phone. It's annoying to, like, run out of battery. It's annoying to run out of storage. Um, no longer an issue, because this is all on a computer, a real computer. So I'm quite happy to keep making these, uh, if you'll keep watching them. And from the comments, it seems like you're quite happy to keep watching them. So anyway, I'll, I'll get off of this topic now. Um, fuck, I started recording because I had something to say. <laughs> God damn it. I did an intro. I did a goddamn intro instead of saying my piece. That's fucking annoying. Oh well. I remembered what I was gonna say. It was extre- The reason I forgot it is because it's an extremely random way to start a podcast. Um, and it is. It is this. There's a lot of. Okay. It, maybe there's not a lot. Maybe I see a disproportional amount. But it seems like there's discourse that often focuses on like what early humans ate. What was the diet of early human? Like vegans, they love this. They look, uh, everyone who has some weird diet, like vegans or fucking, uh, you know, the Jordan Peterson meat only diet, they love to say that, like, the paleo, that's what they call it, right? Like, they love to try and make their diet seem less weird by trying to insinuate that actually this is what early humans ate. So, you know, I've seen vegans make this claim, like, well, you know, other apes, they're mainly vegetarian almost entirely, which, by the way, isn't true uh, if you count bugs as animals, <laughs> if bugs don't count as vegetables, which I don't think bugs are vegetables. And uh, every monkey that is like mainly vegetarian also eats insects. So uh, there's that. Uh, but then, yeah, obviously there's the other side where people are like, oh man, our ancestors, they were eating like raw elk and shit. It's like, okay, let me tell you the truth about what, the, uh, and I've done research on this. I've done more research on this than clearly than these people. The truth is early humans ate whatever the fuck they had around, okay? They didn't, they weren't picky because they needed to survive. They, <clears throat> like, if you, if, if you had a bunch of like megafauna around and, and it was easy to hunt and get meat, you ate meat. If you, if there wasn't that around, you didn't eat any meat. They, they like, there's, it depends where you live. If you, if you're an early human and you live near a lake or the ocean, you're eating a bunch of fish. There's no question about it. You're eating a bunch of fish. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't live near a lake or a river or something or the sea, you probably didn't eat any fish because how are you going to get fish, right? Like it's very obvious. People just ate whatever was nearby and practical to eat. There was no like, oh, the real diet we're supposed to have is uh, this, this, and this. No, there were, the, 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 you can't compare. I mean, you, the, the, the reason I know this is because, of, firstly, there's archaeological evidence of early humans um, doing all sorts of different stuff, right? Like there's a, a fairly recent archaeological find. There's actually pre-Homo sapien uh, site uh, of like a, some sort of early human ancestor, uh, and it's a butchery site where they were they were using this particular place to butcher animals. Um, and this is like you know a very long time ago. So clearly, people in this particular place ate animals. That doesn't mean that all early humans ate a really meat-rich diet. It just means people in this particular place ate animals. So I think that particular archaeological site disproves this vegan idea that early humans n almost never ate meat. I mean, they did. They, they ate meat. Nonsense. Um, but uh, yeah, the other, there's, there's other archaeological evidence for this. Like, for example, um, uh, grain, gra evidence of like grains in the teeth of like early human skeletons or human ancestors skeletons so like you, people started eating grains before we started cultivating grains um but that aside the other pieces the other thing you can look at which might not be as indicative of early humans but is definitely better than nothing is the way that current hunter like currently existing hunter gatherers societies what they eat and 
what they eat is whatever the fuck they have around. Like, you look at certain um, hunter-gatherers in, I believe, certain Polynesian islands, and you know what they, they be eating? They eat a lot of fucking sugar. They eat sugar cane, like, constantly, because it just grows there in abundance, and they just eat loads of sugar cane. But then there are other places where the hunt, like, in certain parts of Africa, where there are hunter-gatherer tribes that almost exclusively eat meat. Uh, and then there are other places where the tr- in in uh, certain tropical environments where the hunter gatherers eat loads and loads of fruit. It de- just depends where you fucking live. Like the, they they just eat ate whatever was around. I hate this discourse about like actually the natural diet that our ancestors ate is blah 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 nonsense. There is no natural diet that our ancestors ate because they just ate whatever they had access to. The the one thing we do know is they definitely cooked their food and they and we have lots of evidence that they ate lots of different things in different places. Like that's that's the thing we know there is no like standard diet that's like humans are meant to eat this like historically not real doesn't exist once again another mogul ma- i don't know mogul males i don't know i, I shouldn't complain about mogul it's like if uh if fucking mice criticals videos were actually you know like respected your time <laughs> i've always hated them. i've always not liked them. okay I, hate is a strong word i've never liked most criticals fucking videos right like he he he's not very funny. I don't understand why everyone thinks he's funny. And the videos they they go on for too damn long. I don't know. But mogul mail's like like the the time efficient version of critical. So I, I anyway sorry. The video about Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast. Mr. Bean. The thing about Mr. Bean, right? Mr. Bean is that everyone wants to hate him because of course he's a very hateable guy. But no one really has a good reason to hate him. But that j- I've already talked about this in the podcast. It's the Bono effect. Someone's just too perfect. They're just too good. Everyone hates them. But it, p- fucking Zoomers are too young to understand Bono as a cultural reference point. Like, I, I th- guys, spread this meme, okay? Spread the, spread the meme about Mr. Beast being, like, comparable to Bono. And also, like, it's... Because it's so... Like, here's, here's my take. I'm going to have an actually nuanced take on this in a second. I'm actually going to tell you what I, the actual thing I think in a second. But first, I'm going to say some dumb shit. Uh, there's good reasons to not like Mr. Beast, but... And I understand that the philanthropy stuff he does leaves a bad taste in people's mouth because it should. It should point out the problems of, you know, capitalism, right? It should, it should point, point to the fact that we shouldn't need this or whatever. Um, and it does feel weird. It's hard to describe how it feels weird, but it somehow feels manipulative and weird. I understand it. I think it's like the conspicuousness of it all, that it's like... He's making such a big deal out of it. And I understand it's like, you actually want him to do that because those views that he gets drive revenue into his charity, which means more, you know, money to donate to good causes or whatever. So the actual conspicuousness of it does help the charitable cause, but it feels bad. (laughs) It feels like bad. Uh, okay, so now my real point, and I've talked about this before. I think it's a big, big issue that we're facing. Uh, and I'm not the first person. I, I love when I just spend 10 years, like, pre-stating everything about the point I'm about to make, just to get ahead of, like, fucking imaginary people in the comment section who are about to call me out, where I have to, like, get ahead of it by saying a bunch of shit before I say the thing that I actually want to say. It's so annoying. I'm so fucking internet brain rot. Um, anyway, uh, me, there's a there, there's a big problem of like a, a severe lack of media literacy in the world like we live in times that are more dominated than ever by media and yet no one has any understanding of how to analyze or think critically about media and uh in like a reasonable way but they all think they do because they spend so much time watching media uh, and so I think this is the... Uh, and the problem is that we we live in postmodern time. Everyone's accepted that, like, uh, th- you know, there is no objectively good or objectively bad media, right? And if you start to turn and say shit like that, people generally will call you out on it, which I think is fairly reasonable. Um, oh, oh, I hit the pipe! I hit the goddamn pipe! Yo, okay, sorry. <laughs> that was a foot. I didn't get the kill, so it wasn't a clip, but I did get some splash damage, and it was, he was far away. It was cool. Anyway, um, people want to t- hate on media being bad because they don't like it, right? They see Mr. Beast videos, and they're like, this fucking sucks, because it does. And then, 
but they know either they don't have the there's two two possibilities they don't have the the like normal media criticism vocabulary tools to accurately critique it and explain why it's bad like the the most obvious criticism of Mr Beast's videos is that they're manipulative like they feel emotionally manipulative in the same way reality tv does because they use the same sort of techniques that reality tv does and i think you know you can you can there's a whole bunch of other similar criticism you could make of Mr Beast stuff these people don't have the tools to talk about that uh the other thing is a lot of these sorts of people they actually like a lot of reality tv right there's a there's a, there's a um a pushback like there's this weird uh sort of uh, uh dichotomy between people who uh want to critique sort of shitty manipulative media like reality tv and then the sort of class analysis where you're saying like hold on a minute like let's take a look at what you're actually saying you're saying that like the art that is majority enjoyed by the working class a sort of low art you're like heavily critiquing that and positioning high art in opposition which tends to be associated with middle class and upper class people it's like hold on a minute how much of this is actually genuine critique and how much of this is and this is a complex issue right this is something that is pretty fucking de- hotly debated in academic circles you know all the time this is not something you could expect randos on twitter to have good or nuanced takes on because that's what the fundamental Mr Beast problem is it's like it's low art it's also shitty but how much of the fact that we don't like it is because it brings up connotations of like you know our uh resentment for lower class things associated with the working class and how much of it is actually just because it's bad uh and if it is bad how can we quantify that uh you know like how can we say that our opinions on it being bad have any merit if there is no objective measures of quality um now the answer to this or at least a part there's no solid answer this is just a complex subject um but but the partial answer to this is that um most people and this happens a lot on the internet where uh, a lot of like high brow academic discourse sort of trickles down and gets turned into like pop science uh, on the internet so when when academics are talking about or or rather when people who know their shit it doesn't have to be academics are talking about how like there are no objective standards of quality for art um they don't then go on to say and therefore no one can ever critique anything the way it works is you 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 do have to couch everything in context but the text still exists um so it's like even though people's responses to the text might be different you can analyze the text and that is sort of intersubjective uh right uh, so that does that means that there is some maybe not objective criticism but there is some like criticism you can make that doesn't entirely stem from uh you know just talking about your emotions with regards to a certain text right so like uh you can you can talk about the techniques being used you can make and those techniques actually exist within the text as much as anything else can exist within the text right like a lot so this sort of nothing is objectively good or bad is true but you can talk about whether something is effective or not like that doesn't mean you can't talk about how how something works uh so like you could say um you know Mr Beast videos are uh using uh, sort of manipulative uh, techniques borrowed from reality TV um and then you can qualify that by picking specific examples from the text of like musical cues or something like that and talking about uh it, it's cultural its position in culture like what it, what it is generally associated with signifying and how it's being used in the text and whether you think that's effective uh, or uh, what sort of effects you think it's it's actually achieving versus what you think it's intending to achieve versus like uh, you know and so on and then you can r- relay that all back to your own personal subjective experience of the text like right? it's complicated this sort of stuff it's not easy there's a lot of there's a lot of depth and layers to it uh, you can't boil it Uh, but no one wants to do that right either they don't have the ability to they're not informed enough to do that or they want to seem like they don't want it to be subject right they don't want uh to make some point that can be easily refuted with that's just like your opinion man or they don't have the capacity because they're on twitter where you don't have the space to do something like this to actually make a nuanced point so instead um 
what the general uh, response to this problem is of media criticism is hard and complicated and there, there kind of are and aren't any right answers but uh, you know we, things are both subjective and intersubjective and it's, it's a whole weird mishmash and complicated uh, like system that you're analyzing with, with, with all sorts of aspects to it right whatever um, there was the, the response to that being too hard is to say well I can just critique it on a moral level. Because as we all know, morals, those must be objective, right? And so media criticism has has gone from, or at least in the, the, the wider public sphere, just boils down to, I think this media is morally wrong and shouldn't exist. Because if you just say, I don't like it, like, who cares? Anyone can not like something. You're not going to get any any interaction with that. You're not going to get any likes. You're not going to go viral with that, right? But if you can, if you can somehow point out how this media is like morally wrong rather than just being bad, then suddenly your critique has more merit to it. More people will see it. And this isn't just a problem in, you know, I, I've been holding academia up to this sort of high regard, but this isn't just a problem on Twitter. It's also a problem in academia. And it's due to the way funding is given that like no one's going to fund your media criticism department if you're, or your whatever. There's no, I don't think there's an academic thing called media criticism department no one's going to fund your media studies department or something like this, film studies department, anything like that. If all you're talking about is, I liked this movie, I didn't like this movie, right? That doesn't seem very important. In order to get funding, you have to make it seem like you deserve the funding because the stuff you're doing is really important. And so that tends to push people towards making moralizing statements um, about things in general, not just media, but all over academia, and talking about policy and politics. Like, I deserve this funding, not because the stuff I'm doing, it's not just talking about movies. You know, like, this stuff can affect policy. This stuff, this stuff has an important repercussions on the way our society is going to operate. So, of course, I deserve that grant, right? Like, that's the way that the mechanics of academia push you towards. Um, like, because fundamentally, as an academic, the, the single thing that you're pushed to say is this could be dangerous. That's all you, that's like, if you can, if you can, you, you are massively incentivized towards making that particular statement, this could be dangerous. And this affects all, uh, actually it doesn't affect all roles of academia. Like the, the further you are away from politics, the, the less uh, this happens. Like you don't see very much of this in like pure theoretical physics or mathematics or anything like that. But the closer you get to something that could have any effect on politics, so social sciences and stuff like that, the more you're going to see people making points about how this could be dangerous. But it of course also sp spreads to, um, I mean, hey, if you want to get really, really hot takey. Actually, you know what? I won't say that on YouTube. It's a little... Uh, Maybe a little too spicy. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that's the that's the problem, is that people can't just sit there and be like, Mr. Beast video bad because emotionally manipulative, it doesn't feel genuine, uh, and, and, you know, it uses techniques that aren't very effective or uh, that give you all sorts of impressions and connotations, and you can talk about that in a nuanced way. No one wants to do that because you can just say, this could be dangerous. You want to know something crazy that's happening to me? Sort of happening to me? Uh... This guy by the name of Unim, uh, you may be aware, of, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a guy by the name of Unim, and uh, this guy's like at uni creating some kind of, uh, I don't know, in some sort of classical music program, contemporary classical something in Denmark. And this guy is running a, uh, tomorrow, as of recording, a, uh, some sort of screening of something that they have titled Denpertube Metamix. And now we'll read from the event description. Denpertube Metamix is a three plus hour curatorially composed video primarily consisting of collaged clips from the depths of YouTube's niche Denpa scene. Something between a found footage documentary, an homage, a memorial, an exercise in speaking through the words of others, and an extension of my previous work with curation as composition, intertextuality, and framing YouTube quotations in otaku culture as new music. Starring No Thank You, Jalei Lane Caucus, Paz, Osaka Syndrome, Dot Smite, Unim, someone called Skirm, Skirmifulse, Fulse, I don't know, that's my terrible, I'm assuming Danish pronunciation. Please bring blankets, pillows, and whatever else will facilitate a comfy expended, extended viewing experience. Uh, <clears throat> so that's cool and crazy. There's going to be a screening of my fucking YouTube videos <laughs> in Denmark somewhere. 
Oh, that's fucking sick. And if you don't know what new music is, I didn't know that much. Unim sent me a big message ex- explaining some of the history of new music. I knew a little bit going in, and I still would say I don't know, don't understand it that much. Um, because, uh, well, it's complicated. Hold on. Du-du-du. I see. Okay. Oh, someone sent me a thing on... Oh, okay. Man, I need to check Matrix more often. Fucking hell. I'm... Okay, hold on. I gotta do shit. Remember a while ago when I was talking about this... This thing of, uh, workshops? Um, let me actually see if I can find the video. Hold on. Sorry. Should have done this. A professional... A professional would have done... Would have gotten this up before they, uh... <clears throat> um, oh, someone commented something on, oh, Unim commented, pause and select is the digibo of Isekai, there is a Girl Lies Here video called Everyone's Wrong About This Isekai that's a defensive death march to a parallel world rhapsody, based, uh, Girl Lies Here is a good YouTube channel, I like that, I haven't watched that video, um, I'm looking back, oh yeah, it was in Clink Deep Ecology, I was talking about this workshops idea, well it turns out that people have kind of been doing this, Uh, in London. They call them repair cafes, um, and there's a couple of them. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how they work, uh, but, but they do exist, and they basically seem to be exactly what I'm asking for. Uh, there's one kind of near me as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's one not too, I don't know where this is. I don't recognize this street. Well, I guess it's not that near me, so I shouldn't expect to. How close is this? I am being very careful not to reveal any location information. There's a bunch in London, is my point. This one? This one? No. This one. Oh, that's uh, it's a bit of a trek, but it's doable. Um, anyway, yeah, it seems to be basically what I was proposing. Uh, it's not as, like, well-funded, obviously, as what I was proposing, but it does exist. Um, let me see if they have a website. The Restart Project. What is this? Is this what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, they are they all run by this. I think they're all run by this non-profit called the Restart Project. So yeah, I was not fucking. I was not making it up. I I have a couple of old broken laptops. I could definitely donate. Oh, speaking of laptops, you know what I'm gonna be doing? So Dotsmite has this X two thirty that got broken. The um. The power jack at the back uh, became really loose uh, and they've been asking me to fix it for literally like a year and I finally got around to fixing it about a month and a half ago and I fixed it but in fixing it it's the first time I've ever opened up a ThinkPad and put it like in I, I've it's the first full disassembly I've ever done um, like I've done partial disassemblies but I had to do a full disassembly to get at what was broken so I had to do a full disassembly reassembly and in doing so I fucked up a tiny bit which is that when I was removing the ribbon I think I I broke the connector that the ribbon cable that connects the trackpad slots into uh, I might not have broken it I might be able to fix it I don't know either way for me that wouldn't be a problem because I don't use the trackpad on thinkpads anyway I just use the the little nubbin to control the mouse Uh, anyway, my point being, my my X220 is is a tiny bit broken, and by that I mean the fan is broken. It still works, but the fan is broken, and so I might Dotsmay is okay with this. I might commandeer their X230, change out the keyboard for my X220 keyboard, and have that be my ThinkPad. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go get myself a Yakult because I am trying to get some of that yak, some of that lactobacillus in me. I think it's time to do a little bit of restructuring of my anime top 10. I know just recently in the first of these long ass podcasts, I did a two-parter about my anime 3x3. Um, but after doing that, it sort of put into my mind that some of this stuff is kind of outdated. In particular, um, it's Evangelion. And to some extent, Lane. Like, I don't find myself thinking about Ava very often at all. Like, the way I judge how powerful a show is, is not just how much I enjoyed it in the moment, but how often I find myself thinking back on it years later. And, like, Hidemaru Sketch I think about probably 
once a day, you know, got you so I think about all the time, Lucky Star I think about all the time, No Game No Life, Kami Chu, uh, you know, all of these shows I think about constantly and they affect my life. And there was a time where, let's talk about Ava first, like Ava I think was very important to me at a certain point in my life, but I think I've learned all the lessons that Ava tries to teach. And thinking back on it, you know, it's an, it's an excellently constructed show, um, except for Magma Diver, lol 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 lol, um, it's, it's a, you know, Every frame of that show is wallpaper material, right? Like, there's nothing I can say about Ava that you don't already know and hasn't already been said a thousand times. But it's also a very adolescent show. And I think at the time when I watched it was kind of the end of my reaching adulthood, where that sort of adolescent experience was still fresh in my mind. And I was still, I mean, I still am, of course, but to a lesser extent. But at that time, I was still trying to figure out my place in the adult world more than I am now, right? And so I think it just held a lot more meaning to me at that point. And sort of the the discussion around purpose and identity and parents' relationship with your parents, all of this sort of thing, held a lot more meaning to me then when those things were just a bigger part of my life. Whereas now... You know, I live, al- I, well, I live with those quite partially, but I live alone. I don't live with my parent. I see my dad once in a while. So like that, I'm not under parental control in the same way I was. I'm comfortably in adulthood. I'm, you know, not having these identity crises like Shinji. Uh, and I don't have, yeah. So I, I just think that I've kind of moved past needing it and moved past it having that meaning in my life. So I've decided to remove Evangelion from my top 10. Still an excellent show, don't get me wrong, but yeah. Which obviously raises the question, what do I replace it with? And there's a couple of, this is this has been a question that I've been thinking about today. What the fuck replaces Evangelion on my list? So I'm gonna run you through some contenders. You got NHK New York or so. The problem with that being, I haven't actually watched the anime. The anime didn't affect me that much. I've, I've seen the anime, but I haven't watched it in years is what I was, the end of that sentence. Um, I haven't watched the anime in years, and honestly, the anime didn't affect me that much. It was the book that really spoke to me. I much prefer the book to the anime. Um, so it feels a little disingenuous putting the anime there because it would always just make me think, but really I like the book, not really the show as much. Um, so that's the first thing. The second option is perhaps Monogatari. I don't know. I've been saying I was going to rewatch Monogatari for at least three years now, and I still, or maybe less than that, but I've been saying I'm going to rewatch Monogatari for ages and I just haven't done it. I'll do that. Maybe when I get round to rewatching Monogatari, it'll go on my list or on my 10, top 10. Uh, K-On! Again, I think I've kind of... K-On doesn't... I don't think about... I don't find myself thinking about K-On that often, really. Like, it's, it's, it doesn't hold that position. Uh, and then some other options. Ping Pong. Ping Pong is also an amazing show, but again, I haven't watched it in a really long time. And also, it's... It's an amazing show, but I don't think it holds that much personal relevance to me. Like, I have a friend who fucking loves ping pong, and I I think it, like, changed their life kind of thing. Because something about some of the characters just resonated really well with them. Whereas for me, it was, like, really good, amazing, but it wasn't very personal to me. You know, I didn't recognize myself that much a show. Um, there's also the possibility of Azoken. Azo Ken is really fucking good. It's really fucking good. I might need to send a rewatch before I feel comfortable putting it on the list because because the reason I haven't put it on is because I don't really remember it that well, which makes me skeptical of how I don't know. I liked it. I know I liked it, but I don't remember it episode by episode that well. I don't know what happens in Azo Ken. They make an anime. That's all I know. And the final option is, or the final two options would be. Um, Tamayura and Aria. Uh, Tamayura Hitotose. Now, the problem with Tamayura is that I haven't finished it yet. And I don't know... Like, I like Tamayura a lot. It is really good. But I don't know if it's as good as any of the other shows on here. I don't know if it is. It might be. I just don't know. I can't, t- I can't tell you if it's as good. And Aria is the same. I do really like it. I think it might have to be the first season of Aria. It might have to be. Because that is really... That's a really good show, man. That is a really fucking good show. I was also kind of thinking about Renkin... Renkin Sankyu Magikaru Pokan. Renkin Sankyu Magikaru Pokan. 
That's a great fucking show. Love that show. That's also a possible... Poss- that's also up there, you know? That's actually really tempting. I love that show a lot. That is definitely one of my favorite. I don't feel uncomfortable putting that on there, actually. I think, I think you know what? I think I'm going to send it. I think that's what we replace Ava with. Let's do it. I think we replace Ava with Denkin Sankyu Magikaru Bokan. Because I do fucking love that show. Yeah, that's a great show. Okay, the second thing is I'm been, I want to demote Lane. I'm not going to take Lane off the list. I'm just going to demote it to the bottom. I might take Lane off the list. Because it's like Ava. It's like I had my Lane period where Lane was the only thing in the world I fucking cared about. And then I just got it. Like, it's, it's no longer relevant. I never think about Lane at all. I've, I've, I've explored that anime fully. Everything that could possibly exist about Lane has existed in my mind at some point. There was nothing about it I don't, I haven't thought about. It's just, I've finished it. I beat, if it was a video game, I beat the final boss. I've hundred percented it. You know, I've, I've replayed it. I, it's like, there's nothing left in that show for me. I've picked it fucking dry. And so I just don't think about it anymore. It doesn't hold any meaning to me. Uh, yeah, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is good to, to replace Lane. I could, I could replace Lane with Aria. I wouldn't feel too bad doing that. Or here's a here's a crazy idea. Crazy idea for you. Replace Lane with the fucking with Daikon. With fucking Daikon. Hear me out here. Now I, I mean no one's gonna no one's I feel like you can't complain with Daikon, right? Like everyone gets it. You get it? Daikon, the fucking you know, Twilight. I only meant to stay a while. You know what I'm saying? You know what the fuck I'm saying? Like, come on now. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. That is just a pure expression of anime. The only reason I feel a little uncomfortable with Daikon is it's so short, first of all, and it's so outdated, second of all. Like, it represents an anime of a time gone by, which does does make me sort of demote it in my mind a little bit. But I did think about it. It's definitely a possibility. You know what other show I fucking love? I might rewatch this show, because this show's great. I don't think I love it enough to put it on my top 10, but I do re- it needs more attention. Pugyuru. Bro, Pugyuru. Guys, go watch Pugyuru. This show gets no fucking love. It's like three minute episodes. It's like a young comma adaptation. Oh man, that show's fucking great. I love Pugyuru. It's like part of the... There's, to me, there's a triptych. There's a triptych. It's Take You, Pugyuru, and Potemeo. I haven't actually finished Potemeo, though. Oh, Potemeo is not three-minute episode. I think it's by the same guy, maybe? I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, d- ignore me. But I'm, I'm, it's tough. There's, this is the problem, right? Here's the thing. Here's the goddamn thing, okay? There's, there's a goddamn, like, dichotomy in making any sort of top 10 list or anything like that, right? And that dichotomy is when you're, you're sitting there and you're trying to be honest, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, when people look at this, are they going to think I'm based or cringe? Like, it's not only an honest depiction, like, you want it to be a representation of your taste and who you are, as well as... And like just your favorites, you know. Um, and I feel like Pugyuru does that for me. I just found a interest stack called "What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stranger." Weirdest, strangest, and randomest anime I could find. And it's got good, good fairies. Nekojiru saw Inakaisha, Ishonu training, training with Hinako, mind game. Pugyuru, Junkhead, I haven't seen Junkhead. Jungle wa Itsumo Hare no, I've heard of this, I haven't seen it. This show called, I don't know, a lot of these have really low ratings. Uh, Dead Leaves, Cat Shit One, uh, Dokuro-chan, Tenshi no Drop. Bro, Tenshi no Drop is a fucking wild anime. Puni Puni Poemi, I love Puni Puni Poemi, man. Puni Puni Poemi is great. Uh, Hen Semi, haven't I seen Hen Semi? I haven't seen Hen Semi, what the fuck? Wait, maybe I've seen a different version of Hen Semi? Yeah, 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 I saw the OVA of Hen Semi, but I only watched the first episode. It's very porn. It's very much just porn. Uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, sorry, I got, I ended up getting pretty fucking distracted here. Yeah, I got pretty distracted, hold on. 
I, I get distracted by these interest stacks. Oh, Akiba-chan? Bro, I love Akiba-chan. These are like, this is like my shit. This is what I come to anime for. Inferno Cop, fucking, what is Vlad love? I don't know what that is. Uh, Gokicha, Gokicha is great. Matafakas, <laughs> Kuchu Branko. Guys, if you haven't seen Kuchu Branko, you gotta watch it. That, that show is a great cult classic anime. Kuchu Branko. I, when I, I was on A the other day and I saw someone had Kuchu Branko in their 3x3, absolute giga chad. Um, Arcade Game of Fubuki, uh, Belladonna of Sadness, Midoriko, Take You, Yuri Seijin Naoko san. Yuri Seijin Naoko san is so based. Fucking Sekko Boys, I don't know what this is. Uh, Hametsu no Mars, that has a 2.22 rating. Alien 9, absolutely based. Pony Pony Dash, absolutely based. Digi Chat, absolutely based. Nurse Witch Komugi Chan Magikarate, absolutely based. Miru Tights, absolutely based. Ganso, who cares about Ganso? That's the first, the first part of this. The second part of this, there's a second, there's a sequel. That was part one. Part two, again, we got, starting off with Malice Doll. That was on my top 10 for a while. Malice Doll's great. Pupa. I almost watched Pupa at one point. Okay, if this doesn't have handshakers on it, then I don't know what the fuck is going on. Your Genius Party, based. Dai Maho Toge, Yami Shibai, Kakurenbo, Potemeo. Some of these I don't know. Gyo, Dragon's Heaven. I don't know these ones. Bikini Warriors. Don't know that one. Oh, Yurikuma Arashi, mid. More like Yuri mid Arashi. Sasami-san at Gambaranai. You can watch my, you can watch me and Osaka laying around watching Sasami Sanek Gambar and I on my channel if you're interested to see my take on that anime. Detroit Metal City, um, Birth, Bo Birth is a weird fucking thing. Birth is weird. I guess these are all weird. Corset no Shozo, Rescue Me, I've seen that. That's a porn OVA. Kick Heart, Kick Heart's great. Daku and Handsome, Angel's Egg, uh, fucking Popotan. Popotan isn't that weird. I don't know why Popotan is on here. Popotan's a fairly... It just... It's not that strange at all. Uh, Plastic Nason is also... It's just a surreal comedy. It, or like a... I don't know. Plastic Nason's fucking hilarious, though. Tech on Kingcrete is fucking ass. I hate Tech on Kingcrete. Uh, okay, those are some of the things that I've found. Henke Shoujo. What is Henke Shoujo? It's a, it's a five episode OVA. When a gust of wind blows away a young woman's hat, a high school girl prints, sprints past her and leaps into the air to retrieve it. However, this is no ordinary girl. Feeling the hat barely escape her grasp. The girl morphs her body into a fighter jet, blasting off into the distance with a burst of speed to catch it. Is this the anime with the, 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 the webm? The webm from, from like with the girl who drinks petrol? Is that is that this strain? Okay, I don't I don't know about any of this, but but I kind of I kind of feel like grinding some anime now. I mean, I think I'm gonna just grind some anime. First, I'm gonna watch this ep. I'm gonna finish this current episode of Tamayura Hitotose. I'm almost done with the show. This is episode eleven. I don't, and then I will try and marathon one of these weirdo shows. What's a weirdo show I could marathon easily and quick? I kind of also want to rewatch Pugiru. Because Pugiru is so short, I could easily rewatch it. And then here are my options. We got Eiken, Eiken, Eikenbu Yori Ai Wo Komete, which looks kind of bad, but it might be good bad. I don't know. Uh, that's only a two episode of EA, so it should be easy to watch. <laughs> Uh, Popotan, because I've only ever watched the first episode of that, which apparently I haven't marked on Mal, but I remember watching the first episode. I watched it because I was going through all of, um, fucking the, the character designer. I forgot what his goddamn name is. I always forget his name. Watanabe something? Uh, what, Akio Watanabe. Um, I was going through all of Akio Watanabe shows and I decided to check it out. It was kind of okay, but I might give it another check. Uh, then this thing another OVA called Kagaku no Yatsura which just has a gigantic booba in the thumbnail the Hensemi Hensemi I don't know those are some options I'm gonna watch some of these but first I'm gonna watch Tamayura because that's an actually good show I just watched Kagu no Yatsura Ka ah, sorry Kagaku no Yatsura those science freaks um, and I will now give it a four out of ten. Um, that was a porn. <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't like awful. It had fairly decent production quality for a porn. It's so there's like softcore and hardcore. 
I would classify this as midcore. It's like somewhere between the two categories. Uh, yeah, um, not not amazing, but kind of entertaining. Like not not good, but I wasn't. I mean, it, I got a bit bored towards the end there. I did what I did end up watching it at one point five times speed once I realized what it was. But I can't say I'd recommend it. Oh, but actually, yeah, there's no but. <laughs> there's no but at the end of that sentence. I just can't say I'd recommend it. Unless you have... Okay, in terms of as a porn, if you have a fetish for very large-breasted anime girls lactating, you might you might get... You would, I recommend this. Not That's not a fetish I have. It's not something I, I'm particularly interested in. But if that sounds like you, then then you will probably enjoy this much more than I did. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Nothing more to say on that. Let's move on to... Is this going to be a pawn as well? I can't tell if this is a pawn or not. What? Yeah, I think it is a pawn. I don't think I want to watch that show. This show looks bad. Let's just not watch that. I kind of feel like rewatching Pugyuru, so I think I'm going to rewatch Pugyuru now. Uh, yeah. It kind of frustrates me. I guess we're starting this off in, in anime territory, just like we started the last one off in kind of anime territory. Although, uh, I guess this one actually started at, like, at fucking early hominid territory. But anyway, I find it a little frustrating when people... Um, well, I find it frustrating. I, I find it frustrating myself that I don't have the language to make clear distinctions when it comes to isekai because isekai, there, it, it's so broad and varied. Like you go, I, I really hate when people write off the entire genre. Like the only way I can accept it is like if you really don't like fantasy, if you just can't stand anything fantasy related, then I then I can kind of accept it. But I feel like that you kind of have a narrow mind if if that's the case. Like really. You you, you, you don't like Lord of the Rings, like, you, you don't like any fantasy ever, really? I feel like you need to give it a little bit more of a chance. You don't like Skyrim? You don't like Elder Scrolls? You don't like The Witcher? You know all those video games? All these people who say they don't like fantasy, but I bet they like some of those video- anyway, sorry. Um, but no, if you don't like fantasy, I get it. That's, that's fine. I don't particularly like fantasy that much. I just had- it just- whatever. Um, but isekai is so because you, you get like certain you get like slow life isekai i don't know man i wish i had a, i wish i could read japanese so i could go on fucking shosets kaninaro and and read their tags you know actually wait a minute google translate exists google translate exists motherfucker is this is it right shosetsu.com yeah Let's let's go on tr Google Translate and let's let's look up some of these uh some of these tags because I because I want to be able to categorize isekai more effectively. I know like slow life is a genre and cheat skill is a genre, um but I'm and like how I'm obviously but I need more detail. I'm a, I am. I am Japan's database animals. Okay, it seems like the tagging system on Shosets Kaninaro is not as uh, robust as I had been led to believe. It just tags things as isekai um, and fantasy. I don't know where I got the idea from that there was like some really in-depth tagging system. But I did just spend like some time reading through some random guy's anime blog translated from Japanese. That was pretty interesting. I just found a guy who just does seasonal impressions, like like my videos. He just does a little rundown of all of the shows from the season near the beginning of the season and i've just been reading back through his opinions on some of the recent shows he focuses on like naroke like the stuff that comes from that website but um he also reviewed a bunch and he has i mean i agree with his takes i he he talked about uh uh rpg fudosan and he had basically the exact same opinion about that show that i had he talked about machikado Ma Oh, I never remember how to pronounce that show. Machikado Mazoku, is that what it's called? Ma Ma Machikado Mazoku, yeah, I was right. He talked about that, season two. He has pretty similar opinions, I think, yeah. Uh, he talked about Bochi. He really, he, he uh, he's based. Guy's based. Um, good opinions on isekai stuff. Yeah. Anyway, now I'm going to watch an isekai. Now I'm going to watch a Naroke isekai called um, Isekai Nombiri Noka. Um, because... Because fuck it, bro. It's just occurred to me that maybe not everyone who watches my 
channel is as how much of a fucking weeb as I am, so maybe I should explain what the fuck I'm talking about. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Shorsets Kaninaro is a website that a Japanese website where self you like authors can publish web novels and the vast majority of popular isekai originate from that website which is why I mention it uh, and naro k k sort of means like style right you can imagine uh like akiba k or shibuya k these are like terms you might have heard visual k you know k-e-i it's spelled in english k um so not all k means like in the style of things you would see on Shosets Kaninaro, which is often the sort of wish fulfillment fantasy isekai genre um because that's what's popular on there and a lot of those get picked up like the the realm of um light novels as they used to exist no longer like the 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 vibe has shifted in light novel publishing so it used to be well i mean it used to be that you'd have like light novel authors who would desperately want an editor and they'd be like showing off like they there would be editors they'd come to it the editors would just like blah, 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 right but now it's more like light novel authors generally publish on Shosets Kaninaro and what gets popular on that site then editors are like scouting that website and then if you have something that's popular they might uh you know contract you to publish physically with some sort of publisher as a light novel which would then get turned into a manga and an anime in some cases um for the most popular ones of those uh, but it, it generally the hub of everything is this this particular website called Shosets Kaninaro, uh, which I believe means like let's become a novelist. Um, yeah, as an example of some anime that originated on that website, uh, you pretty much you've heard, you've heard of all of them, um, and there's a bunch you haven't heard of. But like a, every isekai you've heard of basically comes from this web, like Log Horizon, Mushoku Tensei, Kuma 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 Bear, Konosuba. Like, everything. Everything comes from this website originally. Um, yeah. So, if you had no idea what the fuck I was talking about for the past, for the last segment, that's what I'm talking about. That website. So, Unim sent me the first draft, or some sort of almost finished version. Actually, not a first draft. An almost finished version of the Denpa Meta Mix. And I skimmed it. I didn't watch the whole thing because it's like two hours long and it's all videos I've already seen before from my friends. Um, and I, it makes me think about how I, I don't talk to Jelaine much anymore. I don't see them in my comments. Oh, that's not true. They comment on something I made like not even that long ago. Shouts out Jelaine, absolutely based individual. And shouts out Yunim too, also a based individual. Shouts out everyone in that video. Yeah. I'm not narcissistic. A lot of it is me, and I'm 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 not narcissistic enough to necessarily watch that much of me. It I kind of I can't help but kind of cringe at the idea that like people who people from the external world will watch me do the the Denpa rant. I mean, I think that as as far as improvised speeches go, it's not one of the worst ones. It I definitely could have cut it a bit shorter, but that's that whole arc of my channel is is just. I definitely, I hadn't, I'm still working on this. Learning when to finish a rant. <laughs> When's the appropriate time to stop? That's a skill that you have to practice. And while I was making Denpa, I had not learned that skill very well. And to this day, I have not learned that skill very well, but I hope I'm a little better at it now. Or I think I would, fi I would, I wouldn't have a good sense of when to just be like, and I've got my thought out into the world and now I can stop talking about it. And I would just sort of keep going and end up repeating myself. But it's a little embarrassing to imagine people watching this in, in any sort of formal setting. But uh, it's also cool. So it's not like I mind. Um, so, you know, that's fine. It does make me kind of think, because I was making videos that were maybe more experimental. I don't know how true that is. I don't know how true that is, because a lot of my videos, I keep, I go through this arc where I'm like, man, I was making videos that were so experimental back then, and now I make boring normal videos. But I've gone through this arc like five times, and every time I go through the arc and I'm like I should make experimental style videos again and then they just get crazy like Night Shift 3 that's a pretty wild video right that was just a couple weeks ago that I made I mean I made a fucking 12 hour long podcast I don't know maybe maybe I 
maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy in a good way. Uh, but the, yeah, and it's cool that people are going to see this stuff, but it's a, it, that's what, that's what I wanted to say mainly is I can't help but cringe a bit looking at some of these older videos of mine and imagine in that context, but also, but also it, do, it doesn't really bother me that much. Anyway, I'm not going to watch the whole thing because I'm busy watching fucking anime. Got to keep up appearances. Uh, isn't it weird that I, I went to rec- after Unim sent me this Discord message linking me the thing, and I watched a bit of it. My first reaction, record the podcast before I message him back. Before, <laughs> that's so fuck. I'm so content brained, man. I'm I'm terminally content brained. My first reaction is I gotta record a bit of a bit. I gotta record a bit about this before I even fucking message him back. Is this bad? Am I a bad person? Oh god. Yeah. But people like the podcast, and I like the podcast. It's a it's a it's a fun way of doing things. I don't know if I'll do it like this forever. But it's a fun way of doing. I, the visual element is the visual element. And when things need to have a visual element, they can have a visual element. But these sorts of rants, these sorts of rambles, these sorts of off-topic, you know, uh, this is the, 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 the YouTube equivalent of the off-topic board on an alt on, on some sort of forum or Discord server or alt image board. This is the, 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 the video... Ver- the the one man brain version of that in podcast form now i'm kind of mad this is why i hate seasonal anime because when you find a good show you have to wait a week for the next goddamn episode i started watching this show isekai non bidi norka i think i mentioned that already it's the i this one phrase keeps coming into my mind there's nothing wrong with it like it's not the best thing ever it, in terms of positives, in terms of like highest highs, deep themes or deep emotional connections with characters, you know, there's not, you're not going to find that much, right? But there's nothing wrong with it. Like, it's really hard for me to think of any notable flaws with the show. Like the only flaw, okay, if you were to say, I find it boring, like if you were to come to me and say, I don't like the show, I found it kind of boring, I, I would understand it. I would understand why you think that. Because like, there's not much conflict. It's not really that kind of show, you know, it's, I get it. Like, I, I, I don't agree. I like it, but like, I understand if you want to say that. And maybe you could say, like, it's fairly formulaic. It sets up what it's going to do towards the beginning. Sort of keeps chugging along in the same sort of pattern. There's not really twists or subversions. You know, it sort of keeps going the way that it sets up that it's going to keep going. Yeah, maybe maybe you could criticize it for that. But I don't see any of I don't see either of those things as as flaws in the show. I think they're both built into the fiber of this sort of slow life isekai genre and that's fine because the satisfaction you get from this type of show is not the same as traditional narrative media you're not necessarily watching a character overcome concrete obstacles uh there's not necessarily going to be a three-act structure you know there's not necessarily going to be these sorts of things rather the sense of satisfaction and narrative you get from this type of show is much closer to the sense of satisfaction you get from playing like an MMO uh, in terms of constant incremental satisfying progress, right? Like that's that's what this show is really there to 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 like. I'm trying to fucking think of the word. What's the word? embody? Sure, embody. So what the, that that kind of feeling is what this show's there to embody. And this isn't even that uncommon with an isekai, you know, there's a lot of, actually, even with anime in general, like, you know, there's, there's a few isekai that I feel like have done similar things. Like, I would compare this maybe to, to slime isekai, it's even a little bit uh, Dr. Stone, you know, it's, it's about sort of progress, number go up, MMORPG, expanding every episode, the, the village gets a little bigger, new races join, you learn new characters, you know, a little bit of expansion, uh, and it's just like peaceful farming village grows a little more. It's like playing Harvest Moon or something, you know? And that's like, there's no big bad. There's no like, uh, you know, oh no, there's a big dramatic event happened. How are the characters going to overcome this one? Oh, they just barely survived. There's none of that. 
right? It's just, you know, little problem solving moments that aren't even that complicated or that hard to solve, right? The characters generally solve their problems with relative ease of just like, let's just keep chipping away little bit by little bit at making this village slightly bigger, slightly more productive, you know, maintaining peaceful relations with the outside world. Let's just keep going at it. And it's it's so it's so satisfying to watch and 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 calming and healing. Iyashi K, I would define I I would say that it it, it, it 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 could be it's good i well it's it there's nothing bad about it like i can't i can't think of any real flaws like it's kind of strange how how me it is i guess is maybe a critique you could make of it that it is fairly harrowing, but if you if that's not like that's more like a preference thing. Like you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a little bit for the harrowing aspects of it. But also, it doesn't go. It's kind of got. It's kind of an ambient harem, right? Like it's not a harem show where the harem and the girls, like each individual girl chasing after the main guy's affection, is the main part of the show, and that's the narrative thrust, or even a major comedic point or anything like that. It's just sort of a, a consistent background element, and I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. You know, I, I go on Mal and I see people um, uh, calling it generic in the reviews. You know, I don't understand how this is generic. Like, to me, a generic isekai is like, I'm going to be the strongest swordsman in the world. I, I respawned in isekai world with the world's strongest sword and i'm gonna go defeat the demon lord uh, you know like that's that's a generic isekai like something like i mean yeah sure let's go with like isekai smartphone or or death march right like those are some like i can understand calling them generic or sword art online for example you know uh, or even mushoku tensei right like these ones i can understand calling them generic this one it might be it, it's it's not a generic isekai it's its own little isekai subgenre uh, of like isekai slow life stuff. So, for example, the the one about killing killing slimes for three hundred years. That one, maybe. Um, you know, a little bit more in that vein. Isekai slow life. Isekai yakyo. Even a little bit of isekai. But isekai yakyo is way more dramatic than this. Like that guy, he's constantly fight. He's constantly fighting against the odds, or something like. Um, a sentence of a bookworm, constantly fighting against the odds. This is not the case here. The case with with Isekai Nonbiri Noka, farming life in another world, in other words, is um more like, it's like playing a fucking Animal Crossing, you know, or something like that. It's just, you do, you do what you gotta do. You get the satisfying sense of progression. That's what the show's all about. And it works for me. I can, I can understand if it didn't work for you, but honestly, it's just heartwarming. It's, it's, uh, it's just about a guy farming vegetables with cute girls, as, as the 3D way pin on Mal said, a relaxing slice of life isekai show about a guy farming vegetables with cute girls that you can watch in your free time to ignore the fact that your life is miserable and wasting time rating a review that no one's going to read in detail because the negative ones are better. I disagree with that. I think this guy's right, and I'm going to go ahead and, and upvote his review because I think this guy's review is accurate. Um, but it's the, 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 you know what the worst thing about this show is? Is it's not fucking finished. That I now have to wait. Like, it would have been so... I want to have finished the season. I don't want to wait a week or two, two weeks for the last, for the next two episodes. You know, I want, I want them to be in my brain right now. And that's frustrating. But you know what? We keep at it. Watching this show made me do chores because the main character, he's just chipping away at things just little bit by little bit. And eventually it, you look back at the progress he's made and you look back in awe. And that made me want to fucking empty the dishwasher, put a new stuff in the dishwasher, cook some do some meal prep for tomorrow. You know, I've got some, some, ah, oh shit. I said I was going to make bread. I, I'm too sleepy to make bread. I'm going to go to sleep soon. Fuck. I was going to make some dough and leave it to ferment overnight. And I was like, I'm going to do that in the, ah, uh, oh, I forgot to do it. It's too late now. Uh, I guess I can just make normal bread that I don't ferment overnight tomorrow. I'll just start working in the morning and then we'll have a loaf to eat through the day i guess it shouldn't be a big deal uh but it won't taste quite as good as if i'd left it to ferment overnight in the fridge but it's 
it's a minor difference. Yeah, good show. Honestly, this is gonna get a strong recommend from me. I'd give it an eight, uh, um, uh, a, a hard eight, solid eight, a solid eight. Uh, it's definitely not a nine. It's nowhere near a nine, but it's definitely better than a seven. It's a solid eight. Um, yeah, good show. Wish uh, I, I want more shows like this. There probably is a bunch of shows like this. This is good. This is this is the, this is the good type of isekai. You know, I I think. If I really had to push myself and think how how it could be better, um, maybe I would like if they went a little more in depth on like farming technique because uh, so there was something a little strange that I noticed, very nitpicky critique, which is just based on the Japanese-ness of the show, which is the guy grows wheat before he grows rice and he turns that wheat into some sort of product. Right, he harvests the wheat before he grows. Wheat. He doesn't turn it into a product necessarily, but he harvests the wheat before he harvests the rice. When he harvests the rice, he has to, for the first time, go through the process of like threshing, for example. But the thing is, if you're growing wheat, you would have already had to learn how to do that. You would already have the tools to do that. So when he's threshing the rice, he's like, oh, I think I saw something like this on TV once where they did this and this, we're going to do thresh, this thing called threshing. It's like, if you were using wheat before this, if you had access to wheat that you'd harvested, you would already have had to thresh that wheat, right? That's how wheat works. They're like, you have, it's a similar process, uh, you know, for no matter what grain you're talking about. Uh, but that's an extremely fucking nitpicky critique. Uh, but the timeline doesn't quite add up there. I, it would, it maybe would have been nice if they, if they went a little more in depth. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily make it a better narrative, uh, but it would satisfy my autistic curiosity a little more if they went a little more in depth on like what it takes to, to, to cultivate various different crops. And I've heard there's another show that is also about farming in an, it's also a farming type isekai. Um, it's called, I've, I've somehow gotten stronger when I improved my farm related skills. Oh, I dropped this one. Oh, cause this was the really bad one. Yeah. I watched the first episode of this and it was the worst looking show I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah. No, that show fucking sucked. Holy shit. Okay, yeah, never mind. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I'm gonna go to bed now. So that was a cool show. I hope to finish it. The violin isn't made for humans, I feel like. But hear me out here. Like, I feel like classical violinists are some sort of... Like, listen, I'm not a classical... Vi I've never played violin in my life. Uh, I listen to... A, uh, I, not a lot of class. I listen to more classical music than the average person, but I'm not like a super hardcore classical music guy. I'm definitely not a super hardcore like violin soloist guy. Okay, I'm not involved in that world really. But I have like what they do. It's music, but it's not really related to like what I do because they're more like practice a piece for eight hours a day for a year in order to have one but you didn't write it, you know, like, there's not the element of composition. But the thing that's weird, or cool, I guess, I don't know what it is, it's something, it's, it's fascinating, I guess, is that, like, the violin just does not sound good. It does not sound perfect, because it, do, like, unlike the guitar, right? You, you give a guitar to a beginner, and you can teach them, and in, like, 15 minutes, you can have them playing Smoke on the Water, and it'll sound like it sounds, right? And then in two days, they can play Smoke on the Water and it sounds like the recording with electric guitar. Like that's an instrument that's made for humans and it's, it's made to sound good. Even piano, right? Piano, it's like you can learn chopsticks in two minutes and you can play it and it sounds fun, right? It sounds like it's supposed to sound. Violin is not like this. Violin sounds fucking awful unless you're absolutely fucking perfect with it. And no one can be that perfect. The most incredible violin prodigies of all time cannot be 100% perfect with the violin. The violin is this insane construction we've made for ourselves of this thing that can never be quite perfect, but is by just somehow this small segment of the human species is continually chasing this impossible perfection on an instrument that is designed so that that's never gonna happen. Just because theoretically, you know that those tones can be, that the intonation can be true and that, you know, you, you can hit those double stops and whatever the fuck violinists be doing. Like, it's just, too, it's just not 
it can't happen. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like this insane lust for perfection on an instrument which is by its nature imperfect when when played by a human. Do you do you understand what I'm saying here? Like the the violin is just there's there's, there's no damn frets on it. <laughs> but like that's not the real problem here because like the cello doesn't have frets and I'm not saying the same thing about the cello, right? Because it has this long scale length. The violin has this tiny fucking scale length. It's so ridiculously precise. Like I don't know how people can play thirds on that instrument. Like when you just when you hear a violinist who knows their shit and they hit that goddamn third, it's like, that's not just muscle memory. That's not just memorizing one position of like how far your fingers need to be apart. That's memorizing every single possible different combination of two notes perfectly. Do you know what, do you understand what I'm saying here? Because, because as you, depending on where you are on the neck, the distance between the the note and its third is going to be different, right? Or its fifth, any any interval, right? It's insane. Violinists are insane. These guys, they're fucked. There's something going on with them, but but shouts out to them anyway. But there's something definitely going. There's something going on there. It's just like I feel like I don't find guitar virtuosos impressive, really. Sometimes I do, but most of the time, it just feels showy and like wanky and and nothing. And it's not a matter of like class here. It's just a matter of like, like difficulty because no one, like the thing is you don't need to play Eruption to sound good on guitar. It doesn't even sound very good, but you kind of do need to play like uh, Paganini to sound good on violin, you know? Like what I do find really impressive is uh, like there's a lot of very impressive classical guitarists and jazz guitarists. Like if I, people who are like good at, good at your instrument, it's like, are you actually good at your instrument if you can't, you know, I don't know, improvise the giant steps at full tempo? I can't. I fucking definitely can't. I don't even know where to begin. So no, of course not. You're not good at guitar if you can play Eruption. You're good at guitar if you can, well, really, you're good at guitar if you can play what's needed for the piece. But, but violin is different because even just to do that, you need to be kind of cracked. And like vi playing in a violin, playing ensemble, you can be a little off because that's the point of a violin ensemble of a string section is that because there are no frets, because everyone is fingering their note just tiny bit different, it creates a chorus effect and that sounds really good. But solo violin is a different thing entirely. There's no, you're not a single part of this sort of blanket of sound and the minor differences in tone between you and the rest of your section create a sort of chorus effect you're not you're not doing that as a solo violinist as a soloist you have to you're just have to be you you are the i don't know man this shit's insane it's like it's just an impossible goal i listen to the best violinists in the world right i listen to like hillary Hahn and whatever and that shit is like the best you can possibly hear and still there are like tiny 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 little tone problems they're not problems because it's ju it's not it's just the instrument is wrong the instrument is not possible you can't play that instrument properly no one can it's not possible to play that instrument accurately it's just a uh, they're demanding the the highest possible level of precision from a definitionally fundamentally imprecise medium and and they and they know this and yet they still do it and they ne they're just like, well, the problem is me, not the violin. And it, and fair play to them, because when you do play it well, it does sound damn good. Man, I know, those guys are fucked. I just want to correct myself, because I think I might have said something kind of retarded. I'm not sure you can play a third on violin. <laughs> I just want to correct myself. Now that I think about it, first, second, yeah, I don't know how you would play a, I don't know, maybe you can play a third if you play it like inverted maybe i don't know that much about violin but i'm pretty sure it's i don't know i think i was thinking about octaves because i i yeah i think i was thinking of octaves not not thirds so forgive me for that can you play a third on violin maybe you can i don't know i don't know enough about violin to know it might be it might not be maybe it is possible anything where you're playing two notes at once on a violin and keeping both of them in tune is fucking crazy okay give me a goddamn break i'm not a violin player i'm a goddamn cringe guitarist bass player okay i don't know what i'm doing any violinists 
in the, the comment section want to sound off and tell me how cringe I am for not knowing how the instrument works, go ahead. Feel free. I deserve it. Listen, man, I, I just listened to two. I just I just watched two set, man. Okay, I just watched two set. Okay, I'm not a, I'm not a vi- Okay, violin arc over. We're moving on. I had forgotten how God... So, I don't know if my shit's just broken. Okay, let me just tell you what's... Okay, so, the other day I was on my ThinkPad X20, and the fan started making this really bad-sounding noise. So I thought, that's not good. Must be fucked. But I just turned on my ThinkPad X220. (laughs) because I was recording an episode of the world-famous video series ThinkPad Thinks, um, which I've posted. Um, Yeah, who cares about that? ThinkPad Thinks, the oldest running series on this channel. Um, And so I turned it on for that, and the fan seems to be okay, but the fan is still very loud, and I don't... I think the fan has just always been this loud, which is a little annoying going from this this Mac, you start to realize some of the flaws, you know? Just moving from a modern computer to an older one. Like, I'm not, I mean, I would choose ThinkPad keyboard over Mac keyboard any day of any year of any second of any minute, right? Of course, everyone would. Um, and there's other stuff too that is nicer about the ThinkPad. But this Mac can be running at full fucking capacity and it is dead fucking silent. It's insane. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. But I want to play this visual novel uh, called The Logic of the Miniature Garden, a.k.a. Hakoniwa Logic. Oh, I saw a short video Actually, I think it's a TikTok, uh, which is uh, a guy going through a bunch of historical quotes where the older generation besmirches the younger generation just to show that every... This has just always happened throughout history. Um, but then one of them, 1330, from, thir- from the year 1330, quote, Modern fashions seem to keep on growing more and more debased. The ordinary spoken language has also steadily coarsened. And this is from Essays on Idleness by Yoshida Kenko. Now, I've read Essays on Idleness by Yoshida Kenko. And this guy is not some grizzled old guy who hates the younger generation. He's not talking about that. He's literally lamenting his own youth, kind of. He's he's sort of saying like... Like, if you listen to the ordinary spoken language has steadily coarsened. He's saying, like, um, people, people in the nearby town, they aren't as friendly to each other as they used to be. He's not talking about the younger generation. He's just talking about the present times. He never mentions... He never he never mentions the younger generation, so I don't know. Very weird thing to nitpick, but somehow yes, I have actually read this Japanese Buddhist text from fucking thirteen thirty. Anyway, yeah, shouts out to that book, Essays on Idleness. You should read it. The required hikikomori reading, in my opinion. I'm watching the newest Jelaine video uh, halfway through it. The first segment is talking about Gemini. Jelaine has ported their website to Gemini. I assume that's what's happened. Yeah, it is what's happened, I don't know why. But uh, based, first of all, Giga based. Secondly, um, I gotta say, absolutely on point analysis of a lot of the goddamn problems with Gemini. And I want to add on to this, uh, in case you're not subscribed to Jalay Lane Caucus, Caucus, for whatever reason, uh, <clears throat> peak, peak Denpa, doesn't post that often, but anyway, um, good pass. Uh, their video is about, uh, oh my god, I'm having a fucking I I slept for too damn long and my brain is just not working and then I tried to compensate for this by having too much caffeine and now my heart is just pounding but I it hasn't helped my brain start working yet Uh, so I I, I'm just fucked for today because I oh body go body go sleep too long now bad day for no reason (laughs) haha funny anyway that's how my life is um was I talking about? Sorry, sorry about this. Sorry about the Gemini. Yes. So it's not just Gemini that's like this. Their complaint, which I think is a hundred percent true, is that so much fucking Gemini stuff is just people talking about Gemini. Like I don't want to read your gem log about how cool Gemini is because I'm already on Gemini. I know about Gemini, right? But this isn't just a problem with Gemini. This is a problem with all this fucking shit. It's all like this. This is why I don't use it more because it's. All all like this you know i follow like it's all either people talking about the protocol itself whether it's gemini gopher 
you know, fucking hypercore, uh, dat, like all of this shit. Or even, you know, this is the thing that initially pushed me off the Fediverse back in the day, like, you know, years ago when that was sort of a new thing. And is that all anyone would ever talk about was the fucking Fediverse. And then like occasionally you'd get someone just talking about like free software and technology and stuff. But it's like, which is better than not doing that, but it's like, give me some goddamn variety. I, you know, there was a couple of people who would talk about politics. None of them knew what the fuck they were talking about. It was terrible. And so that's, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I ended up leaving the Fed or, or I mean, I got, I also got banned, but th this is why I didn't care that much that I got banned because it was already shit. I got banned from the entire Fediverse. <laughs> um, I'm also playing Team Fortress 2 at the same time as talking to you, which is probably not helping my train of thought to be more um, prescient, consistent. Yeah, all of this shit is just full of motherfuckers who are just like, I want to make something on this thing because it's cool, but I am a boring fucking person who needs to substitute my personality with obtuse web protocols, and I don't have anything else to say to add on to it because it's my only hobby. And it's like, goddamn, get another fucking hobby. And what was interesting, I think, is that when Jelaine mentioned this, I was like, yeah, I have a gem log that I just used to mirror my web blog, web blog, um, which I think is a lot of people. Uh, and I haven't posted on my blog for ages because anything that I could post on my blog, I just turn into a goddamn YouTube video because I know no one fucking reads my blog. <laughs> Uh, so if I want to write something, I just turn it into a YouTube video. And I'm also, I don't know. I don't know what the goddamn point is. But that, this is what my, my blog cast was, was all about. <clears throat> it was trying to fix this issue by making better content. Because here's the ultimate problem, is that the world has changed. People don't necessarily want to read a blog anymore. I mean, I, I will read a, a good blog, but this is something I think most people have forgotten about the, the age of blogs. I'd forgotten it, is that most people are terrible at writing and don't have anything interesting to say. You get like one in a hundred really interesting blogs, but most blogs are fucking atrocious. <laughs> They're terribly written and they don't have anything interesting to say. Um, it's just like this YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, a little bit of self-deprecating humor, we, we throw it in there just so that I don't, you know, so I come across as more relatable to my audience. Sorry, I don't know what the fuck's going on with me right now. Um, so yeah, it, it's all bad, and it's all bad, and Jelaine, Jelaine's gemula is probably the best thing on the whole damn protocol, aside from the mirrored version of my own blog, which is also, I mean, hey, at least it's not about Gemini and it's not a, just a technology blog, right? It's like a politics, but, uh, sorry. Um, okay, I should stop playing TF2 while I talk to you guys. The thing I wanted to say is when when Jelaine first mentioned this, I was like, damn, yeah, I should do something with my gem log. Maybe I should start like an anime gem log. And then like five minutes later, Jelaine says there should be more anime gem logs. And so I can definitely take up that mantle 100%. Um, but here's the goddamn problem is that uh, I don't watch that much anime anymore. I mean, I kind of do, but I also kind of don't. Uh, that's part of the problem. And the second problem is writing is slow and boring. Like I'll write if I have something really detailed and interesting to say, but I don't find like, I'm not the fastest typer. I, I average like 80 something words per minute, I think. Um, I, I could do a test right now, but this is not my normal keyboard. So I'll do it bad. I, if I do it, I don't know. On the ThinkPad, I think I forgot what my best typing speed is, but yeah, I don't have a particularly fast typing speed. So that's frustrating for me. As I, I get frustrated trying to write stuff that isn't, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, writing is much more frustrating than speaking. Uh, and also, yeah, it just takes much, it takes much longer, which means I don't tend to do it unless I feel like I have something very important to say. There's also a problem similar to what Patricia Taxon ran into with uh, their second channel which is uh, that there's these sorts of perceived levels of internet formality, and it's kind of fucking annoying to navigate. So like, uh, they made their second channel in an attempt to replace Twitter, and they would make posts that reflected the sort of things they would previously have posted on Twitter. But the problem is that people take a tweet to just be a throwaway thought. 
but if you went through the effort to make a YouTube video about it, people assume you think it's more important or it has some like higher level of formality to it. And uh, I think blogs are even further than that. I think if you go and make a blog post about something, people, especially because most blogs these days are like corporate blogs, uh, people think it's like some important thing that you spent a lot of time thinking about and they take it very serious uh, or they take it to, to be sort of gospel uh, about what you, what you think and what you believe rather than like a, a throwaway vlog like I can say whatever bullshit I want. And then a tweet on top of that is like even less scrutinized. Um, and so these, because of what I talked about, that writing is much slower than talking and talking in a YouTube video is much slower than writing 140 characters or 280 or whatever it is these days. I don't, I don't know, I don't use Twitter. Um, <clears throat> So, so this is a problem because I don't, I don't have that many, you know, just like any normal person, most of my thoughts aren't necessarily the most important thing ever, but I might still want to tell people about them. Like anime, there might be a lot of anime where I'm like, I liked it, but I don't have that much to say about it. Right. Um, uh, and I feel like going through the effort to write up a whole blog post that is basically just, I like it. And then a basic analysis of why I like it, but nothing like super deep. Cause it was just like a, a six or seven out of 10, not, not like a, atrocious or amazing or particularly interesting or important. It's like, why go out of my way? But then I remembered that we live in the year of our Lord, 2023. And in the year of our Lord, 2023, there are these artificial intelligences which can transcribe audio to text. So I can just record myself going on a unplanned ramble or a bullet pointed ramble about some anime that I've been watching or some manga that I've been reading. I can record that into Audacity and then run that through a program like Descript. Honestly, the it's kind of um, a pain how, <laughs> how bad these uh, transcribers still are. Like with the level of progress that AI has achieved over the past few years, you would think that they've gotten better at transcribing audio to text by now, but they really haven't gotten that much better. It's a little better, but it still sucks. Uh, anyway, that to make a gem log about anime. There's my, or just otaku stuff. Um, there's my, there's my, uh, my idea. I can talk about a couple of visual novels, a couple of mangoes, a couple of animus, you know, uh, and then maybe throw in some other stuff. Uh, I don't know if you, the thing is, I don't know, I don't, it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm stuck between a bit of a rock and a bit of a hard place. Because on the one hand, I don't, it, it, it's, it's a pain to go through effort to do something and then know that no one's ever going to see it because it's on Gemini, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's a pain to go through effort to do something, only to have it, like if you're gonna go put effort into something, you hope that at least one person will see it, right? You hope that, but no one knows about my fucking gem log, you know? No no one on Gemini reads my shit because it's not like self-hosted. It's on some some simple, easy, like it's, on, it's hosted by someone else who runs a hosting service. That means you don't have to do all the complicated stuff with TLS that Jelaine is struggling with because that's fucking annoying. Man, Gemini, Gemini man. You, you need Gemini Man, the movie starring William Smith and uh, a, a, a digital version of William Smith. It's so funny to call him William Smith. I, I know it's kind of Reddit, but I, I find it very funny. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. I'm also, I've kind of given up a little bit. I've kind of given up a little bit because because I feel like you just got to submit to the machine spirit sometimes. But then it's like, what really is the machine spirit? You know, I don't know. I don't think it's knowable. Uh, but yeah, I think I'll give it a try at least. I could definitely record like three or four AI speech to text transcribed gem log posts about anime within like, it, you know, I could definitely just do that today. And then that would be that would be it easy and cool, I think. So I should just do that. Uh, maybe. Maybe I should just do that. Well, I just did something strange. Remember, I was talking about that anime gem log. Oh, you guys might not know what the fuck a gem log is. I don't, I don't know if I need to explain this stuff. Did I, I didn't explain any of this. I just responded to Jelaine's video. I don't know how, how much knowledge to assume of you guys. This is like a fucking problem I always have where I, I don't know how much knowledge to assume my audience has. So I sometimes just talk about technical stuff, which actually isn't that technical, but just in sp just specific stuff, e expecting people to already know what I'm talking about. And maybe, which feels cringe because if I go ahead and explain it as if I just 
just assume no one knows anything. It's like, that's cringe, because it kind of feels like I'm assuming I'm smarter than everyone else. You know what I mean? But also, yeah, I don't know what level of explanation I need to do. Just very quickly, Gemini is an alternative internet protocol. It's slightly heavier than Gopher and lighter than the web. If you don't know what Gopher is, don't worry about it. Uh, if you want more information, you know what? Just just go look up like Gemini protocol or, or something like that. You're, you're going to want to go to this website. It's called uh, like Gemini.circumula. Hold on a goddamn second. Gemini dot circum circumluna dot space yeah gemini gemini dot circumluna dot space i mean if you just look up gemini protocol you'll find it uh but anyway and a gem log is like a blog but blog stands for web blog right gem log but mlog sounds bad glog also sounds bad i don't know it's a stupid name anyway i started a new gem log you can also access it completely via the regular web so i don't know why i'm even mentioning that uh, because it's hosted on flounder.online, which is great. I love flounder.online. Um, so if you go to uh, flounder.online, maybe you'll see me because I I might be the most recent or one. Anyway, it's uh, the URL is going to be whether you use HTTP or Gemini, it's going to be moe-separatist.flounder.online. Um, so you go there, you can see... Um, yeah, moe-separatist.flounder.online. And you can find my uh, a little landing page with some ASCII art of an anime eye and my gem log, which has one post. And that post is not very good because I didn't put any real thought into it at all. It just exists to exist, to sort of be a... Uh, uh, to hold that, that door open until I write a actual anime review, which is probably going to be a review of Hoshino Umi no Amori, which is a show I've been wanting to talk about for ages, but not really had an excuse or reason to do so. And I think this is the perfect excuse and reason to do so. Um, and so I will write that text post and put it up on that Gemini place and no one will ever read it because no one does. Especially these like, cause I don't, listen, I if, if fucking Jelaine can't figure out TLS, I have no hope of doing so, okay? But yeah, this is my anime blog type thing. Uh, I suppose. I'm just saying how people normally use this. Dreams, June. Okay, I see. So I might, yeah, there's a couple of things I want to do. I want to rename that thing. I want to write, I'm write my post about Hoshino Umi no Amori. And I think that's it so far. I don't know what else I'll write about. I'll just write about whatever. I, I mean, I could easily write a blog post about Kumo desu ga nani ya. Uh, that would be easy to write because I have, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I could write a post about, I could probably write a post about Shimeji Simulation. Um, I could probably write a post about Son of Witch. I could probably write a post about, uh, that's maybe it. But anyway, that's just, I, I could prob maybe I could write a post about cross channel. I'd kind of, I, I don't know. I don't remember it that well, but yeah, anyway, uh, go check that out. The, the link won't be anywhere because that's some, that's something I'll forget to do. There's no shot. I remember to put the link somewhere, uh, but I said the link out loud. So you can probably find it if you're a dedicated fan of the no thank you channel. All I care about is Team Fortress 2, but I think I want to make an image board, but I don't want to make an image board because I don't want to host things or deal with moderation and spam. Uh, that's a terrible fucking idea. Also, it's impossible to get users on an image board. Um, but if I did make an image board, it would have, it would have a board. These are some of the boards it would have. It would, it would have a, a Moe board. So that it would be for discussion of Moe stuff, not an anime board or anything like that. It would be a Moe board, which is just for discussion of Moe stuff. And then it would have a non Moe board. If you want to talk about stuff that isn't Moe, or it might not even have a non Moe board. It might be mo uh, just Moe. It might be just Moe. So it would have a Moe board. <clears throat> that's the first thing it would have uh then wait i had another idea i had more than that there was more than that i swear i think one of my ideas was to have a oh fuck okay fuck i was gonna say some oh my god my brain isn't working today uh my brain my brain i was gonna fucking say something 
Oh, I remember what it was. I this is just stupid. So I found I found a fucking political compass meme and I just filled it out and I just wanted to share it because fuck you. I don't know why. Welcome to Slice of Life podcasting. This is just a slice of my life, okay? I'm I'm autistic. When I see like charts to fill out, I can't not do it. Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, how do we do this? What's the best way to organize this? Okay, for, I guess I go. You know how political compasses work. I'll just tell you which ones I ticked off. Actually, I'll tell you which ones I ticked off, and then and then you can you can decide if that makes any sense to you to you. Okay, the first going from top to bottom. So this is this is this one is located on the upper the top, very top of the far right. Varg fan. I just like his music, and I think uh I think he's a funny guy. He's a funny guy. Next is has read Carl Schmidt. That's pretty self-explanatory. Follows Nick Land. Um, I guess you can't see the ones that I didn't tick, so you don't know what this means necessarily. Accelerationist tick loves Indo-European mythology. I think loves is a little strong. I would go with just likes, but yeah, I am interested in that. It's cool. Lindy Man fan. More of an ex Lindy Man fan. Since I quit Twitter, I haven't kept up with him. Now we're going down to the libertarian right. Transhumanist, more of a posthumanist, but generally get along. Um, flaneur, a more of an aspiring flaneur, but I have been called a flaneur in the past, uh, even though I don't actually go on that many walks. But I'm an aspiring flaneur. Has read Moldbug, self explanatory. Wants to make anime real. That's the basis of everything. Paranoid about caco demons, self-explanatory. Admires bank robbers, somewhat. Legalize all drugs, it just makes sense. Thalamite, I identified more with this a few years ago, but I haven't found any reason not to, I suppose. A Jungarian, Jungarian anarch, um... Again, I have I don't self-identify as this, but someone has, uh, two people have described me as this, so I'm just gonna say yes. Uh, free speech absolutist, yes. Anarcho monarchist, I tick. I don't know if I'm actually an anarcho monarchist. I just think it's interesting. Marquis de Sade fan. I've read the 120 Days of Sodom when I was like 17. It was honestly kind of boring. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't call myself a fan, but I like I like the idea of it. Uh, also, I like him as a guy. He's a cool guy, so that makes me a fan. And all beliefs are arbitrary. That's true. Okay, starting now. The one I have, funny enough, I have more ticks in the far right, up like authoritarian right side than I do in the authoritarian left side. The only ones I have in the authoritarian left are right at the bottom, closest to the center, which is Zizek fan and has read Karl Marx. <laughs> so I guess I am the least like a, a, an authoritarian leftist, which I think is base. Um... Next, has read Mark Fisher, raised agnostic slash atheist, LGBTQ. I don't know if I fucking count as that. I don't know. I think uh, I've described myself as like freehand straight rather than straight with a ruler, if you know what I mean. Like there was an attempt to draw a straight line, but it's a little, it's a little squiggly. I don't know if that counts enough, but whatever. I'm also uh, robosexual, so that makes me Q. Um, xenofeminist, fuck yes. Autistic, yes. Now there's two here, which is uses psychedelics and aspiring shaman. I have used psychedelics. I, d I don't plan on continuing to use them, at least not for the foreseeable future. So I don't know if that counts. Um, and aspiring shaman, uh, again, I have been that in the past, but I think it's I, I I don't okay here's my opinion so pro really like hardcore pro drug people like Osaka talk about how like dr lots of drugs have been like people have been using drugs for all of human history you're not just going to eliminate it um which isn't really a good argument because like people have been doing like rape for all of human history that doesn't mean it's a good thing I'm not saying I'm anti-drug I, I mean I said I support legalizing all drugs but I don't think that's a very robust argument it's just kind of an appeal to nature or something like that it's some sort of fallacy I don't appeal to history is that a thing I don't know it doesn't actually provide a good support but my counterpoint is that uh most ancient societies that had a drug-taking culture generally restricted that drug taking to a shamanic class and i think we need to do that again i think we need to bring back the drug taking shamanic class and so i i although i myself am not interested in taking drugs anymore i think if you are 
you ought to consider joining the shamanic class. Um, Mrs. The Situationists? Hell yeah, I fucking do. Former Ancom? I don't know if I actually identified as an Ancom at any point. I kind of did. Uh, hates Police? I put on there. Um, I suppose so. I, I, I think I'm a little different from other lefties on this, though. Because I, I don't think you can abolish the police as like a... That's kind of a late stage kind of deal, you know? If you're going to be abolishing the police. Because if you if you keep capitalism around and private property around, like, you can't abolish the police practically. Because then you will only have succeeded in privatizing the police. That is my opinion. Uh, chaos magic. Again, something I was more interested in in the past. These days, I'm a little less chaos magic filled. A little more of a boring materialist. Uh, mega fauna enthusiast. Fuck yes. Has read Bataille. Surprised to see this on the list. But yes, I have read Bataille. Bataille is great. Um, I need to read more Bataille. I, I need to work Bataille more into my theory, actually. My critical self theory. Uh, is part of slash wants to form a commune. I consider the Denpa mob to be a digital commune. A Unabomber sympathizer. I sympathize with him. I don't agree with him on everything, but I sympathize with him. Uh, abolish all borders. Sure, that's a good end goal to work towards, I think. It's kind of annoying. Uh, left patchwork. It's strange that those two things are next to each other, but yes, I am definitely in favor of left patchwork. Universal basic firearms, kind of base. And ego communist. I don't know that I actually am an ego communist, but uh, I'm, I'm like close enough, right? Like there's kind of something else going on here. A little more, I don't know, but it's, it's close enough that I can count it in my opinion. Okay, so my next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go on Amazon and I'm gonna buy a the cheapest possible mic, um, laptop mic, laptop microphone. And I just, I don't want it to be USB. I want it to be fucking, uh, what the fuck? That looks terrible. That looks like, this is what I, yeah. Bro, fucking 399, this is what I'm talking about. Hell yeah. I'm gonna get this. I'm literally gonna buy this, buy now. This is probably the worst sounding thing ever, but that's kind of kind of epic. Um, I am buying this. I have purchased this now, and I'm going to use this to record future slice of life podcasts on my ThinkPad instead of my Mac because using the Mac is starting to make me feel sick. It's like it's like not eating your vegetables. You know, I feel like I'm I'm a corporate slave. Okay, here's a here's a dumb little thing that I'm probably misunderstanding. So I uh. There's a, in behavioral science, there's a name that I'm forgetting right now for a certain type of cognitive bias. They love talking about cognitive biases and, and some of them are real, some of them aren't real in my opinion. Um, but this is one of them that I think isn't real. Uh, and I forget the fucking name of it, which is making me sound a little stupid. But the premise is, uh, if you say, you go, go up to someone in the street and you say, I can give you a hundred dollars right now or you can wait for tomorrow, and tomorrow I will give you $101. They're more likely to pick the $100 now, but if you go up to some same person in the street and you say, I can give you $100 in a year, or I can give you $101 in a year and one day, which would you want? They'll pick the $101 in a year and one day. And a, a perfectly rational actor should pick the same thing both times. Um, and now I'm here to tell you why that's wrong. I don't think humans are perfectly rational actors, but I do think that in this situation, uh, you would want to pick the $100 now, and you would want to pick the $101 in a year and one day, rationally. Uh, and here's two, two brief explanations. The first thing, and they're, they're linked, right? The first thing is knowledge and certainty. Um, you generally, when you're making a decision, you want to maximize the amount of knowledge you have about the situation you're in when you're making that decision. So there could be, it's very unlikely, but possible that in one day's time, something will have happened to you, which means that getting $101 would actually be bad or not as good as it is right now. You don't know uh, what situation you're going to be in tomorrow, but you do know exactly what situation you're in right now. So it makes more sense to take the $100 now. Whereas you don't know what situation you're going to be in in a year and you also have no idea in a year and one day. The amount of knowledge you have for those situations is basically the same. It's pretty much, you could probably make some estimate, but you basically have no knowledge of what your situation you're going to be in. And so 
there's no difference in available knowledge for the hundred and the hundred and one dollars in the year and the year in one day uh therefore you should take the one which has more money because there's no other difference between them um now that's the weaker argument the stronger argument is opportunity cost uh, that you can reframe this as you're basically being paid money for as, as a sort of compensation for opportunity costs, uh, for opportunities that you could have taken but weren't able to. Um, so uh, you could take $100 right now, or I could pay you $1 in compensation for all of the opportunities you could have had to spend that money until tomorrow, right? Um, in this situation, you're getting paid $100 to wait zero time. So, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot. Whereas you're only getting one dollar to wait a whole day, which is infinitely longer than zero time. So therefore, not worth it. The the opportunity cost is too high. You want to take the money now. Whereas in the opposite scenario, or in the year versus year and one day scenario, you're getting paid a fraction of a dollar out of the hundred for a year, right? Like each day that you wait, you're getting paid a fraction of a dollar. I could I could calculate it right now. Hold on. Um, 100 divided by 365. You're getting paid like roughly $0.27 per day for the opportunity you're missing, right? Um, but then that last extra day suddenly is worth a whole dollar. So every day prior to that, while you were waiting, you were getting paid $0.27 approximately. Whereas that final day, you're suddenly getting paid $101. Now, I've just realized this doesn't make any sense because there's no opportunity where you could have had the $100 immediately in the second scenario. Okay, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I just realized this doesn't make any sense. I think there's something there though, uh, maybe. Okay, maybe the behavioral scientists were right. I don't think there's any reason. Okay, it's back to, but back to talking about Gemini now. Okay, a, a lot of people complain, including myself, that Gemini doesn't have inline image for good reason. There are a lot of things that simply can't be explained through pure tech. I'm running an anime gem log. I want to include screenshots for my next post. I cannot include screenshots for my next post. Um, I mean, technically I can, but can't really, um, unless I don't know what I can, but you know what would be fucking not even that difficult to implement? Get it in, in like Lagrange or some Gemini browser. And I think that some Gemini browsers already do this. Um, I just don't know fucking which ones, uh, but I've, I've heard that there's at least one, uh, sorry. I am now looking into this. This is a... Okay, who cares? The point being, you can have... You don't have to necessarily display inline image. You don't have to change the Gemini protocol or gem text. All you have to do is have a little check in the browser that just checks if something is an image, if a link is an image, if it ends in any of the image formats, right? This is like super easy. And then just displays that as if it's an image instead of a link. How difficult is that? That can't be hard. That can't be fucking hard to implement. Surely, surely that can't be that difficult. I think also, just to say another random thing, another aspect of Gemini that I think goes a little underappreciated is the philosophy that where that we're not web pages. Pages can be rendered in the the client decides the style. That's the thing, and I fucking love this. This is like maybe my favorite thing that Gemini has over HTML or HTTP, because like you might hear me complaining that Gemini doesn't have inline images, and in which case you might say, well, no one's stopping you from just making a lightweight website, which I have done. No, that's correct. No one is stopping me from just using the normal web if I want to display images. That's true and fair, Some sometimes fair. Uh, but uh, you have the browsers have to display websites in the way that their creators sort of intended them to be displayed within certain limits. Whereas Gemini capsules, you have a, a lot more freedom to render pages however you want them to be rendered. And I think this is a massive W for Gemini because if it's on my fucking machine, I want to have total control of what it does. And the web doesn't give that. To the web gives the control entirely over to some guy who's getting paid way too much to be a front-end web developer, UX designer. I hate these guys. I fucking hate these guys. I, right? They're getting paid way too much to do a terrible job of making sites 
absolutely unusable in the name of what they think of in the name of Silicon Valley aesthetics. I don't want that. I don't want the possibility for that. I want to render pages however I want them to be rendered because it's on my machine. I should get to decide that. And so that's definitely a big plus of Gemini. And I can understand how inlining images would definitely get in the way of that. Um, but anyway, I'm not here to complain. I'm not here to complain about that because it's fine. All right, I, I don't know how to fucking prove to you that what just happened happened to me. It's such a weird fucking coincidence. Okay, uh, okay. So I, I go on this particular place to talk to some of my friends. And one of my friends often posts screenshots from Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball because he plays that game fucking religiously because he's a, you know, D-Gen based gen um and so he posted it and i was like i know what i'll do i will go on youtube and i'll search up there's a clip that i've seen from a, um, an ultimate a, a smash ultimate event where they look through the the screenshots folder on the like the switch that was being used for the event and it has a bunch of screenshots from dead or alive extreme beach volleyball and i'll post that and i'll be like this uh is this you or something funny like that meanwhile in the background i'm listening to the i'm, I'm watching slash listening to tabbed over for the new richter overtime video do these unofficial mod sharing and i go to the new youtube tab and the second i say, start typing in the the i say I second I start typing it in. It was the most popular and pretty much only convenient way to go about spicing your game up with Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyballs. I feel kind of... What? He he just says the name of the game. What the fuck? What the... It was just the... Per, like, the exact perfect timing. Just as I was literally typing the word dead, he says it. Bro, the timing. The timing was insane. You know what I like? I like this particular style of commenter. When I make a really long video, person who opens their own thread in the comments by replying to themselves as they're going, sort of live commenting on the video. I, I like this kind of commenter. This is a this is a good kind of commenter. They're rare, they don't show up that often. Right, they're, they're a rare species, but I've seen them in my comment section. The sort of, the the live updater, self-thread maker. Yeah, I like this. I like this style. It's entertaining to read. Um, uh, hello, everyone, by the way. I'm not sure what this is. I'm not sure what's happening here. So this is, this is a, a, a podcast of some kind. A slice of life podcast, as I've taken, as I've, I've coined it. This is a slice of life podcast. Um... But I don't, I don't know. I don't know in a lot of different ways. I like the workflow of this, right? This is the thing. I like the workflow where it's just like, I just have Audacity open. I just tab over and boom, bam, bada -ba boom, pow. You know, I have my, I don't have to load up anything. I don't have to edit anything. It just happens and I just record and it's great. And then I can truncate silences really easily at the end. It's a very, I don't have to worry about filming anything. I don't have to, yeah. But I do think it loses some thing of the visual element of the the traditional denpa you know i watched this new osaka syndrome video uh which is called alienation is liberation i believe yes and i was like this is a classic denpa video you know this is a uh yeah this is a cl this is a classic you know what i'm saying real denpa hours as it says in the comments is a return to form and I do be returning to forms once in a while. I do be returning. Um, but yeah, I think I think we need to evolve the form. But these, what I'm saying is, I feel like it's lost some denpaism. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Like I feel like I feel like we 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 lose some aspect here. But I yeah, maybe what I should be doing instead. You know, I like pe I, people like long long form thing. I've gained two subscribers since yesterday. Interesting. Hi. Hi. My name's No Thank You and I'm a Hikikomori. My name's No Thank You and I'm a Hikikomori. Uh, <laughs> um, 
You know what? I'm gonna go on YouTube Studio. See what's happening. See what's up. What's poppin'? Yeah, it's just, it's screaming at me. Hey, your fucking Amory and Star Ocean video did badly and you should feel bad about it. It's really desperately trying to tell me this, but it's all addicted. I know why it did badly. Do you want me to explain? I actually don't know why it did badly, but I don't, at first I cared and then I realized the only reason I made it was to promote something that no one's gonna care about anyway. Um, my theory as to why it did badly, given that it's not really much different from any, like, it's not that much different from any of my other shit, right? I don't know, maybe it is because it's anime. Maybe my audience doesn't care that much about anime or random shows. I mean, that's also possible. But I, I, I suspect, you remember that thing I was talking about where like TikTok will give you some success and then purposely take it away from you to get you addicted? Like, I'm not saying that that's what Google's doing, but I'm saying that's the effect that the system tries to achieve, whether it's intentional or not. Like, I'm not saying I'm be, I've, like the video is shadow blocked or something like that. Like, I, I don't think that's true uh, or it's not being promoted properly. But the design of the website makes it so that if you have a website, uh, a video that doesn't do very well, like this one, you're, it like is trying to trigger that addictive response in you where you're like, oh no, I feel bad. My video didn't do well. I have to make more videos that do better so I can get that dopamine of getting a, the, the, the view per count again. And it has to go up, number has to go, yeah. But as, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's trying to manipulate me into thinking that and it's working. Like they know what they're doing. They got their site design down. You know, Google does hire behavioral psychologists, uh, behavioral scientists to help with site design. This is not just something I've made up. They, they, they like that stuff works on you, whether you know it's happening or not. Uh, but I, I do need to be a little, uh, um, aware, you know, I need to be a little aware. Valve. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. Man, today has been a weird fucking day so far, and it's barely begun. Also, I'm gonna, yeah, that, sorry, that was pretty loud. I keep dropping my pen while I'm pen spinning. You guys know this, I've already talked about this. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, distracting. I'm being distracted by nonces. Um, yeah, I had a weird day so far. Woke up, first thing I did, click on a Destiny video. I know, it was a terrible idea. Okay, you don't have to tell me it was a bad idea. I know it was a bad idea. We all know this was stupid. We all know I'm retarded. I don't I don't need you to make fun of me, right? <laughs> we can both acknowledge that I fucked up. Um, I, I don't know, man. I went through this very brief phase where I was like, hold on a minute, is, is Destiny kind of base? Just because he's good at rhetoric? And then I've just been slowly, <laughs> or not that slowly, but I've just been, you know how like big tech overhired? during the pandemic and is now like doing massive layoffs to to compensate for the fact that they overhired that's what happened with my brain and credit to destiny where i over credited him for being like an intelligent political commentator and now i'm like mass firing brain cells that told me to think that uh, i don't know how i mean i think it's because i mean and i can tell you actually uh, at least partially why the first thing is that my standard for like internet twitch personality political commentator is incredibly low like when it comes to youtube video assist political commentator there were people like jonas sierka cck philosophy or unlearning economics who like are pretty fucking high standard right or even like maybe zero books you know there's there's a few of them, maybe, uh, depending on how esoteric you want to get, maybe hermetics, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a reasonable standard, uh, of quality, but in terms of streamer, political commentator, what have you got? You got Vosh and Hassan, like, those guys, and then all the right-wing guys, like, but uh, you got Vosh and Hassan, like, that's, that, those guys, I, I think both of them have some sort of like Vosh I think is like developmentally disabled in some capacity and Hassan is might as well be so compared to those guys Destiny's a fucking intellectual giant but obviously that doesn't make him actually smart so that's the first thing is that the people I had to compare like I was so surprised to find someone who was able to have any sort of thought you know existed and the second thing is that when I when when Osaka syndrome got me into Destiny I went back and watched like his best videos. I watched the ones that interested me and like the 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 good ones, right? So I had a bias towards his best like his, the peak his peak performance. Um whereas average destiny video is is not that. It is not very it is not clever intellectual debate or anything like that. 
Although, sometimes he just gets people who are smarter than him on his show and they just debate each other. And that's good. I like it when that happens. Or, actually, a good example of one that happened fairly recently is uh, he had this video. Let me look. Um, I believe it was called, sorry, um, Deep Fake and Anti Porn Debate with Aussie Feminist. Now, that was actually, you would expect that to be a terrible video. But this Aussie feminist person actually knows their shit. Like she's actually fucking well read and and very intelligent and smart and capable of making nuanced points and opinions that don't, aren't just like blanket black and white, you know, thing bad or thing good. Uh, and like analyzing data and uh, having an actual grounded philosophical stance, which is, is able to like she she was based right. And that made the video good. I like it when Destiny talks to smart people. Um, and, you know, th- that video even changed my mind on, on um, certain topics. Be- and it's like two hours uncut. Uh, and she she's... I recommend watching it, honestly. I think she's a... Uh, she knows her shit. Uh, but Destiny himself becomes more and more insufferable the longer I pay attention to him. And then I don't fucking know, honestly. But the real problem is that this video that I watched, it wasn't just Destiny. It was... It was, it was Dick Masterson. It was fucking Dick Masterson. This fucking guy, man. This guy's so annoying. This Dick Masterson guy is so annoying. I don't, I don't understand why people like him. I don't know, man. This guy's so fucking annoying. And the thing that made me mad about this video is that, uh, whatever, you don't, you don't care about this. I don't, I'm not going to talk about it because you don't care. I've also, I would have talked about it if I had been recording this a few hours ago, but I've already ranted about this to everyone I know. So I, I'm ranted out. The point isn't the content of the video, okay? The video is awful. Everyone involved in the creation of the video is terrible, at least in their performance in that particular video. And they're saying really, really dumb shit that if someone said that to me, I would, I would like shout at them because it's like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, for example, at one point, um, Dick Masterson brought like a little, a le- little lackey with him, like a little uh, sidekick lackey type character. I, I don't know who this person is, uh, but but the, that person is like all these lefties. They were saying they were gonna boycott Twitter, and then like I don't see them around anymore. What happened to that? It's like well, because you're looking for them on Twitter, you fucking idiot. What are you talking about? Because the the ones that are left on Twitter aren't aren't the ones that boycotted Twitter. You're not going to see the ones who boycotted Twitter on Twitter because they're boycotting Twitter. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You absolute retard. You mongoloid. You idiot. Like, what are you talking about? You know, is mongoloid a racist term? So, apologies if I just said something racist. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, that kind of like, are you retarded? What are you talking about? Yeah, like really obvious logical stuff like that. That just... This is the sort of thing that you would expect Destiny to push back on. Like, he's generally good at pushing back on this sort of thing. He just doesn't. He just sits there and nods and agrees with them as they say the dumbest shit you can possibly fucking imagine. Like, they're cutting little boys' penises off. No, they're not. Who's who's doing that? Like, this is the sort of thing that Destiny normally does, right? He says, give me, like, show me. Where did they do that? When did they do that? Where's the where's the shitty fucking Daily Mail article you read that says they did that? And let's actually look at what happened and you'll find out that no one's doing that. No one wants to do that. That's insane. You're just being lied to, right? That's the that's the Destiny thing. Except Destiny doesn't do it. He doesn't do it half the fucking time. You watch Destiny because you expect him to do it, but he just doesn't do it half the time. It's like, I... I, I don't know. I don't know, man. This video made me mad. Video made me, me mad. And then I got mad, and I was just mad for, like, hours because of this fucking video making me mad. And now I've... I'm the pathetic one here, right? Like, I can't blame anyone else. This is 100%. I'm just... I have... I'm sorry. I don't know what you expect from me. I have autism. I have literally the the, the condition known as autism spectrum disorder, motherfucker. I am diagnosed by a doctor. I go to the doctor and they literally say to me, how's your ASD thing going? That's like the first thing they say to me, okay? It comes up in my file. It must come up, big letters, this guy is autistic, right? I have autism. You you gotta expect that these sorts of things happen, okay? These, these things, I know, I know they're suboptimal and maybe you could argue cringe correctly that 
that I could I could be emotionally affected by someone on internet make bad argument uh you know <clears throat> like yeah yeah it's is it cringe sure but also autism <laughs> have you heard of this phenomenon of elite overproduction i think that this is this is the wrong way around um the idea is that sometimes societies including as an example modern american society get themselves stuck into a sort of situation where they are producing elite too many sort of elite high level workers to fill the small amount of feasibly available jobs that they could take take like highly college educated people but in very specialized fields that are very intelligent we have produced too many of these to actually fill the jobs that those fields require right this is a pretty common issue everyone understands it like people with degrees who end up working shitty uh service sector jobs because they can't find jobs in their field of specialty even you know and conservatives like to make the meme that like oh you went to study women's studies in creative dance interpretation or something so and then you complain that you can't get a job no this is like stem people this is like people who studied for real fields that can't find jobs in their fields right uh you know this is definitely a thing the the only sector that has the opposite problem is programming and with how good ai is getting at writing programs it seems like that might not be a problem computer science i should say rather than programming but that might you know they might be affected too soon um <clears throat> so you have this problem of elite overproduction and this is scary because uh this tends to be associated with very bad outcomes for societies that have this problem um some people have partially even blamed this for like the collapse of the roman empire for example i don't know how true that is i'm not a roman empire history history guy i don't know that much about that but i i know that some people blame this partially um you know they they talk about this as like this big bad but i here's the thing is is i think the framing is is a misdirect i the idea is we're we're producing too many of these um elites right we're, uh, you need to have this like non like a large sort of non-elite workforce to prop up the elites right you can't you just can't fit all of them in the jobs but <clears throat> it doesn't ask the real question because what that sounds like is you know we have i don't know what it sounds like it I'm trying to figure out how to make this story make sense. But really, the problem isn't we're producing too many elites. The problem is the base level of society working class general jobs don't pay enough. And so people feel like they have no choice then to go to university. That the out life outcomes of college educated people in America versus people without college degrees are so different in terms of like positive outcomes for people with pos college degrees that <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense not to do it as an investment. That's the problem. And that's not because those jobs are too well paid. Some of them are, but that's not the real reason. The real reason is because the other jobs that don't require a college degree, that aren't elite jobs, they're fucking shit. No one wants to do them. They, I mean, not just from a like they're hard or arduous perspective, but from a like I can't have a normal, reasonable life working this job. I can't make enough money. <clears throat> you know, like that's that's the reason that we're overproducing elites. It's it's a consequence of this problem that the people on the bottom holding the whole pyramid up. No one wants to do that because it's shit. <laughs> because you don't get fucking paid enough. And so even people who don't really have a particular interest in going to college or studying for some specific field or whatever, they're pressured pressured into it by the market forces who tell them, look, you can either get paid minimum wage and live paycheck to paycheck, or you can live a reasonable, you know, life by going into some elite field. Even if you end up working at Starbucks or something like that, still on aggregate, at least you have the opportunity to in the future not. <clears throat> the problem is that working at Starbucks is such a bad outcome. That should just be a normal, reasonable outcome. Those, you know, well, maybe not Starbucks specifically. I mean, Starbucks workers, they, they, they're they unionizing for a reason, right? They deserve more pay than they're getting. But, um, you know, the, the, the street cleaners, garbage collectors, you know, all the stuff that's necessary for society to function. Uh, and actually some of those civil servant jobs are decently paid. I don't know how it is in America. In the UK, some of them, they're like decent. They're actually pretty good if you can get them. But a lot of other like low level service sector jobs, they, you know, they're not, they're not. We all know this, right? That's the bottom of society. And so uh, what we need is some way to raise that, that floor to the point where you don't 
only have the option of becoming an elite if you want any chance at a better life, that you can have a reasonably good life without becoming an elite. That only the people who need to become elites become elites because the, and the rest of them don't fucking starve. <clears throat> and obviously you can probably think of a couple ways to do this. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I often hear right-wingers talking about this because it's always right-wingers who are obsessed with the Roman Empire for some reason, the fall of Rome. I, I don't think they understand this, right? Like, I don't think they understand why there is this problem of elite overproduction in the first place. The problem is that people don't have any other fucking choice than to, to try and desperately become elite. That they, 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 they would be perfectly happy if they could live a comfortable, reasonably comfortable life as a normal worker but they can't. That's not an option for them. <clears throat> Hello, guys. Uh, I'm a little upset. I'm a little mad. I'm a little molding. And here's why. So, at some point after recording the previous segment you just heard, I decided to continue recording this this Slice of Life podcast on my ThinkPad. Um, <clears throat> and it, yeah. So I transferred the file over to there and I rec recorded the rest of it on my ThinkPad. Uh, but then, oh boy, then I'm, I'm over here and I'm like, oh, been a while since I've done a, a system update, a, a pseudo Pac-Man SYU type beat, right? So I run it. And at the same time, I don't know, I'm doing something else. I don't even remember what it is. But somehow it crashes. My computer crashes during this update. At the, actually, just the desktop crashed. The whole computer didn't crash. The desktop crashes, right? Unless it's possible that I somehow... It's un possible but unlikely because it's not an easy keybind to hit. But I do have a keybind to, like, log me out of the desktop, to close the desktop, right? And just put me back on the, uh, the login screen. So it's possible that this was my fault that I somehow accidentally pressed three buttons that are all over the fucking keyboard somehow without noticing during the update process. Either way, whatever happened, whether the desktop crashed or whether I accidentally somehow logged out, this was in the middle of an update. No good, right? But at the time, I thought, okay, well, if I just run Pac-Man SYU again, it should fix itself, but it didn't. I didn't know what to do, but I kind of assumed, I don't know what I assumed, okay? I should have I should have probably double checked this. I should have double checked to be like, okay, let's make sure nothing's broken because of that. But I, I because when I ran, Pac-Man SYU again, it didn't give me any big error messages or tell me anything was wrong. I assumed everything was okay. Unfortunately, this was not correct because then, um, today, when I attempted to, to turn my computer on, I have discovered that I don't have a kernel. The kernel is broken or uninstalled or something. Um, and so I had to, I, I, yeah, so I basically had to try and, uh, update the kernel by booting into a live USB environment and chirruting into the file system and then updating the kernel from there. But at that point, I figured, you know, that's such a, like, firstly, I tried, I tried following a base, it, I've never done that before, right? I'm not super knowledgeable about how that stuff works. So I tried following a basic guide I could find and, um, <clears throat> Uh, it, it didn't work, and so I just decided, uh, fuck it, I'll just reinstall. I'll just do a fresh install. And so that's what I've done, literally just now. Just as I've been talking to you, I have reinstalled Arctic. But I am now going to, res to restore from a backup, uh, which is a couple of months old, because I don't back up super, super often, which is fine, in my opinion. Um, but I need to install some stuff first, right? I'm gonna need to install... I don't know how the backup works, how, how, how fucking rigorous it is, but anyway, I need to restore from a backup. The point is I lost all the stuff that I talked about in the podcast up until now. Okay, man, I have deleted three entire podcasts, all of which were like two to three hours long. Uh, and I don't know why. Like, for zero good reason, just decided it was a bad idea. And now I have come to a conclusion that I'm just gonna use this and I'm gonna post it on IDMR. Why? Wait, didn't I, didn't I say this exact same thing in the previous podcast that I was like, actually, I'm actually gonna post it on Backwards channel. I, I don't fucking know. I have no, no idea. Um, man, the, the, the anime girl I drew to be the, the channel thumbnail for IDMR is so based. It looks so good. 
in my opinion. But that means I don't have to put any effort into this, which is, that's nice. Nice to know that I don't have to care about any of this. So that's nice, I suppose. Um... Not that I, I don't know if I cared in the first place. You know, I'm in a weird position, right? Like this is the constant dichotomy. I mean, it's the dichotomy of anyone who makes anything ever, right? Which is like trading off what do you want to do versus what do you think your audience would like? Because the whole point is that uh, you don't want to do exactly, like, like, it's dumb to do exactly what your audience wants because people don't want what they want, right? If they... If they go to see a movie and it's exactly how they expected a movie to be, then it's not surprising and it's boring and cliched. Except for me. I just want what I want. Right? I, th I don't know if this is just autists in general or just me. Maybe it's just... I don't know. I want what I want, right? Like, I I'll watch the same... Effectively the same anime over and over again. As l because that's what I like. And I will just watch this, uh, but the same thing with minor variations. I there's a there's a scene in the anime Seto Kaino Ichizon, which I'm... Uh, which I picked back up. I actually dropped it when I first tried to watch it. I dropped it on the second episode. But ever since I've dropped it, I, I've, it's been in the back of my mind because well, there's a couple of reasons. It's the character designer is the same character designer as Subahibi, which is actually how I found the show. And secondly, because I liked, there was like, I don't know, there was some some sort of je ne sais quoi that I liked about the show beyond the aesthetic. Um, but it was so long since I dropped it that I'd forgotten what that was. And when I picked it back up, I was very surprised to learn that the show was good and I have no fucking clue why I dropped it. What I remember was, when dropping it, was that I was kind of split on whether I should mark it as dropped or mark it as on hold and that I, because the, I just wasn't in the mood to watch it. I don't really know. But anyway, I've picked it back up and it's good. And I think there's a scene in, I want to say episode three, but I don't remember which episode it is. Where the main character is talking about eroge and he's he's basically talking like he's giving a speech about how much he loves eroge as main characters tended to do in this era of anime and um he uh he he's do but he's giving the speech but the stuff he's saying is all like negatives but he's framing it as if like but he loves it and one of the th and so he's saying like uh like eroge fans is all about having dedication and patience the patience to uh, play essentially the same game with essentially the same character tropes over and over and over again, just for the minor variations. And I agree that that is what Eroge are like. <laughs> and that's also kind of what the anime I like are like. You know, I like Isekai and I like Slice of Life, Cute Girls Doing Cute Things, Yashike. Right? I, I like these shows that are basically just the thing I like over and over again with some variations. And if it's like the other ones, I'm probably going to enjoy it. Like, that's the thing, is if someone made an anime that was exactly like Hidamari Sketch in many ways and followed the same exact structure as Hidamari Sketch, I wouldn't say, like, I've never had the feeling, oh, it's a generic slice of life anime. I've never had that feeling as a negative because that's only a positive to me. Anyway, I digress. Normies don't like it when things are just the same. And I mean, to be fair, I don't like this in other mediums. Like, I don't like movies that are cliche. So maybe that's a thing. I don't know. It requires further research. Um, was I? Oh, yeah. There's this, there's this push and pull between making stuff that you think that you want to make and making stuff that you think your audience is going to like. And sometimes the thing is that, that, that you might... Uh, your, your immediate reaction upon hearing this might be, well, like, I'm a fucking patrician, and so I want to watch just the most pure artistic expression. I don't want it to be made or catered for me. Like, the best art is always the most pure expression of the, the author's artistic intent or whatever the fuck, right? But I have a counterpoint, which is that oftentimes trying to appeal to an audience and make something that, that you think other people will like is what pushes you towards making better stuff that isn't necessarily fun in the moment. Like, uh, for example, the Mario 64 video I made, I know this isn't like, I know I'm, I said good art, but I'm just giving an example. I, the video's fine. Uh, like, I think it's a good video, but it wasn't fun to make, right? It took three days of, of grinding and editing. Like, the, it's the most I've ever worked on editing a video. It, it, it was like, a, like, I like, I enjoy the sort of tedious t parts of editing m more than most people. I've talked about this before. I like, I enjoy the tedious parts of editing, but up to a point, <laughs> definitely up to, it gets a little fucking annoying after a while. Um, but I wouldn't have done that. The video wouldn't be as, as edited together and as nice to watch as it is if I hadn't been thinking this is going to be something that might, you know, new viewers of the channel might see 
and that I want to present a positive impression to them or something to impress people, right? No, I mean, that wasn't the entire reason I did it. It's also that, like, I can look at the end product and be satisfied, but I won't lie if I... I would be lying if I said that that wasn't a part of it, that I want um, the audience to... Uh, not feel bored when they're watching it, right? Like to to stick around to the end and to feel entertained by it. You know what I mean? So I don't think that... I think there's always this sort of two-way street. But when I first started my Backwards channel, I didn't realize that yet. And I thought... The, I don't know what I thought, really. But if you scroll all the way back in my channel, um, my first video... I wish they took away the sort by oldest fucking button, which is really annoying. So just scroll all the way down. Yeah, the first video, I think. Oh no, no, no it's actually the fourth vi fourth video with manifesto. The entire point of this channel is to be unknown. It's only linked in one other place that's public facing, and so there might be some some chats or something that's linked in. It's only linked in the other place only facing. So if you found it, you've most likely come of these places. This is an experiment because the internet generally frames every interaction you have every website participate where you create content website as a competition where the end goal is to have as many viewers subscribers followers friends comments likes as you can get the number to be as big as possible but when you think about it, there is no reason to actually do that there is no reason to play the game as it was intended to be played so this is my attempt beat the system and play the game in a completely unintended way this is not intended play this is this is this is uh, not what google's it's not even really what i want it's more of a shallow statement made to make it something that doesn't follow this law i don't want this channel to become successful it'll have many subscribers i'd never i don't really expect it to ever gain uh, uh, like 20 or so subscribers I don't think it will even reach that level for a long, long time. Um, but that's completely okay, and that is the entire goal of the channel. This is supposed to be some exclusive, rare, undinged, obtuse, obscure depths of the internet. Because we've been fooled into believing that social interactions are a contest of who can interact with the most people at once, but they're not, and I don't want them to be. And I, because of what I've chosen to do as a job, I kind of have to make them be. Like, I can't, you, it's impossible to make them. I mean, art is all about, in order to make money is art, with art, you have to have some sort of base, right? You can't just make money with art if one sees it. It's impossible. But that kind of ruins my interactions with the internet. Like, it doesn't ruin it, but it takes away my freedom to not do that. I can't make it, I can't release a harsh noise out, but thank you. I mean, I could, but actually, that's not bad. It's not a good example, because I probably could and people wouldn't mind. But, like, I can't release a, a pop album under No Thank You, for example, because that would just go against everything that No Thank You is supposed to be. So, um, so I'm not free, because, uh, like, I can't do what I want. I have to appease some sort of fan base. Here, I can do literally anything. There is absolutely no lens. That I could, I could, if I wanted to, post something I worked for a year. I could post something that took me an entire year of effort on here for no one to see. Or I could post something like this, which took me five minutes of no limitations. I'm 100 free. I'm taking back the internet for myself because I do not care about popularity. This is a popularity contest. This is nothing. This is pure noise, noise. So I hope you enjoy this chat. Thanks for checking out. Please stop by another time. You don't have to. Do you know free, despite what Google to think, despite, despite what you may have been taught and programmed, no programmed, conditioned to think by the endlessly uptickers, slowly progressing towards some sort of never have. You don't have to try and get as big as possible. It's okay to let yourself be obscure. It's okay. That's why this channel exists. To teach me that lesson and maybe spread that lesson to Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It didn't. It didn't fucking work. I failed spectacularly. 20 subscribers in years? Motherfucker. I'm almost a thousand. Okay, maybe not. Well, I'm I'm closing in. I have 899. Maybe it'll be 900 by the time you see this. And of course, you know, Google being who they are, they've got me... I need to listen to my past self a little more, you know? Like, they, those guys at Google, they've got me, uh... They've got me hooked on, on a feeling. Hooked on a feeling. Bah, 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 sorry. They've got me hooked on on this 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 dream and the dream 
is is a thousand subscribers when I can monetize my channel. This never occurred to me until I randomly looked at my sub count the other day and realized, hold on a minute, a thousand subs is actually well within view. Now I don't know if I'll make any money from hitting from being able to monetize my videos. So I don't know why I care. But I the thing is okay, you know what? I do know why I care and it's kind of stupid. So my main music channel i keep call it's weird that i refer to that as my main channel when i post here way more often and put that's just my music channel i should call that my music channel and this my main channel and idmr my second channel okay that makes sense in my mind so my the the forwards channel <laughs> immediately uses a different category the forwards channel hit a thousand subs ages ago but has never been approved for um monetization because i don't have enough watch hours um, because, you know, it, making albums takes a long time and they're only an hour long. You know, I just don't have enough watch hours. I don't know how to get more necessary. I mean, maybe I, I don't know, whatever. You need a certain number of, it's not just subscribers that you need to hit. You need to do a lot of other stuff. And one of them is you have to have a certain number of watch hours within a certain set period, uh, to get monetization. But this channel could definitely get that because I can spam videos and I know that like at least a hundred people will basically watch everything I make. So it's like, even if, and they'll, and the more actually counterintuitively, the long, well, maybe it's not counterintuitively, but the longer, you know, you motherfuckers will watch 12 hours of shit right? The watch hours isn't a problem for me here. I've got nothing but watch hours. In fact, I've got everything. I, I don't have anything else. All I have is hours. That's all I fucking have is hours. Uh, so, so I think because for years I've been thinking about this, this, the forwards channel, not having monetization. And it's just been like niggling at the back of my head somehow, even though it doesn't matter. I make, you know, YouTube pay, this is, there's actually a, uh, uh, this is such a big problem that I was taught it in music school. Uh, they call it like the pay gap or something, the worth gap, I forget. But YouTube pays way less than any other streaming service from like for music, like Spotify um, and all of the other ones. I already make money off of that. Um, not much, but a little bit. It, it doesn't, not enough to really matter, but it's fun. Um, whereas, yeah, YouTube pays, pays like 10x less, 10 divided, well, 10 slash, 10, 10 times, it pays a lot less than the other things. So it doesn't matter for my career or whatever that, imagine having a career but it doesn't matter for my money that i don't really have youtube monetization i'm not losing out on much anyway um uh but still it's like it's like i've got this carrot dangled in front of me and i'm just lusting after it for whatever stupid reason um yeah i don't know maybe i should be pushing my patreon harder i have a patreon the thing the thing about patreon is you have i feel like you have to hit a certain threshold. Like this is what happened to Digi is you, once you like Digi was making almost all of their money through Patreon, right? And so at some point I remember they decided like, what am I even bothering with YouTube for except to grow the Patreon? The Patreon people are the ones paying my bills. They're the only ones I have to appease, right? So I should just make videos that, that only appeal to like mainly appeal to those guys. And now I've seen this guy um, uh, the spirited man, Van Neistat, Casey Neistat's brother, he makes interesting videos. And I saw, you know, him go from, hey, I'm starting a Patreon and hey, I'm selling merch to now he does videos. One goes on YouTube. Then the next week it goes exclusively on Patreon. Then the next week, YouTube, then the next week, exclusively Patreon. And he pushes this really hard. Like he pushes this at the start of his video is a call to action saying next week's video will be on Patreon exclusively. Go subscribe to my Patreon. So it's like, but it took him a while to get there, right? Cause you can't, you have to build the Patreons first before you can do that. You know what I mean? Also, it's much more viable these days that I could, cause my Patreon was based on the idea that it's like ridiculously good value for money, that you pay $1 a month and you get s more music than you could possibly know what to do with. But that was when I was in a different time in my life, when I was making music in a different way for different purposes constantly, and I could reliably do that. But nowadays the Patreon is just a lie and I'm amazed no one's called me out on it yet. Like I, I kind of feel bad about this because the Patreon is just lying to people. I do not post as much music there as I say I'm posting there. I still post exclusive songs and early access songs there, but uh, I can't keep up the promise of like uh, 
you know, a song a week, every week on the Patreon. Um, and so, but I could hella post a video a week on the Patreon, that would, or a podcast a week on the Patreon. Bro, I could do a podcast, a Patreon podcast every week, and it would be the, the easiest fucking thing of my life. It would be great. Maybe I should do that. Maybe that's what this should be. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I don't know what anything is anymore. Maybe I do, maybe I do a Patreon podcast. That could be an easy and fun way to do things. I don't know. Do I want, like, I'm saying this as if, like, this is the thing, is I'm saying this as if, like, my goal is to monetize my audience. But I don't need your money, really. Not really. I mean, f- for long-term financial stability, like, more money is never a bad thing. That's the thing. But, like, <clears throat> I don't need it right now. I'm good for now. Uh, but I suppose you're supposed to think about long-term financial stability. And in that sense, the manifesto would be countered. I would be like, well, hold on a minute, past thank you. Well, okay, there's a couple of things that have changed since the manifesto. I should point out, I should actually do some commentary on that. The first thing is that, that when I made that manifesto, I was very annoyed with the fact that like I felt like I had to have a controlled brand on the to, to, for no thank you. Turns out that was not true. I did not have to do that. Um, I just felt like I had to do that. I have, you know, like I was think I was thinking to myself, like I have to post on Twitter once a day at least on my on my no thank you Twitter account to make sure that I stay in people's minds so that they don't forget about me and so that I can hype up my albums releasing and so on. Right. It turns out. No, you don't have to do that at all, actually. You can just not do that. So I did, so <laughs> so that's like a big thing that doesn't matter to me anymore. Um, and I was pushed, you know, at the time, again, I was really trying to grow this music-based Patreon um, because I figured my my entire concept for No Thank You was it's the DigiBro model, but for music, right? Like Digi's model was human content machine, pump out as much content as possible, direct people to the Patreon, mainly be supported by patrons, and I was like, I can do that. I can pump out as much music as a human can feasibly pump out, and I can direct people over to the Patreon. The problem that I didn't realize, it well, I mean, there's a couple of things. The first thing is Digi got really lucky in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, just because they managed to do something with a business model doesn't mean everyone can do that. They were, yeah, okay, there's a whole bunch of problems with that plan. It was a little fucking pie in the sky to be like, and then I will become a famous musician and it will be easy because I'm a genius. Turns out that's not really how it works. I uh, probably should have seen that one coming uh so that's the first thing that ch- so th- those that that changed and then also i discovered it's kind of fun to make i mean i said in that thing the point is to be obscure i've changed my opinion on that a little bit you know at the time when i made that i was really into this idea of like obscurity online right i was there was kind of a, a big part of my identity was that i saw myself as someone who hung out in really obscure online places like i i would spend hours scouring through obscure bbs's and text boards and image boards and forums and just trying to find these like really niche communities um and and joining in uh, but it turns out most of those places and also i was really really into like the concept of niche obscure music um but since then my tastes have changed, my hobbies have changed, uh, you know, I still like a lot of the niche obscure music, but I'm also a little more open to more popular music, I mean, my favourite band, well, I guess I have two favourite bands, I, but my two favourite bands are Shinsei Kamata-chan, who, I mean, they're not, they're definitely not obscure in Japan, uh, and they're no longer obscure in the West, because they did the, the Attack on Titan OP uh, for the, the one of the recent seasons. Um, and they had the Ruru Suicide on Livestream song blow up in the West. So those guys aren't obscure anymore. I, I still a frustratingly low amount of people have listened to Tsumane. Actually, let's check. I, I, I wonder if, I, let's see if it has like way more views. I mean, yeah, 190k views for the best album ever made. A little low, a little bit low there. Could could do with a couple more views than that. And especially like, uh, what the? I I looked up Tsumane. The I didn't even my eyes just glossed over it straight to the straight to the 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 album. But the other videos that what the fuck is happening? The other when I searched up Tsumane in in like Romaji, the other videos are the top video is my eighteen plus Tsumane Tsukasa. X Amane fanfic turned video part one Uwu smart yaoi gay dubcon and then there's another one 18 plus F U beta AMV edit Hamanene versus Tsumane 
Tsukasa X Amane TBHK. And there's a bunch of these. So it's all from the same channel. It's not actually all from the same channel. What what is TBH I don't know what what I don't know what anime this is. Fucking flies buzzing around me. I don't know what, what fucking it says 18 the video says 18 plus, but I go to this person's channel and the I see fucking commonly asked questions. I scroll over it, it says, I'm 13. Bro, what the fuck are you doing, motherfucker? Get off the goddamn internet. Stop making yaoi ASMR. What are you doing? Sorry. Got a little bit distracted there. Um, anyway, uh, so my two favorite albums are, or my bands, are The Talking Heads and Shinsei Kamatsu-chan. Talking Heads are pretty fucking world famous and Shinsei Kamatsu-chan is not particularly, I mean, some of their stuff is obscure, but they're not entirely obscure, right? Whereas, and, and to be fair, I liked Shinsei Kamatsu-chan back then too. I don't know, I was more into this idea where I was like, niche equals cool. Um, but now I just don't care anymore about cool. I just know what I like and I like it. Uh, that's kind of my, I don't know. I, I It's not, sometimes I miss that. I just, it, it no longer has the same allure to me, you know? Maybe I'm just jaded or something. It doesn't spark the magic of discovery. I guess it just slowly stopped giving me that excitement. But I mean, it, it's not like I don't, it's not like I actually care about like growing or whatever, right? Because if I did, I would not be doing what I'm doing right now. I would not be making the videos that I make. If I cared about growing, here's what I would do right now. I would hard pivot to the debate sphere. I would hard pivot to being like a, a debate bro Twitch streamer because I have an existing audience and I'm sure I could take like at least a hundred of you with me to Twitch, right? So I would hard pivot to Twitch streaming, posting VODs on YouTube so you guys would still see them, right? Hard pivot to Twitch streaming, take up taking some of you with me because just having, okay, maybe I wouldn't be able to take a hundred with me because, you know, time zones and whatever, but I wouldn't be starting from literally zero, which is the hardest place to start from. Any, on Twitch, any pre-existing fan base is is like gonna give you a, a massive leg up um because like even one like when you're first starting out even one extra viewer matters a whole lot because of how twitch sorts its categories right where the the more viewers you have the higher up you appear um and so having even one extra viewer is going to put you above the next guy right and so i pivot hard pivot to debates and then i go into these like discord debate servers and i would debate like insane shit i don't know all of the issues of the day i'm pretty good at debating i can take heat and give heat you know um uh it wouldn't be particularly fun for me it would probably be a terrible life decision that i would hate and i, I because the debate the whole thing i would basically be really toxic and i would try and get people to be toxic to me and then i would take the vods post them on youtube and then take those youtube vods and take clips where i own someone post them on tiktok um and then I would, you know, slowly work my chain, my way up the chain of debaters. It's like a chain of debaters is what I've discovered, right? You've got like Destiny, who I guess is like kind of the, I mean, and some of the other, I guess Vosh also, but I don't know much about Vosh. And there's probably others, right? Like, but whatever. Destiny is kind of the center of it. So Destiny, and then Destiny has his orbiters. But then the thing is those orbiters have orbiters. And and that's the crazy thing, right? Like Destiny, he has orbiters like, like Chud logic, right? Uh, but then Chud Logic has his own fucking orbiters, uh, and I think like I think this sphere of political debates is is blowing the fuck up right now. Like I think this is the perfect time to get your foot in the door if you wanted to pivot, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, blow up in this kind of context. And like I have a relatively unique lifestyle that gives me some sort of USP, right? Like I have I have the hickey neat thing going on. I, you, I could use a lot of 4chan aesthetics and thumbnails and so on, right? Like this, like Denpa sets you up to be good in the debate sphere. So like if I wanted to grow, I would be doing that. I would be spamming TikTok with clips of debates where I own people. This channel would be a debate channel and I'd be on Twitch debating fucking retards and I'd be going insane. But I don't want to grow. Like that's how I'd grow. Or I would be making... Uh, exclusively video essays that are highly edited, um, you know, if I wanted to do that, um, that's another option too. But instead, I record in 640 by 480 vlogs about how the real world is uh, terrible and we need to escape into the realms of the 2D and the hyper real is actually be like unironically better than the real 
anyone freaking out about this is like a fucking boomer or whatever and then talk about how like anime lollies are making my life significantly better and how uh there's there's a group of people who want to literally kill me by taking them away from me um which i think you know at the time felt very very true to me (laughs) even i was going a little bit schizo but anyway uh you know there's a bit of a difference there so it's not like i have broad appeal like, this is also the thing about Digi, is that Digi grew to a certain size and then stopped growing. And then After Dark grew to a certain size and then stopped growing. And like, but at the same time, like, Osaka is still growing. Osaka's growing uh, in subs, but not in views, right? Whereas I'm growing in views and sort of subs, which is weird. But I don't know why. I don't know if I want this. I don't, I'm just conflicted, right? Because they're literally tempting with money. They're saying, like, grow your channel a little bit more, and then you can have money. And then it's going to be like, well, if your video does good, we're going to reward you with cash, right? And that's going to be a fucking weird relationship. So, like, I don't... Because I'm, like, unlike, you know, Osaka did a bunch of copyright infringement and got banned from monetization. I am not going to be banned from monetization because I am careful not to do that sort of thing um, for whatever reason. I don't know. It's kind of stupid. But I, I get... I don't... I... I don't know, right? Like, I I could definitely monetize my channel if I just get a couple more, get, like, a hundred more subs. It's definitely doable, and that's obviously tempting, because it's money, and money is tempting. Um, but money is also the root of all evil, and is that evil? But then again, and this is the other thing, it's like, if I was making video essays and edited videos, and I was getting comments that were like, bro, like, you really fucking are selling out and turning into a normie, go back to your old style of stuff, I would immediately go back. If I got, like, a couple of comments like that, I would be like, yeah, this is fucking dumb, and I would go back, because that, you know, if I felt like, if it felt like I was being disingenuous, I think that's the real key thing here, is that none of this is being disingenuous for the point of growth. When I made Abandoned Games, when I made the Mario 64 video, when I make thumbnails and titles that look a little more catchy, none of it is for the sake of growth before or success before expression or whatever you want to call it. Like, it's always stuff that I'm genuinely interested and just me trying to make whatever I actually want. Like, the I had something to say about video games and so I made a video, like, and it was something that needed precise language, right? It was something that needed precise language, and so a video essay format was the best format. Or, like, I had something to... I had an idea for a challenge that seemed fun to me, and that type of format was the best format. Like, even if they're a little more smooth, a little more rounded off, it's just like when Boris made a new album, right? Like, that's one of my favourite Boris albums, and what they said when interviewed was the best noise we can make right now is pop. So it's like, I've always got the boogie and I got the pop as well. And and that's that. For some reason, I've been on tech YouTube today. Well, I'll actually, will, I will tell you the reason. But I don't know if I should tell you the reason now. I guess I will tell you the reason now. Welcome to my audio diary slice of life podcast. Uh, so I've been on tech YouTube today because, well, my phone is really old pardon me um i don't know if you could hear that but uh my phone is very old now my phone is actually not that old let me explain in around 2015 2016 i got a nexus 5x and the phone's fine but in addition i got this case with it called the unicorn beetle case and this is Without a doubt, the best phone case I've ever seen, I've ever come across at all. It turns the phone into a rugged phone better than any rugged phone on the market. I have thrown this thing across the... It just will not break. You can drop it on concrete floors. It will not get a scratch. It is the best case ever invented as far as I'm concerned. And that is what's been keeping me on this phone because I'm clumsy. I drop my shit all the time. Uh... But I've actually gone through three Nexus 5Xs since 2015 when I first got one. The first one broke um, in a mosh pit at a punk show. Uh, The screen cracked and uh, it broke it. It got broken, it got brokey, it didn't work no more. So, actually I just realized I've gone through four of these. Fucking hell. (laughs) 
uh, this was actually the year I got it. Or this was in like, this was very soon after I got it, which was pretty fucking cringe, as you can imagine, given that my mom just bought me this phone for, for Christmas and, and uh, I broke it within like a few months of buying it. It was fucked. When I say broken, I mean like it was very smashed up. I think someone stepped on it. Uh, but she got me. No, wait, that isn't true. Okay, I've I've become I've become mixed up in my head. No, I have gone through three, not four. That previous one was an HTC different phone that was older. Got confused. One of them broke. That one broke in a mosh pit of some kind. Think. No, wait. Okay, now I'm confused as to what's happened. One of them broke at a festival. I went to a festival and the tent flooded with water and my phone was in the tent and it flooded with water. So I got a new one. But then that new one broke, which I think is the one that broke in a mosh pit. But I'd kept the old one and the one that had gotten flooded with water, right? It was broken. I did what you're supposed to do. I put it in in rice. It didn't fix, but I kept it around because I was like, fuck it. It was just in a drawer somewhere. And then my next one, which I just bought the same model because I figured the case was really good. I, right? It does. It doesn't smash the screen when you throw it across the room. And there's nothing else wrong with it. So I'd kept the old one. Um. Oh, or I bought another model of the same Nexus 5X, right? So that the festival was in 2016. So yeah, this all makes sense to me now. Okay, the festival that I went to, which was Download Festival 2016. Uh, and there, so, so I got a new one. And after four years of that one or something, it broke in some way that I forget. I forget which way it broke. But what I discovered is that the one that I had kept in my drawer that had gotten wet at the festival had started working again at some point. It must have just dried out eventually and started working. So I didn't actually have to buy... And like, it feels like I've gone through through an extra one, but it, I haven't actually gone through it because that was just the old one that broke and then fixed itself after sitting in a drawer and drying out. Okay, so though, yeah. And then about a year ago, I decided, I got this like feeling that, okay, so at this point, this is a phone from 2015, right? And this is in 2022. I, the, the phone, by now the phone is very fucking slow and runs out of battery really, really quickly and it's just bad. So I was like, gotta buy a new phone for some reason. I forget why. There was some specific reason other than it was just generally slow. There was some, some indication that it was like getting close to breaking. I think it was, uh, oh yeah, it wasn't charging properly anymore. That was it. Uh, and so I was like, I've got to buy a new phone. But instead of buying a new phone, I was like, well... The Nexus 5X has never, never failed me before. I'll just see if I can find one of those. And I did, and it was ridiculously cheap. It was £39. When I first bought it, it was like £300 or more. 350 or £400. And then when I bought the one that I currently have, it was only £39. Um, <clears throat> which is the one I'm currently using. The problem is that... Once I updated it with all the, all the latest software, which I did because of security reasons, but I'm not sure if that was a good, you know, you're supposed to always keep your shit upgraded so that, uh, because they, they have like patches, security patches, which are very important. Uh, that's what I've always heard. But there was a very distinct difference from day one using the phone versus after I'd installed all the security patches and then a couple days later the phone started to slow the fuck down intensely and by now about a year after buying it which I know cringe right I feel I don't feel good about this the phone is excruciatingly slow it doesn't show any signs that I mean okay I say that the screen is a bit fucked there's some damage on the screen to the the LCD of some kind there's like it's not it's not the glass that's cracked it's under the layer underneath has like a a whole patch of just black pixels basically it looks kind of cool but it gets in the way when i'm trying to read manga um anyway i've decided i'm i'm fed up with this right it it just makes me like the phone is so slow it makes me fucking mad. It just makes me upset. It made it like I don't like using phones in the first place, and I'm just making my life worse for no reason. Cause I have the money to afford a new phone. I've just been putting it off because I hate phones. I hate smartphones as a concept. They're a bad form factor for a device. Uh, like I, I don't like smartphones. So I, I've always thought like I don't want to put any thought, money or effort into buying a smartphone because I don't like them as a concept. And because of this, my life has just been worse because to live in the world in current year 
you kind of have to do a lot of stuff on your phone. Like you, you just have to use your phone sometimes. Um, like to tell you how slow this is, right? I, um, I go for a piss and I go to the toilet and I go to like watch a YouTube video while I'm pissing. And by the time the YouTube video, by the time the YouTube app loads and I pick the video to watch and the video loads and the ad finishes playing, I'm done pissing. Like, bro, I just, I, I, that's, that's fucked, right? Surely it's not serving, serving, it's not fit for purpose anymore. And the, uh, the patch of, of, of black broken pixels is, is spreading. Like it started off as a tiny little thing that kind of looked like a capital T letter in the bottom left corner or sort of towards the bottom left corner. Um, which was distracting in itself, and ever since then it's just been growing and growing and slowly spreading across across the screen. It's still, I would say, about I would say it's about maybe one and a half centimeters in the the vertical direction, and maybe one centimeter in the horizontal direction. Um, which is yeah, it's annoying when I'm trying to read manga, which is one of the main things I do on my phone. Uh, and so you know, I decided finally today, I I I had to to do something with my bank, which required using the app on my phone. And it was so r ridiculously slow to load everything to the point where I almost like ran out of the the time slot. You, like it gives you like a time thing, like your thing will reset in so many, and it, it was so ridiculously slow that I just decided like, fuck it, this is the final straw. I need to get a modern phone because I hate smartphones. The least I can do to myself, like my approach is the, is the wrong approach. If I hate the thing, I should try and make it have as little impact on my life as possible. It should fade into the background of my life. I shouldn't make my life worse by cheaping out and buying this phone, right? So I decided, I, this has been in the back of my mind for a while that I need to upgrade to a modern phone. Uh, but I have never found anything that looked appealing to me because none of them look appealing to me because they're fucking smartphones and I hate them as an idea. So it's, there's always been, you know, there's there's always been this idea of upgrading my phone, but I've never felt, thought I actually want to do it because none of the phones look appealing, right? And so occasionally I'll see a phone and I'll be like, that's cool, but I don't want to buy it because it looks terrible. You know what I mean? You know what I'm getting at here, right? Like, it's not like just today, I I've never thought about this before, and just today I've decided I'm going to upgrade my phone and then went on a big hunt. No, no, I've, I've had it in the back of my mind for years. This phone is really old at this point by the by the standards of smartphone life cycles. Uh, I should upgrade. It's just that I've never had the motivation, like a strong motivation. I've just had a weak motivation to do it as a sort of background process. And also... I've never found a phone that appeals to me because I've always, again, what I want is for my phone to just sort of fade into the background and, and not exist. I don't, I don't like smartphones. I don't want it to exist. Right. So today I'm like, well, let me just fucking go on YouTube because I know a few YouTube, like I'm sure Marcus Brownlee or something. I know he seems fairly trustworthy, right? Like he's probably made a list of like mid budget phones that I can buy. So I search up something like best smartphones for battery life uh, 2023 or something like that. Anyway, I ended up on this video from a guy called Mr. Who's the Boss. I don't know if you, you probably know this guy. He's pretty, pretty popular. Um, I fucking hate the aesthetic of his videos. Uh, he has the, the worst video aesthetic ever. But he does seem to know his, or he seems to be trustworthy in the tech sphere, I suppose, in that kind of tech sphere. Uh, so I go, I go, why is this not loading? Yeah, so I, I go, uh, I search for, for like the best, he has a video, which is, I believe it, it is the best smartphones of, uh, best smartphones for 2023, I think is the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah best smartphones for 2023 and I'm watching this video the reason I clicked on it is because the thumbnail I was like that looks like a neat phone one of the phones in the thumbnail has an interesting design now I've never thought a phone has an interesting design before so I'm watching this video waiting for that phone to show up and lo and behold it does show up in the mid-budget section of the video uh excuse me while i skim through it to see like so i can r refresh my memory of what he said about the phone so it turns out the phone from the thumbnail he listed as the best mid-budget phone for 2023 um 
for various reasons that are boring to me. But it's called the Nothing Phone One. And I was like, what the hell? So I went and looked into it. And honestly, I'm going to be real with you. It looks sick. I've never thought this of a smartphone in my life. All smartphones either look like a stupid slab of glass and chrome and stupid shit, or they look like a toy made of candy, or they're like a gamer phone with gamer design. Like, they all look really bad to me. There's never been a phone. Ph- I mean, even the rugged phones look bad because they just look like a generic smartphone with some like useless features that don't actually help make the phone more like durable they just indicate that it's a rugged phone there's no good looking smartphones this the nothing phone one is the first ever phone that i've thought this design is actually sick it has this like see-through back and it has these like lights all over it in a very cool path i don't know how to describe it just look it up um it actually looks sick i'm not gonna lie to you that is that is the main thing that drew me to this phone is i was like damn imagine whipping this shit out it's kind of a flex and for what you're getting in the phone like not only does it look obviously i wouldn't just buy a phone because it looked cool right otherwise i would have bought one of those stupid fucking folding phones but on top of looking better than any smartphone I've ever seen. It also has really good specs for the price, at least according to all the reviews I watched of it, which I watched a bunch. I watched like four different reviews from various channels. It has really good, like as good a specs from the price as any other competitor, but it looks way better than all of them. And like, I know this might be kind of cringe, but it's also not from an existing big brand. It's from a startup and a UK-based startup at that, which kind of feels good, I guess. I don't know why, but it kind of, like, that kind of feels neat to me. Um, and it has a bunch of, you know, it doesn't have, like, bloatware on it. Like, a lot of these phones, the the, the, the company, they take stock Android and they put a bunch of bloat. It doesn't have any of that. It's basically stock Android with a few aesthetic changes, which I think the aesthetic changes look really good. Um, and so, that is the phone I decided to buy. And uh, it will be arriving at my house in a few days. Uh, because, this is what really sold me, is um, when I went to the Nothing Phones, Nothing Company, which is a stupid name for a company, but the concept of the phone is the, it's the Nothing Phone, right? Which sounds weird, Nothing Phone, but the whole point is that the phone shouldn't exist, right? Like, if you go to their YouTube channel and you go to the About section, they have one line in the About section, which is, technology should fade into the background and feel like nothing. Now, I don't agree with that, I think that comes from a place of privilege, right? As in, um, I don't, if like, the problem with that, right, is that with my ThinkPad, if something breaks, I want to know how to fix it. I don't want it to fade into the background. I want it to be very apparent how everything works and that it's working so I know what's happening at every point. But with a smartphone, the philosophy is completely different because your smartphones are already inherently hostile to you, right? Like, I I already don't, I don't want to be thinking, I like thinking about my ThinkPad. I like thinking about how it works. I want to know how, I would like, it, it, it follows my commands, you know, it does what I tell it to do, but not always what I want it to do, but that's how computers are. You know, it's like, that's, this is like my guy, but smartphones can never be your guy. Even like PinePhone and all these things, they're shit, they're absolute dog shit. Maybe in if if they were any if if or any of those Linux phones were any good I would have bought one of those but they're not they're all trash. Um, so this is like the the next best thing. It could if if this really can just fade into the background and I just never have to think about it. It just works. That's what I want. I don't want to have to fucking think because that's the problem with my 5x is that every time something takes five minutes to load. Every time I want to do anything and it takes forever. Like open the camera. Every time it runs out of battery twice a day, you know, I'm th- I have to think about it. I don't want to think about a phone. Phones disgust me. And so if this is this company's philosophy to the point where they've named the phone after it, like this is, this, this is a, a guy after my own heart, you know, these guys are appealing to a certain niche and that niche happens to be me. Now, yeah, I don't think all technology should fade into the background and feel like nothing, but smartphones, fuck yeah, I want my smartphone to fade into the background and feel like nothing. I don't, I don't want my, I don't want to think about it because it's a goddamn phone. 
and they're 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 bad from the get go. So this is the reason why I decided to buy the Nothing Phone One. It has a really it has a re- a genuinely cool design, which is something I've never said about a smartphone. It has uh, specs that are the highest you could expect for the price, and it's from a startup that seems to share, at least in some senses, my sensibilities about what I want a smartphone to actually do, which means I have some level of faith that it might be able to do some of that stuff. Uh, And now for the drawbacks. There are a couple of them. The first one is my lovely unicorn beetle case, which means I can throw my phone against the wall, is gonna no longer exist. I have to learn to be a little more careful with my phone. I can't be dropping it and shit like that. Uh, I did buy a case and a screen protector for the phone. Uh, I'm not stupid. I, I, when I bought the phone, I bought it with the case and the screen protector, which were both overpriced as fuck. But it's more. That's very. That's not an option for me. I'm clumsy. That's a. That's a necessity. Um. Uh, but it's not going to be as rugged as my current phone, and I accept that. Uh. And the second major downside is no headphone jack. Uh. This isn't such a big deal because. Um, I am a hikikomori, I don't go outside, uh, so, which is the main time when I would want to plug headphones into my phone. Um, this is definitely a downside though, I don't want to minimize this, like, if, if the Nothing Phone 1 had a headphone jack, it would be literally the perfect phone, I think. Well, maybe not. If it had a headphone jack, and also, like, ran an open source operating system, then it would be the perfect phone, but it doesn't. Uh, well, Android's kind of open source, but you know what I mean, right? If it ran a free operating system and had like, if it, if it was the Pine phone, but but looks like this and with these specs, but okay, we can imagine I, I, I dream phones in some other point. The the best phone is a is a laptop, <clears throat> but I digress. Um, the the lack of headphone jack is definitely a thing that is annoying. Uh, however. Uh, on another note, another thing that has been in the back of my mind for the past month or so is that I want to buy a pair of um, noise cancelling over ear headphones with a closed back because currently I only the only pair of headphones I own are the Sennheiser uh, HD five seven nines, which are a great pair of headphones and I uh, recommend them. Uh, they're actually really good headphones. They're very comfortable. They have great sound quality. They're excellent. However, they are open back, which means what it sounds like. The backs on the ear cups are open, which is really good for making music and listening to music and so on, because it creates a wider stereo field, which is good for various reasons. But it is really bad for being outside because they let a lot of noise in, which means if I do take this, my current phone and these headphones on the tube, which I've done a few times, and try and listen to a podcast or some music, I literally can't hear the music over the sound of the train a lot of the time. Not a problem on the, uh, the some of the newer overground trains, not a problem on the Elizabeth line, which is a wonder of engineering. It's so quiet. I love the Elizabeth line. Not a problem on Thameslink, but on some of the other tube lines, which are not as quiet, like the Victoria line or, or the Central line or the Bakerloo line, those, it gets very loud and I just can't hear what the fuck is going on in my podcasts uh, or music, and it's also very overstimulated. The main reason I wanted to buy it, I should have probably mentioned this up front, the main motivation behind buying a pair of noise-cancelling headphones is that my agoraphobia has become worse recently, and one of the things that contributes a lot to that is overwhelming or sensory overload. Uh, and I figured if I can go outside wearing a pair of sunglasses and noise cancelling headphones, that would help me a lot. Uh, and so I've been thinking about that. And most of the noise cancelling headphones you can find are Bluetooth. So, and also Dotesmite has a pair of, like, this is not that insane. Like, Dotesmite has some wired headphones that they use for gaming and computer stuff at home and then they also have a pair of wireless headphones that they use to go outside that it's just more convenient that way i did say in a video that i would never use wireless anything but i'm stunned to think that they might have a point here uh if i do want to be going outside trying to get some exercise i will consider purchasing a pair of wireless headphones if it seems to be be a something that I need. I will try the phone out for a while first, and if it seems like, I mean, obviously being at home 
most of the time it's fine to just play stuff off the speakers it doesn't matter but if i if some something comes up that if if something in my lifestyle means that i'm going outside and i'm some and i feel when i'm outside that like damn i wish i had headphones if, and that keep, becomes a recurring problem then i will consider investing in a pair so the lack of headphone jack what i'm saying is it is annoying that i can't plug my headphones in my existing headphones in but it's also even if i could it would not be a very good experience anyway you know i saw someone say that uh western culture western media has just is ridiculously oversaturated with dystopias and this is so true everything's just all sci-fi or futuristic fiction is all so dystopian like um i saw it in the context that this author said that he uh, he like he thinks the last popular utopian vision of the future in a popular western sci-fi thing was bill and ted's excellent adventure uh which is pretty funny and also kind of true. Except that's not true because Star Trek The Next Generation came out later than that. But I guess he was maybe just looking at film. But that's, you know, I agree with this. You might think it's weird because I'm someone who, at least at one point in my life, I was very into cyberpunk as an idea. But I even made a video once, I think, where I talked about how cyberpunk wasn't actually dystopian. Um, although it is. Like, the OG ones are. But a lot of modern cyberpunk isn't. Um, I don't know what I was talking about, and that's kind of dumb. But nonetheless, I think this is true, right? I think it's a problem that we only have dystopian visions of the future. And honestly, I'm gonna be real with you. Don't come at me with none of this solar punk shit, okay? Solar punk ain't it. Solar punk ain't it. Look, I like Miyazaki films as much as the next guy, but solar punk ain't it. I don't. I don't want to live in a dome, in the solar punk dome. It, oh, everyone's just like nihilistic and pessimistic and whatever. No, fuck you. This is why I like anime, sci-fi anime. You know, like specifically Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere. It's so disconnected. You can't call Horizon either utopian or dystopian. It's just a world. That's what I think is the best, you know? It's a world and it's, I mean, of course, it is literally post-apocalyptic. Well, actually, not quite. Well, yeah, I guess so. It is It is literally post-apocalyptic, but it's, and there are wars, uh, but most people live are living fine or even well. Even in Musashi, which is this sort of, oppressed nation they like you, you don't see everything run down and people starving in the streets everything run by sort of corporate hegemony or something like that like sure there are um there's a lot of war but also most people's lives aren't that negatively affected because technology has meant that war doesn't have to be fought by every person right that you can have you know what i mean right but even there it i don't know it's just its own thing and that's i think the best and then you've got something like like star trek tng said that weirdly star trek where modern trek is fucking despicable i'm not even gonna mention picard or discovery but T in tng you know there are a bunch of corrupt Star Trek, I mean, sorry, a, a bunch of corrupt Federation admirals and higher-ups, like, these people do exist, and there is tension and, and, and military, there's military and political tension, right, it's not like everyone lives happy, everyone's cool, there are attempted war crimes, there are actual war crimes, there are Starfleet, is shown repeatedly to be very corruptible but it also leaves you with a message of hope that you know at the end of the day it, it's a very it's a much it's a very good utopia it's a it's a it's what i want from a utopia which is not everything is perfect right but rather we as people are good enough that we'll never truly overcome all of our flaws but we're we are good enough that we can deal with them uh, uh, right like the, our flaws won't define us or destroy us uh and here's an image here's like a of a, a a a vision of what a community that acts like that would look like and then that's why the show is so amazing like here are a bunch of guys they've got their own problem they're flawed people they live in a flawed world but they also live in a highly technological, technologically advanced world where a lot of everyday problems have been solved with technology, but we're still human. There's still war. There's still corruption. There's still problems with technology even, and so on, and interpersonal problems. But here are just good people. These guys are the, are the top, you know, they're, they're, 
they're the, the the best of the best and they're very professional they get along they're good friends to each other they get through their problems they work together and they in doing so you want to become more like them and in a sense it's kind of depressing because uh you know i saw someone say st- uh, watching star trek as a kid gave me unrealistic expectations of professionalism in the workplace it's like yeah that's what fucking i've talked about this for, that, that if i was a ceo of a company i would force all of my employees to watch star trek the next generation i would say pay attention to this show this is the sort of attitude that I expect you to have at work. That, but yeah, something to aim towards, you know? I think Star Trek's a good thing to aim towards. If I could give you a recommendation on how to improve your life, um, it would be turn off push notifications. Turn off as many notifications as you can possibly turn off. You know, you go on these websites and they give you a notification saying, here, you're, you should go look at this, you should go look at that. Someone liked your post, go look at that. Someone responded to you go look at that someone posted a new thing go look at it right they and i'm like sitting here and i'm like hold on a minute when did you hire me to do this when did this become my job right like what what are you are you suddenly bossing me around telling me what to do this is like when when did i when did i get hired to i don't remember an interview process i don't remember signing a contract and getting paid a wage to work this job where you tell me what to do with your your notifications and your algorithms hey here's the next post look at this go interact with this post when i see youtubers go subscribe go like the video subscribe comment down below i'm like hold on a goddamn minute when did i sign up with your company like what what are you paying me to do this what do i get out of it like what hold, not even just that but like what, when was this arrangement formalized you know the, you're, you're not my boss you're not my dad you're not any form of authority over me to tell me what behaviors i should or shouldn't be engaging in that only benefit you Hey, look, I'm not saying that there's never a situation where something like that's appropriate. Like if I, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you follow someone who's a creator of some kind, artist or whatever, and they're like, hey, I just made this new thing. If you like my stuff, go, you know, you might like this new thing that I like, that I made. That's, you know, in that situation, it feels more like I signed some sort of contract. Like I clicked the subscribe button to this person or whatever. I indicated in some way, I clicked the follow button I became friends with them or something. I I followed them on RSS. In some sense, I signed a contract which tells me, which, which indicates like we are now in some sort of agreement where I will do stuff for you because I like doing that stuff. But with notifications on these platforms, then, then there's none of that. There's no personal aspect. They're just telling you what to do. And they're giving you this constant sense of anxiety about it as well. But like somehow when you have this, when you have this like little red dot that shows up on your notification bell, it gives you anxiety. The more little numbers that show up to the little symbol, right? You, like, oh, you have 12 missed messages. It's like, oh, but I have anxiety. I have to go check this so that the number goes away. You think they don't know this when they design their websites? They know that you're gonna, when they design the apps, when they design the platforms, they know that that gives you some form of anxiety, that it feels like a tough task undone right there but holding a minute like when did i sign up to do that task when did i decide that that i wanted to be in some sort of resource management game uh cookie clicker game with you like if i wanted to do that i would go play cookie clicker so you know you don't there's go through all of your push notification settings and just only keep you know in the sort of con mari method only keep the ones that spark joy like for example let's say your favorite, like I have push notifications, the only YouTube channels I have notifications on for are uh, a couple of guys that, that only post like very infrequently, like uh, uh, Nick Robinson, I have notifications on for, he's like, I think I have like three or four channels max out of like 700. <laughs> yeah, I'm an, I'm a fucking YouTube addict, okay, sue me. Uh, I ha- Yeah, the, like I have think three channels that I have notifications on for. One of them is, I think, it. yeah, one of them is Nick Robinson, right? And he only posts very infrequently, right? There's often months in between videos. And so when I see that notification, I, it sparks joy in me. I, I go like, oh, yeah, new video, hell yeah. But on most of these um, apps, like I remember back when I had Twitter, I would open Twitter and it would be like, it would be forcing me. The first thing I had to do when I opened Twitter was 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 click on the bell to make the red the red thing go away click on the little notification thing and it was all just bullshit like this person liked your post this person I'm like, I don't fucking care like this doesn't make me happy this isn't people I care like none of this matters to me but I had to do it 
because they know that that little notification indicator is slightly annoying. Or on your phone, you're on your phone and it's like, oh, bing, new notification, and it just sits there. It just sits up there, smiling at you, saying, you gotta swipe me away, you gotta swipe me away, you gotta mark me as red. There's so many different situations, like like, like even with messaging apps. Like I don't, I don't, you know, sometimes there's situations where I want notifications on for a chat, if I'm actively engaging with someone, but most of the time, you know, I don't want this expectation that you have to respond now, right? I mean, not necess- I don't necessarily want that. Sometimes I do, and it's a two-way thing, but I don't necessarily want that. You know, in Discord, I have every single channel muted. Every server I'm in is muted. Same on Element or on Matrix. All of them are muted. I only get DM and app notifications <clears throat> for every, every chat thing that I use. And even then, I have certain DMs uh, muted because I just want to see them when I check them. If I'm, if I'm curious. Like, have as few notifications in your life as possible. Only keep the ones that, that spark joy in you when you see them. Like, like uh... I think I have Patricia Taxon's notifications turned on as well. One of my favorite YouTubers, right? It's like also posts very infrequently. So when I see that notification, I go park. Um, I, I'm not perfect at this, right? I still have, I mean, these websites, make, they make it very inconvenient to turn this stuff off. And it's very annoying and time consuming. But I do recommend doing this. I think it will improve your life. Uh, you know, do, do a little, le- you know, because platforms are platforms, right? Like at the end of the day, it's a it's a little bit of a different. It's this whole um, unique mode of social organization. It's not super unique. It's but it more so resembles feudalism than it does capitalism. Uh, Yanis Varoufakis moment, right? Um, in that you don't get paid to work the land for these people. But even as a peasant, on you know what toiling under the bar on the barren the, 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 the barren of the manor um, land, right? The land that's that's owned by them that you're tied to, you still get to keep maybe eighty percent of the, the, the grains you're growing. Uh, right? You still get to keep a, a large proportion and pay a tithe to the landlord. Um, and in the same sense on these platforms you uh, you know you 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 don't get paid you or whatever for, for toiling the land, the digital land on, on platforms like YouTube which, you know, is what I, what I'm doing right now by making this video and also what you're doing right now by watching this video. We're both doing the same thing. We're both we're both working the land for, for Google because they own the land and we're tied to the land, just like feudal. And then they occasionally make us do work for them. You know, we do the most of the work we do on the land is for us, right? You, you watch the content that you want to watch. But occasionally they're going to ask you for their tithe. And their tithe generally comes in the form of algorithmic recommendations. It comes in the form of ads and it comes in the form of notifications and all of these sorts of things. And it comes in the form of data collection in a in large part as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it comes in the form of community guidelines restrictions and in large, a, a, a lot of it comes in the form of copyright restrictions, censorship. Um, so there are these, all these little ways where, uh, you know, they, they are constantly taking a tithe from you for, for, in, you know, a sort of almost an exchange for, for owning the, the, the platform, right? And so, uh, fortunately, these guys are, in some senses, a little bit like benevolent landlords, right? They're a little bit like, ben- they're, they're not benevolent, but they, for, for whatever reason, they sometimes will let you do stuff and push back a little bit. Uh, it's not necessarily pushing back, it's more because, so, th- th- like, turning notification settings off, they make it hard, but they let you do it. They do let you control that, because... Um, just like peasants were given certain rights in order to prevent an uprising, uh, they do the same thing to us, right? So they give us certain rights. They might make it a little difficult, but they give us certain rights just enough to keep us happy enough that we don't leave the platform. And also they do the sort of frog in a boiling pot stuff when they want to change something. They do it very, very slowly over time uh, so that there's no like big site change that suddenly pushes everyone away. Instead, there's a lot of smaller annoying site changes, um, occasionally a, a bigger one, but all of them culminate in what they actually want to do collectively, uh, rather than just, you know what I'm saying here, right? Uh, they use these sorts of strategies to prevent the modern equivalent of a peasant uprising, which is jumping ship to a different platform, uh, right? Because that's what would have happened in previous times, right? It's not like once the peasants uprose against the, the, the aristocracy, they just lived in an anarchist utopia, 
no, another aristocrat came or uh, something like that, right? Or, or the existing aristocrat changed their policy. Things like this happened, right? It's the same sort of situation where you can't actually escape techno-feudalism, uh, but that doesn't mean that people don't have some sort of leverage, just like people under feudalism had some sort of leverage, um, and just like people under capitalism have some sort of leverage. Uh, uh, but there are situations, so so those are, that's the sort of natural leverage uh, that the, the landlord allows purposefully in order to prevent an uprising. But then there are the unnatural leverages that are caused by uh, just just uh, structure. Um, in this case, the st- structure of uh, the the pro- internet protocols, um, and in the past, the structure of agriculture and the human body, and so on. Um, so, th- an example of that would be going uh, watching YouTube videos on Invidious, for example. So, in that sense, you are uh, negating much more of the tithe than your landlord uh, wants you to. Now, at the moment, this is a small problem, uh, but uh, as you can see with the fact that they shut down the original Invidious, you know, Google doesn't like this. They're not in fa- They're not allowing it. They're just not fighting it super hard because right now it's not a massive annoyance to them. One day, it, and also because, you know, Invidious is very resilient as a decentralized system or as a distributed system. Distributed systems are generally more resilient than centralized systems, which is their their main advantage, really. Um, so it's very difficult for, you know, Google can take down the original NVIDIA instance, but they can't take necessarily, they can't take down the source code. They can't take down every instance. New ones will pop up, right? They, they, uh, <clears throat> uh, will they eventually change their, their way their site serves video in order to prevent these sorts of scrapers from being possible? I think it's likely, but for now, it, they work, and we should be happy about that, I think. Uh, I don't know what they'll do. It depends if it becomes a problem for them. I don't know if it ever will. Nonetheless, this is the sort of unnatural, or the, the sort of uh, unwanted um, tithe dodging, uh, and you can do both. But there is also uh, an element by which uh, you should remember that most rebellions throughout history have ended in failure, often catastrophic failure. You know, people look at uh, the, the communist revolutions of the 20th century and talk about how they all ended in failure, and then communists like to, you know, talk about how actually it's all CIA propaganda, and a lot of them want as big of failures as we're led to believe, or something like that, right? There's a, there's a lot of talk like this, but all of this forgets that prior to those revolutions in the 20th century, there was a liberal revolution, right? I mean, that arguably served as the source of inspiration for the the communist revolution, and so they say that's what they're comparing it to. They don't they don't forget that is what I mean, right? They they. They say, look at the liberal revolution and its success and compare it to communist revolutions which ended in failure. Um, what they're forgetting, the communists that is, is that, uh, or everyone, it's not just the communists, what everyone's forgetting, maybe, is that prior to the liberal revolution, there were literally hundreds of years of attempted revolution uh, and all of them didn't result in liberalism. Uh, there were peasant uprisings in from the small scale to the incredibly large scale, which didn't result in the end of feudalism all across the world for hundreds of years. You know, it's not surprising that the first communist revolutions didn't pan out very well, because the first, most revolutions don't pan out very well. The vast, vast majority of revolutions don't pan out very well. Uh, And that means they don't, and when I say that, what I mean, they might, they might, in the short term, not go great for the aristocracy, the aristocracy might get assassinated or something. But the concept of aristocrats comes out okay on the other end. The the structure of of the system stays in place. And in the end, it's the peasants who suffer. You know, we've seen this in a lot of modern revolutions in, in the Middle East and stuff, right? Where there's been some sort of revolution that's overthrown the government and replaced it with what has turned out to be a worse government. Um, and people aren't happy about that. That is just the nature of revolutions or any sort of uprising. Uh, and so you should be cautious of that when you're pushing back against the techno-feudalist lords and barons that, uh, you know, it's not... I, I'm. You, there definitely would be people who would argue that regardless, it's a noble quest to, to push back against this and to... to uh, have an uprising of some kind, but you know, is that actually what you, you should question? Whether that's what you want, whether it's actually improving your life. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think using Nvidia, turning off notifications, getting rid of social media wherever possible that isn't sparking joy, like Instagram or 
you know, I, I keep, for, I never mention Instagram because I literally forgot it exists. I haven't thought about Instagram for like, I had an Instagram account back in 2015, a cardistry Instagram account. Um, and, uh, and then I deleted it the same year of, uh, after about four or five months of using it and then never had an Instagram account again. To me, the idea of people using Instagram is as outdated as the idea of people using Facebook. Like, I don't I don't think about it as a part of my idea of the sorts of platforms that people are on. But it turned, you know, I forget that that's not actually how it is, that people may have deleted Facebook, but they, the, the majority of Normans are still on Insta, uh, which is very strange to me. Uh, but that was a bit of a digression. So, you know, is Instagram making you happy? Is uh, Twitter making you happy? Is YouTube making you happy? Like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of questions that, or it's very questionable how much these platforms are uh, actually improving your life. And uh, when there's an option, you know, between platforms, which, uh, well, that's not necessarily relevant, but uh, yeah. So the first thing is to leave as much as, to exit, take as many, take advantage of as many paths of exit as you can lines of flight as you might call them and then with whatever remains due to addiction or societal necessity pseudo mandatory stuff like owning a smartphone or using youtube using you know i mean i'm not saying it's necessary but you know these sorts of things right that whatever you can't get rid of you can at the very least try and dodge your tithe as much as possible um <clears throat> only up to the point in in my opinion you know maybe you might have different sets of values than me but i don't think it's valuable to go beyond the point where it's harming i think that um there's a level of digital asceticism which uh just just serves to alienate you from the world uh, in a bad way you know you 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 want to be i i don't know maybe you don't i do what i'm saying is think for yourself right <laughs> i'm i'm saying i feel most comfortable in this state of um in my particular form of alienation but you might feel comfortable in a slightly different form of alienation nonetheless i don't think push notifications are helping anybody so guys i'm curious what you think about this idea of transitioning my patreon to be more focused on video stuff like i don't I don't, I'm already, like, the thing is, right, I just can't, I already talked about this, but just to go over it again, I am not in a place anymore where I'm making enough music to fulfill the Patreon stuff, and I just feel like I'm scamazing people, uh, which is obviously not good, so, you know, like, I don't know if any, like, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, there would be no slowdown of any sort of videos that i'm already making you know uh just that you could is that a good idea i don't know like maybe maybe it's a good idea it's it's possible that it's a good idea and i don't know why i dropped seto kanoichi's on it's literally a good show i mean it gets kind of drama -y which I'm not a big fan of. Uh, but the drama doesn't come until later on in the show once you're already attached to the characters, which they do a good job of. So it's like, even though the drama isn't particularly good, in my opinion, I don't think it's very well executed. It doesn't make me mad, like when they do drama in the first three episodes. Uh, oh yeah, CSGO Source 2, or Counter-Strike 2, announced. Everyone knew it was gonna happen, but they act we're so used to it, things that we think are happening, never have, you know? But it actually happened. Counter-Strike 2. I will definitely be playing that game once it's released. Because it looks cool. The new smoke mechanics look super cool. That's a fucking great idea. That's such a good idea, the way they did it. Um, it it's funny that there isn't... Well, there actually is kind of a ton of extra stuff that they haven't... I think the way that they've done this is really interesting. They announced it by releasing... They didn't make a, like... Counter-Strike 2 the announcement trailer. They just made like his three videos about new features in Counter-Strike 2 without any announcement as if like we, we all already know that it's coming, which is funny because we all already do know that it's coming. And this will be old news by the time you hear this maybe, but the three time the three videos they made were one on the updated graphics, one on the updated smoke grenades and one on the updated uh, tickless uh, server side tickler system and so upgraded graphics everyone that's obviously going to happen with an update to source 2 everyone knew this the tickler system was leaked a few weeks ago everyone knew this as well valve almost certainly leaked it on purpose because they do that um and the smoke grenades thing 
uh, is a little more different. So and I'm surprised I haven't seen more people talk about this. The, the way the smoke grenades work is using volumetric smoke, and no one seems to be mentioning that that was created for Half-Life Alex. Uh, I remember watching the Half-Life Alex developer commentary, and they talk about how they had to invent a new system for in Source 2 for volumetric smoke, because uh, the previous, the Source 1 way that it does smoke is a series of 2D cards. You can kind of tell if you move around a smoke grenade in CSGO that it's like a bunch of 2D cards, and uh, that illusion just does not work in stereoscopic 3D. You can't like 2D cards, they look fine from a th one monitor, you know, screen, but they, they look fucking really obviously flat. With in Like, they don't look realistic at all in stereoscopic 3D. And they also look real. it looks really... Because in VR, you don't just move your head side to side. You can also tilt your head. And they look... Re it looks really weird to see the entire smoke sort of swivel with you as you tilt your head. And so that card-based system of for smoke had to be reworked for Half-Life Alex. That's why they invented the volumetric smoke. It was for like haze effects and smoke effects in Half-Life Alex. And so I'm, you know, although it wasn't leaked that that would be a part of, but what I'm saying is when that, I, I saw people talking about how uh, they sh should add that to CSGO, right? This, that that should be how smoke is done in, in Counter-Strike 2. And hey, that is how it was done in, in Counter-Strike 2. The first time I said that was supposed to be a T-O-O. -O. Anyway, uh, the, the, the details where it can be, like, that's such a clever idea to have the smoke be able to be parted by bullets and HE grenades. That's actually such a smart idea. Um, yeah, shouts out Valve. I, it makes, I mean, it doesn't actually make my video obsolete. Because my video is is very, literally I mentioned that they're supporting the game by updating to um, Source 2 in, in the video. So, anyway. Um, but yeah, that's cool. But then, the stuff that, that they didn't... What I'm curious about is, or what I find interesting, is that when they... So they announced it with these three trailers. Each of these trailers was demonstrating one of those mechanics. And then, they have this website. Um, it's like counter-strike.com slash CS2, I think. Is that right? Let me see if I can find it. Counter-strike.net slash CS2. And on this website they announced that they're doing like a limited and like closed beta closed alpha kind of thing i don't know but then they have more they have more information about extra mechanics uh so like they have this a, a thing where you can side by side the source 2 versions of maps and the old versions of maps which is really cool and then they talk about how items and then there's a, a section of stuff that i think should have had its own video because it's super fucking cool like the way all, all of the the effects have been revamped and they look so sick. The blood effects when you shoot someone looks better than any game I've ever seen. Like it like dynamically shoots. I I can't tell how much of it is simulated and how much of it is like pre-existing assets, which is great. And it looks really good. Like it splatters in real time and like it dynamically adjusts where the blood is coming out from and you can see it like spurt out and, and then land on the, on the surface. It's actually so sick. Uh, and then I know, you know, I noticed in the trailer that the the Molotov effect had been updated. It looks like the bomb exploding effect has been updated as well. And they added the Half Life Alex uh, water in bottles or like liquid in bottles effect to the Molly as well. But yeah, the Molly slash incendiary fire has been changed, which is something I've been wanting for ages. Because the visibility of looking through mollies really fucking sucks, and that's not what they're supposed to do. And then, you know, an entirely new UI, which um, they they don't really show that much of on the website. It's almost like they're, like, not... I don't know why, but they, they're only showing a couple of new elements, which is... Every time you get a kill, it adds there's a little like deck of cards at the bottom of your screen, and every time you get a kill, it gives you another, it gives you a card, and then when you get five, it shows an ace, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then they talk about the overhaul to the sound system, which is also really cool. But uh, yeah, if you look at the the videos, there's a few other things that uh, they didn't mention, uh, like the UI being changed. I mean, that's just cool. The UI being different is cool. But they, they mostly hide the UI. But then, something else that's cool is you can see your legs now. If you look down, you can see your legs of your character. Which makes me wonder, have they changed... So, in Half-Life Alex, they developed some 
new system for legs, right? For, for character movement. Uh, I think Three Clicks Philip did a video about this or something. But there's a, there's a system in Half-Life Alex which is for, yeah, for character movement. So there's not like skating and the animations look really smooth. Character animation, movement, animation, move, moving. Anyway, I, I, I wonder, like a few people have been asking if they were going to bring that to CSGO. The problem is that the Half-Life Alex combine movement is a little unpredictable. I think it's a little too unpredictable um, and like variable because it's, it's very much realistic and based on sort of like how someone would actually, yeah, it's not super predictable like you would want it to be in CS. So I think they might go for like a halfway between kind of thing. The other thing is I, I like this, the, the, the focus on readability and the new, uh, the new visuals of the maps. A lot of uh, flat colors kind of looks like Valorant, but that's just because, you know, unfortunately the Valorant well, it's not really the Valorant aesthetic, it's more like the TF2 aesthetic, is just the best way to design a, an FPS game, right? Bright, flat surfaces and dark player models with obvious silhouettes against those surfaces makes for the best readability. So, of course, Valorant did it, and now CS is also doing it. I mean, even in CSGO, they were designing maps that had light walls in areas that you would know you know in the playable area and then the colorful stuff and the distracting details would be above or below sort of where a player would be which is smart but it seems like they're going further in that direction of art style which i think is nice so yeah i'm excited for counter-strike 2 another thing that it's like hours later i've been looking at all of this source 2 stuff cs2 stuff it seems like a lot of people don't really understand how the smokes work even though it's it's pretty obvious but I, I don't know, Counter-Strike players are fucking stupid. It's going to take them a couple of days to figure out how it works, but it seems very obvious how it works. So the we're used to thinking of smokes as the same wherever they are, but these smokes have thickness, and when you're shooting towards the edges of the smoke, there's going to be less there, in a, in a sense, right, to shoot through it, because it sort of rounds off, right? Whereas in the middle of the smoke, there's going to be more there. So when I've been watching gameplay, it seems like you can spam bullets through the middle of the smoke as much as you like, and you can't really see through it. You might get a little peek. You you can't like really see through it. Definitely not with single shots. If you spam, you might be able to catch a, where, vaguely where a player is if you get lucky, but it's like a tiny little keyhole. Whereas if you spam the edges of the smoke, and it's this, I'm pretty sure they probably programmed this in on purpose, the edges of the smoke can be parted and seen through by bullets much more easily. Like you can, they make a bigger hole basically. Uh, I'm not sure what this means gameplay wise, but it's pretty interesting. When are they gonna make Team Fortress 3? That's my question. When are they going to make Team Fortress 3? When are they going to make... I mean, I don't know. I don't even know how you... The thing about... The thing is, TF2 should be ported to Source 2. Because that's probably why it doesn't get that many... Like, if it, if it was on Source 2, it would probably get way more updates and shit, right? Because everyone working at Valve knows the Source 2 engine. Whereas not everyone anymore knows the Source engine. It's a, a common language that everyone at Valve speaks is Source 2, so it's much easier to recruit people to work on something if it's in Source 2. Because everyone learned it for Half-Life Alex, and all the new recruits learn it and so on. Whereas Source is kind of outdated now, at least according to Valve. So if TF2 got ported, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what happened. I mean, it won't happen. Sorry, let's be clear. <laughs> that That's probably not coming anytime soon. Be very cool if it did, though, obviously. But in terms of, like, graphical enhancements and gameplay effects and stuff, there wouldn't, like, it would be even less for TF2 than for CSGO. Like, the, the CSGO, you know, the, the lighting and the smokes, which is, like, the two biggest changes, kind of, I guess, sound as well. But, like, that really is kind of a big deal. Uh, whereas in, like, that's not such a big, like, the lighting in TF2 is already as good as it can be, pretty much. Like, you're, you're very, very rarely in, an un, in a situation where readability is bad, maybe on some of the newer maps. But generally speaking, you're not in a situation where visibility is bad. And uh, there are no smoke grenades. <laughs> there aren't these sorts of particle systems that need to be updated to like a volumetric thing. So it would, uh, there wouldn't probably be gameplay changes, but I don't know. There's no point theorizing about something like that.
like that because it would never happen. But I don't know. I'm going to play CSGO for a bit maybe and see if I get the beta program. I don't think I will though. I think it only lets you in if you have been playing a lot recently. And also, I don't know. I don't know if I will actually that. I, I mean, when the full game comes out, not just the the closed limited access program, but when I will definitely play CS2 when the full thing comes out. Man, Valve is on a fucking roll recent. Like the only thing bringing them it's it's actually crazy. Like Valve has so much good publicity. They they kind of, you know, they weren't doing much for a while. They had a few flops like remember the the Steam console? I I forgot what they called it. They had the Steam the 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 Steam console. Do you remember that? And then they had the Steam controller back to back both were kind of like fails and then you know they had artifact fail like they didn't do, they weren't doing much right everyone was just like they only care about dota and then they kind of had this oh people were shitting on steam for have for like letting anyone on the store then you got like recently you've had half life alex excuse me half life alex the 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 valve index vr thing back and then the Steam Deck, which was a massive success and really good for me for games on Linux in general, like everyone loves the, that stuff that Valve's been doing with Proton and the, the Steam Deck hardware itself is amazing. Uh, and now and then you've got the the CS:GO update. Like right now, Valve has so much good publicity. There's other stuff too. Like Valve has a ton of good publicity. The only thing they have bad publicity for is TF2. Like. They just like this. If they fix that, if they if they set all of their guys on the botting problem, not that it's really a big deal because there are no bots on community servers. But um, if they really did just set a bunch of guys loose upon the botting problem and try and solve it, uh, they definitely could. They, I mean, smart guys, you know, Valve hires smart guys. Uh, I feel like that would be like that would be such good publicity for them. It would be back to back dubs. Like they've only had dubs recently. You got the fucking all of the shit that I just said. I've had a lot of brain fog today. It's not not fun. But yeah, Valve. <laughs> Valve has had so much good publicity recently. It's insane. It just makes me wonder if they're ever gonna fuck. If they're like gonna have a big fuck up soon. Like I know everyone's gonna come once the hype dies down. Everyone's gonna start complaining about Source Two. Like um, and it'll be interesting to see how they react to that because. I mean, remember when CSGO came out, it was absolute dog shit, and it just got slowly iterated upon into a final version that was better. So it's like, it, it it's definitely not going to... I mean, there's already a clip of, like, Tarek shooting someone in the head repeatedly and it not registering. So clearly the game's a little buggy, which is to be expected. Um, you know, there's some hit reg problems or whatever. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how fast they're able to iterate and fix problems that community finds. Because the, I mean, these are the sorts of things you you just this is why you do a limit. Like they're doing the right thing, having a limited access beta ish program in order to iron out bugs while still promoting the game via influencers and so on and maintaining the hype. Because for the whole three months that some people have access to the game and other people don't, all the people who don't are going to be constantly thinking. I can't wait till the game comes out and I can play it. So it's a good, it's a good, I mean, it's it's two birds with one stone. It's a very good strategy. Um, I'll just be curious to see how it goes. I will be keeping my eye on Counter-Strike news. Actually, I do want to amend what I said, which is that maybe, I, 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 I want to be a little, a, a tiny bit white-pilled here, if you'll allow me to. Um, if Valve is going through and updating stuff to see it to Source 2, it is possible that they'll update TF2. And here's a big reason why. So firstly, they announced an update to CS2. To, 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 I'm not saying the next update is going to be Source 2 port, but the next update is definitely not going to be Source 2 port. It's a, a holiday-sized update, right? But at some point in two years' time or something, I, I mean, hopefully it takes less than two years, but it would. this is a good time to do it because they've just had, they have a whole team of people who have just worked really hard. I mean, maybe they're going to want to do something else now. Maybe they're bored of that. But they have the skill set. They have now developed a good skill set of here's how we port a game over to the new engine. They clearly want to be porting games over to the new engine. And it would solve the botting problem, at least partially. Because if I remember correctly, the botting problem came about because the of a, a source code leak 
of the TF of TF two. Um, if I remember correctly, that's why the botting problem even happened in the first place, and that's why those bots can exist. It, it at the very least, it would put a temporary pause on botting if they ported it to Source two. I don't know. It seems like a uh, an easy win for Valve because it's their number one source of criticism is that they don't. Uh, it's it, literally their number one source of criticism is the how they treat TF2. So it would be like, you know, if they it's easy, good PR for them. It's literally better for their internal development because Source 2 is easy to develop for. I don't know. It could happen. It could happen. It's not as crazy as you think. Good morning, gamers. I'm kind of sick. I've been kind of sick for the last three-ish days. It's weird how you can get sick without going outside. Although I guess I did briefly go out to buy beer in that one video. Um, I think I'm getting sick because I am very... My diet is not great, although I'm slowly working on improving it. My current step to improving my diet is eating more seafood, which is a little tricky. I'm trying to seafood pill Dold Smite, but Dold Smite has a fairly limited diet. Um, but e e eating more fish is definitely healthy, right? I mean, all the places that live the longest in the world are places where they eat loads of fish. I mean, healthy aside, fish is fucking delicious, okay? It's not like I have to force myself to eat fish. I love eating fish. It's just kind of expensive, um, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, no, I, I love fish. I love seafood in general. I've never met a fish I didn't like. <laughs> so I'm eat, trying to eat more seafood because that feels like the healthy thing to do to me. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best at vegetables. I'm going to be real with you. I don't, I'm not the best at vegetables, but I bought some bananas. Banana, yeah, banana. So I'm, I'm, th that's probably helping me. Some bananas, that's definitely good. And miso soup, you know, for my breakfast today is going to be rice, fish, and miso soup. Um, be nice if I had some pickled vegetables to go along with it, but I do not. Um, yeah. Uh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I've been watching more Counter-Strike 2 stuff, and I'm kind of bored of it. It's just, I, I, it's, uh, it's still, it's still Counter-Strike. It's still kind of boring. And especially, it's lame because it's only Dust 2 right now. Um, yeah, that kind of sucks. What am I doing here? Okay, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. Okay, yeah. But uh, let me see if I have it. I, I highly doubt that I have Counter-Strike 2 because I haven't played in a while. But let me launch CS. Also, I've kind of got a little, woke up a little disappointed today because uh, my phone, I feel like, unless I misremembered, but I feel like my phone was supposed to arrive today, but it's going to arrive tomorrow instead. A little disappointing, but it's not big. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I don't plan to actually play CS today. I plan to play TF2 because it's a better game. Also, I'm worried. I'm worried about my skills. I'm worried that, that I've become... Oh, sorry about that. I'm worried that I've become absolute dog shit at CS because it's just been so long. You know what I'm saying? Because it's been, it's been a few months since I played. But normally, when it's been a few months since I played, it's like, it's a situation where, uh, yeah, I've lost my rank. Yeah, normally when it's been a few months since I played, it's been a few months since I played any video game. But this time, I've been playing a different shooter with completely different mechanic, right? I've been leaning, leading my shots a lot and stuff, right? Yeah, I do not have, <clears throat> I do not have CS2 access. Not that I expected to, but... I wanted to see if it would like show up with like a introducing Counter Strike 2, but it did not. Oh, it looks like I hit 300 hours in TF2 yesterday. That's nice. Uh, why is the audio set up not working on my computer? Okay. Oh, there we go. We're, we're live. We have audio. Uh, okay, sorry, this is not a particularly entertaining segment. You know, I'm lucky to live in London for, for a lot of reasons. I'm also unlucky to live in London for some reasons, but I, I think London is, is a great city, unironically. I'm not patriotic to the UK, but I am somewhat patriotic to London in a kind of strange way, as everyone who lives in a, a big, like, urban metropolis is, where it's like, you, you have to sort of be nihilistic about it and say that you like the griminess and the, 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 the danger of it and, and the sort of uh, financial heart of the the disgusting financial creature in the center of the city if you're saying that you like london or new york or something or, or something like that right but to like there is a lot of stuff to like about london i 
like the history of London. It's fascinating to me. I like the vibes. I like I like a lot of the people. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so you know, I'm I am somewhat of a uh, a uh, a patriot for London, and I I learned this from my dad. I can't deny it, right? Like my dad, my dad kind of drilled this into me from a young age. He would always say. I'm not English, I'm a Londoner. I'm not British, I'm a Londoner. Like he would, and to be honest, that's not an unreasonable thing to say. It is kind of its own thing. Yeah, London has always kind of been separate from the rest of the UK, depending on what you count as London. But there's, it's been a thing for a long time historically. Uh, it's both the seat of power and also kind of a city state in a in a weird way. It's not really a city state, but it it's always and it it's always had a little bit of that that difference in vibe to it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but you know, especially to me, a lot of the other cities in the UK are very interchangeable. You know, I've been to Leeds, I've been to Birmingham, I've been to Manchester, I've been to Bristol, I've been all over the UK, right? I've been to Scotland, you know, Glasgow, Edinburgh. Edinburgh kind of has its own vibe to it. Glasgow also kind of has its own vibe to it. Obviously, all of these cities are themselves unique, but they are more similar to each other in general than they are to London, I find. I don't know why, it's kind of hard to quantify, but there's something about the vibe that's just distinct in London. Um, anyway, not to go on a, a, a rant about London, I will say I voted for a tiny party uh, a couple of years ago when there was the, the, the London mayoral elections. I voted for the, uh, the Lundependence Party because uh, I thought that was funny. London Independence Patchwork Party. <laughs> anyway, um, but one of the good things about living in London is it's one of the best cities in the world for restaurants. Uh, this didn't really affect me that much until relatively recently when delivery apps became a much bigger deal and I can now, and also I have money that I can spend. Um, and so delivery is a good, it's not a good option, but th there's a lot of good shit is what I'm saying. And then add on top of that, that the area I live in, since I started living here, however many years ago now, well over a decade, um, has been becoming more and more gentrified, which I know is normally seen as a bad thing, but in this case, it means more and more nice, independent, you know, really tasty restaurant. Uh, I know everyone, everyone always complains about gentrification, but it's not a problem if you can afford it. Uh, I'm happy to live in... I mean, it's actually not the area I live in specifically. It's like the areas around the area I live in that are gentrified or becoming gentrified, I suppose. Uh, like, I don't want to give too much away about my geographical location, but uh, anyway, the gentrification is, is creeping in, which is nice. Everything's nicer when it's gentrified. I don't know. I don't, fuck you. <laughs> fuck the leftists. Oh no, they can't afford rent. Okay, sure, that's bad, actually. <laughs> but it is nice compared to, you know, certain areas that I used to go to as a kid and they were really fucking dodgy and, you know, dirty and, and full of, uh, you know, crime. And uh, there was definitely, you know, there's there's some places that are holdouts of pre-gentrification. And it's like, some of them are nice, right? But a lot of them aren't. I know some of these places where it's like, oh, it really is all like these mom and pop businesses and um, working class solidarity. But let's be honest, that's that's actually quite rare. Most of the working class people living in these areas don't like it. This is like kind of a meme uh, that like middle class lefties like to espouse is that working class people actually love crime <laughs> and they love they love these da these dangerous dodgy areas. No, it's not it's not true. Um, working class people also prefer to live in gentrified neighborhoods. They just can't afford it, which is the problem. The problem isn't the process of uh, sort of regenerating. I mean, it can be if it pushes out business. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting really fucking sidetracked right now. The, not what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to make a throwaway joke about gentrification. I, sorry. Um, anyway, more and more nice restaurants is what I'm saying. There are, a lot, there are already lots of nice restaurants in London and there are more and more popping up and delivery apps are very prevalent now. So all of them do deliver, which is really fucking great. A lot of these places make absolutely delicious food. And something also, which is really, I'm very thankful for, um, is that my whole life living in London, there has never been good Mexican food. Mexican food has been an American thing that I've heard about from all the American media. And there is some Mexican food, but it was generally not very good and very overpriced. Whereas now, for some, I don't know why, I guess people spotted that there was this gap in the market and a bunch of like, well, firstly, Taco Bell came over here which uh, at first I was really into, but then uh, like in the year or two following Taco Bell arriving in London, 
a bunch of independent Mexican places have sprung up and they're so much fucking better that there's no reason to ever go to Taco Bell. And these places are really good and it's a little overpriced still, but that's London for you. Um, but I'm so glad that I finally get to eat good Mexican food if I want to. It's fucking sick. Mexican food is amazing. I, like, I, I've, I've always missed out on this thing that I feel like a lot of Americans have access to because it's very common to eat Mexican food in America. But it's not, there wasn't that much of it growing up around here. But now there is good Mexican food and I'm happy about that. And most of it is these sort of independent restaurants, which is really nice. I, I, I like that as a vibe. Um, but the reason I actually wanted to talk about this is the other thing is, so I have like, a, you know, near enough to me that there's like, I'm able to order delivery from them. There's, there's a bunch of good Mexican places. There's a bunch of pretty good Chinese places. There's a couple of good Indian places. There's, uh, you know, a few good breakfast places, delis, and so on. It's generally a pretty vibrant scene of food buying and, e and making and eating. Um, e a lot of it is overpriced, but most of it is not that overpriced. Uh, so, for example, there's, uh, in terms of pizza near me, there is, like, uh, a Domino's and a place called Pizza Express, which I don't know if that exists outside of the UK, but there's a a chain called Pizza Express and uh, you know there's also uh, a couple of really low-scale pizza places like one which I will not mention by name but uh, I went there once and the food took 10 years to fuck it was terrible it was the worst pizza experience of my life the food was literally still dough <laughs> It wasn't cooked properly, it was cold, it wasn't cooked properly, and it took ages to deliver. And this was years ago, and I, I had such a bad experience that I will never go back to that place. But anyway, there's a few of these, like, chain brand pizza places. But then also, there's, like, three independent, really good pizza restaurants near me. And it's like, I have all these, there's, and they cost less, or at, like, at most they cost the same, as the as as the Domino's style big brand chain pizza places, and then you have these independent places that make way better pizza for the same price, and there's just no reason to ever go to the the big chain ones, right? But then you have to pay attention to this, which is sure, okay, these places, these independent pizza places, they make really fucking good pizza, like some of the best pizza you can get in my opinion, like and not just in one genre, like they 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 specialize. They're great, but you know, and a pizza is gonna cost you, let's say between nine to 12 pounds, maybe 13 pounds for a more expensive, which is pretty, I mean, not too surprising for London. And that is also cheaper than like, the lower end of that is cheaper than what you can get at Domino's or any of these way worse chain places, which just means there's no reason to ever order from them. But you know, you can get an Iceland frozen pizza for one pound. And yeah, it's not as good. It's nowhere near as good as the 12 pound independent local restaurant pizza. It's nowhere near as good as that. But it's not 12 times less good, you know. I'm not willing to spend 1,200% more money on a pizza that is maybe twice as good, maybe three times as good. It's not really that much better. Like it's, a, okay, that's not necessarily true. Like it is a lot better, but like, is it enough better to say, you know what I'm saying here? Like why, in the same way as like, you know, on the one hand you've got the independent places are both slightly cheaper by like one or two pounds and significantly better than the chain places. So there's no shot there's any reason to ever buy from the chain places unless they have some sort of sale on, some sort of deal. But the frozen pizza is one pound. I mean, do the maths here. It's just, it's just simple maths, mate. It's simple maths, mate. There's no reason to not just go with frozen. And I'm, I'm a big frozen pizza proponent. I've been eating all kinds from all price ranges of frozen pizza throughout my, throughout my lifetime. Okay, I've eaten the fancy stuff and I've eaten the not so fancy stuff. And honestly, it, it's not like, there's not that much of a range in quality. The main thing you get when you buy the cheap, the cheapest frozen pizzas is just slightly less pizza. But that's actually a good thing because it means you're not getting so many calories, which is something that's probably good, you know? It's more, I just view it as portion control. 
it's still enough to fill me up, right? It's not like the big ones, the big ass normal sized pizzas you get from the restaurants, they, they will make you really full, which is a satisfying feeling. And especially because pizza is a very Moorish kind of food. Um, and so, you know, I would expect if I'm paying a lot of money to get that much stuff, but maybe it's not, but is it good for me? No, you know, you know what I'm saying? Now, maybe those ones have more vegetables on them when I order them, but, uh, you know, that's a kind of a different thing. Pizza is not going to be healthy. No matter what you're doing, pizza is not going to be healthy. So all I'm saying is, you know, there may be these great restaurants around, but is it, is it actually, I mean, you know, you know what I'm trying to get at. Uh, now when it comes to other stuff that doesn't have a good frozen equivalent, like Mexican, it's hard to find good frozen Mexican food. I've looked around, there's just none. Um, and as for homemade Mexican, food. I've tried and I've had mild success, but I just don't have the, the ingredients that they have. Um, now when it comes to Asian food, I've stopped buying Asian food at takeout because all you can just make good, you can make, I can make Chinese or Japanese food, except for sushi and some of the, actually certain Japanese foods I can't, but let's say Chinese, let's just focus it. So there's no reason to buy Chinese takeout in my opinion, because I can make all of that food in the same amount of time it takes them to make it for way cheaper and it will taste just as good because I have all of the Chinese sauces and ingredients that I need and I have the magic ingredient MSG in my house. If you're not using MSG in your cooking, what the fuck are you doing? Wake up, wake up, buy some MSG. MSG is really good. There's a reason it's in everything. Start working MSG into your cooking. It's just delicious and it has no downside. The downside is it makes anything delicious. So you can have a bowl of plain rice and just throw MSG on it and it feels like you're eating something other than just flat carbs. But on the other hand, you can take a bowl of plain vegetables and sprinkle some MSG on it and suddenly they taste amazing. There's some stuff that I think is overrated, like MSG in a tomato-based pasta sauce is something a lot of people hype up. Honestly, if you're cooking it correctly, that sauce doesn't need any more umami. You've already got enough umami packed into the from the tomatoes. If you're using like concentrate and all of the correct cooking ingredients and cooking it for a long time and all of these sorts of things, that I don't normally find that MSG does much. I feel like it's kind of just a waste to put it in there. It doesn't really change the flavor that much. Um, but when it comes to Chinese food, you kind of got to put some MSG in it just to get the, the flavor profile that you want from it. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing is you can make Chinese food better than they'll use they have in the, the restaurants because in the restaurants, they're all going to be using these neutral vegetable oils, uh, which is most common in Chinese cooking these days, home cooking and restaurant cooking. But if you really want to get that food delicious, use lard instead, which is what they used to use back before the invention of modern vegetable oils, cooking oil, seed oils. They used lard and that shit tastes good, especially with fried noodles. Bro, if you're making fried like yakisoba or something and you fry it in lard, I'm telling you, it's it tastes so good. It's so much better than frying it in vegetable oil. All right, so I kind of went on a food rant. I just wanted to make the, make the case for frozen pizza. So I was playing TF2 um, for a few hours. I kind of got bored. I felt like uh, I was just dying the same way over and over again. So uh, I've decided to boot up CSGO and I've played a couple of wingman matches. I lost my rank in CS. You know what I got? I got DMG, wingman skill group. DMG, that's the highest rank I've ever had in CS. Somehow, I, even though I went away, I have not lost any of my skill. In fact, I am arguably better. It feels a little weird just because some of the movement is a little different, obviously, but now we have to play a competitive match and see where I get placed. I'm interested. This game is actually dog shit, but it's amazing. Okay, the game, the game part is amazing. I will talk. Okay, this is what I missed, man. I didn't realize. It's, it, I've been wondering like, what is it about CS that, that was good the whole time? Like, if I wanted to play a movement game, I could have been playing TF2 the whole time. Why did I enjoy this slow-paced tax shooter when I'm normally all about fast-paced shit? And I'll tell you what it is. I finally drawed it down. This is what CSGO has that no other game has. It's the thrill. It's literally the thrill. Being in, like, multiple... That game, that game that I just played, my, my rank, to get a rank, I was in multiple 1v3, 1v4 clutches. I didn't win all of them, but the ones that I did win, I just don't think there's any better feeling than that. And 
<clears throat> like hitting one digs and shit, you know, it's 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 actually just the thrill. There's no thrill in TF2. Like there can be. There's a couple of situations where there can be. Um, like you can get pogs. Like TF2 has more has some really good pogs, right? Like uh, like um, hitting hitting air shots is a really good pog. But like that hitting air shots feels better than hitting one digs in CS, arguably. But TF2 is so chaotic and unpredictable that there there you don't get the you don't get the the thrill like it's just because it's always happening there's always noise and shit happening there's no like super tense situations where it's like oh you're creeping around and it's like trying to judge where he's gonna be and then your part starts being faster and you're trying to keep your aim steady and and then trying to predict and like you know all this shit right and then you hit it and then boom the release you don't get that in tf2 that's what i missed like that's that is the feeling that's kept me in csgo i've realized now after leaving for a while and coming back, that is the that is the unique joy of Counter Strike. It's that moment, that thrill when you clutch or something like that. It's all it's about thrill, like the 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 fear of it. You know, when you die in TF2, it's not really a big deal. You die in TF2, you respawn in ten seconds, and then you have to run to the front line. It's more just annoying. You're never really necessarily scared because in the first place, you shouldn't be taking that level of risk either you die because you did something stupid or you don't die because you're playing relatively safely and i mean the other thing is that the high time to kill is that even when you do fuck up you can often escape or turn it around right like if someone catches you by surprise it's not that much it's it's a it's a it can i mean you're more likely to lose i talked about this a lot but Obviously, in TF2, if someone catches you by surprise, you're more likely to lose that interaction. But depending on the class, you know, depending on a lot of different things, there's a high likelihood you can either run away or you can turn turn it back on them and win. And that's also the case in CS, don't get me wrong, but it's not as much the case. Like, the, the reason that CS is thrilling is that your decisions have a high amount of weight to them. In TF2, because of the higher mobility and because of the higher time to kill, and because of the class matchups, um, your decisions don't have as much weight. Uh, like, with your moment-to-moment decisions. Like, where am I placing my crosshair when I round this corner? You know, in CS, that's the difference between life and death. In TF2, that sort of decision is not that important. You know, it's more the, the bigger decisions are a little more important, right? Like, do I push in or do I stay play passive or something like that? Whereas in CS, the momentary decisions carry so much weight. And that means that you get this adrenaline and the thrill of it because you know that you're, you, everything is a, you're betting, right? You're betting on your own, your own skill. You're saying like, you're weighing, you're weighing up how confident am I that I can hit this shot versus he's going to hit this shot. And how confident am I in my game sense that he's actually going to be where I think he's actually going to be? And he's, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't think any other game can compare to that. Man, that was a fucking good... I, I should point out, I just 40 bomb, okay? I just got... I think this is the first 40 bomb of my entire life. I just got 40 kills. I got, I got 40 kills. I got to download this match. I just got 40 kills. I carried ridiculously hard i have almost twice the number of kills as the guy below me four zero forty i 30 bombed a few times i don't think i've ever 40 bombed i think if you 40 bomb the game auto reports you for cheating i got 40 kills in a match on nuke i clutched so many times i hit one digs like i'm out of my goddamn mind there's not arguably the best game of my life <laughs> and then and then the reason i said the game's dog shit is that was my, my placement game right since I took a break. Where's the game gonna put me after that? So it doesn't know what rank I am, but I'm coming and I'm coming into this match and I'm fucking demolishing. And you know what it puts me? Silver Elite Master. Silver Elite Master for 40 kills. For 40 kills. And the other guys on my team, they weren't even that, I mean, they were also Silver Elite. It's not like I was playing against Silver Ones. I was playing with and against Silver Elites as well. SEs and SEMs. When I checked, they were all Silver Elite and Silver Elite Master. And some of them were dog shit. Like, there were two guys on my team who were absolute noobs, probably just got the game. But, I mean, come on now. There's clearly, like, this is what I'm saying. The matchmaking system is fucked. I think CSGO probably has one of the worst matchmaking systems of any mainstream game. I don't know the, about the other ones that much. But, yeah, fucking, like, in TF2, matchmaking isn't that important. Because uh, there are so many more players. Like, you could have 24v24. Your individual performance doesn't matter as much. And also... You can always kind of play the objective uh, 
and help your team out, even if you don't have the best aim or anything like that. And also, you can always play Medic or uh, Pyro or Heavy, some sort of class that doesn't doesn't require like super good flick aim and still be really helpful to your team. Um, like there's a lot of, I'm not saying those classes don't require their own level of skill, but there's a lot more you can do to help your team to win as a lower skilled player in TF2 than you can in CSGO. You're not going to top flag or you're not going to top score in TF2, but you, you're going to you know, whether or not you individually are particularly good or bad doesn't affect your chances of winning that much if you are with a good team. So skill-based matchmaking doesn't matter that much in TF2, in my opinion. In CS, is very different. Only five players on a team, so each player's individual performance really matters, and there's a whole bunch of other factors as well. But, yeah, the CSGO fucking matchmaking system is, is absolutely busted. It's busted. There's no shot. There's no universe where anyone thinks that's good. There's no universe where you go into a Silver Elite Master game and you get 40 kills and the game's like yep seems like an appropriate skill level for you what the hell like what i'm trying to say here is that you know a lot of people have talked about uh source 2 oh they got to fix the cheating problem there csgo has a cheating problem but it's not as big as you think it is 90 percent of the problem in csgo is smurfs i promise you either purposefully smurfing or they're just uh, the the matchmaking system is just really bad. You know, you go on the CSGO subreddit and you can find so many pictures of people posting games where it's like they are a team of like Gold Novas versus a team of Supremes and Global Elites. Like the, you see this sort of shit all the fucking time. The matchmaking system is busted. It's completely fucking busted and broken. It's trash. It's absolute trash. This is the biggest problem with the game. Like they, they, fixed, they fixed fucking smokes in, in Source 2. They, they, they made the game look prettier. They fixed, you know, 64 tick. They fixed a bunch of shit. I don't care about any of that if I mean, the matchmaking system is this busted. It's so annoying. I mean, it's not like I, I'm happy to stomp silvers. I'm actually, I'm absolutely happy to continue doing that for the rest of my life. But I'm not, that doesn't feel good for the rest of my team. Like they don't, the other team doesn't want to get stomped. And then, you know, you rank up and then you're in the, you're in this weird situation where there's the opposite can happen to you like happened to me a few years ago. And also I know it happened to Three Clicks Philip as well, for an example, which is that a lot of time people get stuck in a rank that's too high for them and they just lose every game and feel miserable. You know, like right now, putting me in Silver Elite Master is obviously the wrong decision for the system to make. If I'm destroying with 40 kills in this rank, you, there's, there's no shot I should be in this rank. Like that's pretty obvious, but that doesn't matter that much because it feels good to me to get 40 kills and to absolutely demolish the other team. That feels good. I'm happy, right? It, it's stupid that they put me in that rank, but I don't really care if it means I'm getting... It's funny, right? But the opposite, if I'm doing so bad every game, getting demolished and not ranking down to a, a skill level that's more appropriate, that's that's way worse. That's fucked. And then mean, in the meantime, you've got people with like thousands of hours in the game who are clearly smurfs in ranks way too low for them, whether because they deranked on purpose or whether because the, the matchmaking system is just bro that broken. You come across these guys all the time. You're in silver matches and you're literally, you're playing with people who just bought the game a week ago and then other people who have literally 4,000 hours. In the meantime, you know, I, I play a, two games of Wingman and it gives me DMG. Like, what the fuck is this system? This shit is broken. This is, <laughs> this shit is clearly broken. But anyway, best game of my life, arguably. I don't know, I should, I should post clips of that. Let me see, I got a, uh, I took a, a clip of uh, a one dig that I got, I think. Let me see, here I am, going down vents. I mean, this isn't really a clippable moment, this is just good gameplay. This is just like good fundamentals. Like that one dig, that's just how you should play with a deagle. Slowly peeking corners, pre-aiming. I think TF2 has made me better at CS, somehow. I don't know how. Maybe it's made me pay more attention to my, uh... Because I feel like I'm not taking as many risks as I was before. Oh, there was also a really funny moment where I got I got damaged early into the round, and I pressed E because I, I was, like, trying to call for medic. That was funny. Bro, the YouTube right-wing rabbit hole is so real. It's ins I, I, I I never believed it was as bad as people said. I thought people were over-exaggerating. Like, I remember it being bad back in, like, 2015, 2016, 2017, that kind of era, the... Everyone's freaking out about my SJW's error. I remember that being bad, but there was a whole big hullabaloo about it. And I figured like, oh, well, they must have fixed their shit by now, right? Because these days you hear about it on TikTok. You hear about like Andrew Tate recommendations or Red Pill recommendations on TikTok, but not so much on YouTube. Brother, YouTube Shorts 
I don't know, man. I, I, again, I don't watch YouTube shorts that often. But when I do, as, as I was just now, because I got clickbaited by a fucking video and started scrolling like a retard, like a monkey in a Skinner box, because I'm not immune to propaganda, unfortunately. I like to think of myself as being immune to propaganda, but I'm unfortunately not. I start scrolling. Bro, that shit shows me. Like, I'm literally, it's, it, it has, like, it's like they have no fucking clue what I like or like what anything means because it shows me Novara Media which is like a, a communist like not even left but like like explicitly socialist YouTube channel l- like talking to some striking nurses in London right which I don't really want to see I'm not that interested in that but like it shows me that and then like two swipes down it shows me a video which is called like Huge Piers Morgan W and then like two sw- scrolls down it shows me PragerU Shorts channel and then it shows me like one of these Giga Chad masculinity videos it's like what the f- like what is going on here I, I'm t- this stuff is crazy I don't know how any of these people are convinced that like I mean look I don't mind that that stuff's on YouTube if you but you should have to search it for it <laughs> like if you, I'm not saying it should be censored or anything but I don't I don't think I don't want to see political shit just in general part no partisan lines aside like I feel like the YouTube algorithm should figure this out I'm not clicking on it I'm not interested fuck off I don't want to see the 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 doctors strike and I don't want to see Piers Morgan I don't want to see any of it I don't I, I, I I'm not interested get out of here you know the videos I watch all it recommends me other than that this is what's crazy whenever I go on YouTube shorts which again I try and avoid it as much as possible, but but sometimes when I'm taking a shit, that's normally when I go on YouTube Shorts, if if ever, if there's no new manga chapters. I've already explained this. Um, all it shows me is is John and Hank Green, the vlog brothers. It just shows me their TikTok uploads, and it shows me this really cool channel. Actually, to be honest, I don't even know her fucking name. This is how terrible the the YouTube Shorts system is. Is that there's a really cool creator who I just have no fuck. I it never even. I don't even know what her channel is called. But she just makes videos about London history, and I guess it's figured out that I like those because I think I've watched all of her videos. Like it must have showed shown me all of her videos right now because they they're good. Like she's an actual. It seems to be like an actual historian who knows her shit, and she talks about history of the UK and London. And it's good. It's cool shit. I'm happy that I'm l- learning about that. And honestly, the Hank and John Green videos, they're not bad. I don't dislike them. It's just, like, how much fucking of the Green Brothers can can a, a guy take, you know? It's like, I want to watch some other stuff as well. But, yeah, these algorithmic recommendation things, you know, everyone talks about how they're addictive or whatever. The shit don't work. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, oh, it's crazy how well it knows me. The shit don't fucking work. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I have a question. How do all these dead YouTube channels stay around? Like, specifically, I'm thinking of this guy. Now, I don't want you to take this as an insult because there's absolutely nothing wrong with the guy himself. He's fine. A guy called Jericho used to go by II Jericho II. Dude was hopping off in the earlier days of CS, like six years ago, seven years ago absolutely popping off and yet these days you know as a streamer i'm watching his stream right now he has just under 2000 viewers but he is also playing counter strike 2 with a bunch of pros so you know that's probably inflating his views more than he normally gets but his chat is extremely slow and he's 2000 viewer and right which is not bad, but it's just mid-sized, right? And his YouTube, you know, he's he fell off hard on, on terms of views on YouTube. You know, his videos, they're getting 20k views each. They're getting like literally between 20, 20 to 35k-ish, right? Some of them pop up to like 50k, but none of them go past like, none of them hit very rare the 100k mark, you know? And this guy has 1.23 mil subs on YouTube. And he has, let's see, does Twitch show how many followers someone has? He has 1.2 mil followers on Twitch as well, which I don't know what that means, but you know, 
this guy used to be really popular and then is now no longer super popular. As for why, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Honestly, his stuff is, he just didn't keep up with the times. This is like, you, you can't just do Let's Plays anymore. You can't do gameplays like he does. You can't, no one's, or very few people watch the kind of stuff that was popular in 20, you know, it's a few years ago. It's like six years ago, seven years ago. It's, it's just the style of YouTube has changed a little bit. People's tastes have changed a little bit. You need to, you need to work a little harder is what i'm saying like the popular gaming youtubers these days they work a little harder they have they have some sort of some sort of hook right because you're competing with them as well but it's not just that it's it's more like it's not just that he didn't change to be more modern it's also that he didn't change at all like he the it's it's just the same video kind of which is fine clearly there's still you know an audience of about twenty thousand people who are interested in that which is fine you know i still think his videos are fine but my question is, how's this guy making any money? And not just some money, dude's rich. Like he did an apartment tour not so long ago. He has a giant apartment in LA with like a really fancy shit, you know? I think like part of it was like custom built, you know, custom interior design shit that he made, right? Like he's, dude's fucking stacked. How, how? How is he, there's no shot he's making enough money. Like I've been watching this stream of him playing Counter-Strike 2 for like 10 minutes so far and I haven't seen a single dono. There's no, no one's donating, no one's subscribing. I haven't seen, and barely anyone's chatting. He's not interacting with the stream at all. He's just sort of silently playing the game. I mean, it's no what you know, of course he's not popping off. You go to XUC stream or an, a, a, a popular top level streamer. Let's see, is that, XUC's probably not live right now, but let's find out. Yeah, he's not live. Let's see, who's live? Um, uh, let's go Counter-Strike. Franz J's live. Franz J's streams are weird though. I, I, I don't know, but, but okay, Franz J, right? Let's watch his stream. I have to wait for the fake ad break. Oh, here he is. Okay, like he, he's streaming. But yeah, Franz J is weird, right? Because he just streams with music and silence. <laughs> I don't know why anyone watches his streams. I've always thought this. I have no fucking clue why anyone watches Franz J live because he just streams in silence with music. Like all of his popular videos, the, the g whole gimmick is that he's just silent and he just records other people being wacky, you know? So I don't know. Anyways, Franz J was a bad example. I mean, he also has only a thousand viewers because his stream is bad right now. And his stream is generally bad. And right, let's pick a different thing because CSGO streamers are are weird. I'm gonna go in the, uh, let's see, Minecraft section. Who's streaming? Small Ant? You see, Small Ant knows how to fucking stream. He's talking constantly. He's interacting with chat. He's doing some sort of challenge. It's not just like, let me play the game in the normal way that everyone plays it all the time with no commentary, right? He's, he's, I don't know what he's doing, but he's playing Minecraft with some sort of challenge, I think. Oh, he's maybe he's doing some sort of speed run. I'm not sure what sort of speed run it is. Oh, he's doing a, he's doing some sort of speed run category I've never heard of called minimum advancements. Maybe he's trying to finish some, I don't know what that means, but he's doing a speed run challenge. He's talking to chat constantly. I don't know, man. Let's look at Tubbo. Tubbo's always popping off. Dude has 8,578 viewers. Let's see what his streams are like. I have to wait for the ad break. Annoying. Okay. He's also doing a speed run, I think. He has a timer. Well, the timer's counting down. Why is it? Is this subathon? Oh, it's a subathon. He's doing a subathon. So that's a gimmick, right? Oh, dude looks, dude looks fucked. <laughs> has he been like live for ages or something? 23? Yeah, he looks like he hasn't slept in 10 years or something. But I don't know. I don't watch Tabo. I just heard of him. And what I'm saying is, I don't understand how these people are making money. I'm not saying they're necessarily doing anything wrong or that I know how to fix their channels or anything like this, because I don't, right? Like, I, and maybe they're just accepting it. Like, maybe Jericho is like, I mean, it, clearly not though, because he, he hired an editor not that long ago, which clearly was in an effort to improve his content and his thumbnail style has changed. Uh, but like, maybe, maybe he's just sitting there thinking like, I don't, want to come up with fresh ideas all the time i just want to get paid to play video games because that's the thing right if you compare the best streamer which is northern lion right northern lion does what funhouse used to do which is that the game doesn't really matter the point is the commentary and the game can just be a jumping off point for humor although nl is even better than that because he live streams he uses the chat as his main jumping off point for humor and he's just really fucking funny Jericho's not particularly funny, but that's not too bad because most people can't be Northern Lion. Uh, but like, that's that's the way you can get away. He, he, he talks about this, right? No, NL. 
He says, if your favorite streamer is just playing Valorant, they, they're quiet quitting, right? <laughs> because if they're just silently playing Valorant, they're just like, I don't want to be a streamer anymore. I just want to get paid to play the video game that I would already be playing off stream. Like, that's what we're used to as the old fags of YouTube and live streaming, that being a YouTube gamer or a Twitch gamer is just doing, playing, getting paid to play video games. But that's not the case anymore. I think this is the fundamental thing that's changed, is that that's not the, you're no longer getting paid to play video games. You're getting paid to provide entertainment in some way by doing some sort of special thing either you're particularly fun like the video game is sort of just the excuse so if you're just you know <clears throat> does this make sense like back in the day it wasn't that long ago but you know people were more accepting of just watching a guy play a video game like you're watching anyone play a video game but nowadays the the the, the bar for what qualifies as entertainment has been raised to the point where you can't get away with just playing. I mean, some people clearly do, but the best streamers are the ones who add something extra to it, you know, where the game is just an excuse to riff or to do something or whatever, like a challenge, adds something that you can't just get everywhere else. I think the problem with Jericho or the reason his channel may, I don't know. I look, I'm not saying, okay, I don't, I don't happen to, I don't, I'm not here to tell you what the problem with Jericho is. Okay. The guy's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. I'm, my question is really just how does he make any fucking money? How is he so rich if no one watches him anymore? I don't understand. And it's not just him. Like Funhouse is still going. No one watches their videos anymore. How are they still going? They they're building back up again, right? They the, last time I checked, they had really fallen off. This was like a year ago, two years ago. They were doing really really bad, like like 11k per video, really bad, right? Now they're back up to like 40k per video, I think. Let me see. Uh, yeah, 40k, 60k, 70k, 50k. Not bad. Like it's not great, but it's like mid-sized channel type shit. I mean, these guys, they have, again, over a mil subs, so they're not converting at all. Like, this is pretty dog shit, especially considering they used to get almost, a, like, between 500k to a mil per video back before everyone left. Like, they pretty much fell off. But but how are they bringing in any money for Rooster Teeth? It doesn't make any sense. Like, they can't be making money. <laughs> they must get sponsorships for every video. But who's giving them, like, there's, they're, yeah, they're getting, I, I checked the video, they all have sponsored segments. But how? Like, who's, who's sitting here? like yeah i'm gonna hello fresh i'm hello fresh and i'm gonna spend money i could be spending my money on like all these other youtubers who have people who will actually watch their videos but instead i'm gonna sp like what's the fucking point i don't understand i don't understand how these guys are making money like youtubers act they act like when you get a sponsor you really have to drive people to, to click on that link right there's no shot that these fun like that it must be way less strict than people make it out to be you must just need to barely get like one person, two people to click on the link. And then it's like, it, okay, fine, we'll keep sponsoring you. It's crazy because the advertisers are losing money on this shit. I don't understand. There's no way. Like how, how come these guys are making, how are these guys sustaining a business? Funhouse has a whole ass office and a whole ass editing team and like, you know, a whole bunch of people on stuff. Jericho has an editor and a massive fucking house and he's rich as fuck and he's in like Twitch promotional stuff, but no one watches him. Like, I don't understand. How is this possible? And my real question is, do you have any examples of people who have fallen off like this and then revived their channels? That's what I'm curious about. Like, is it possible to do, to fall off and then to, to be revived? Because I can't think of any, but it must have happened, right? Like maybe Captain Sparkle, no, maybe Ant Venom. That's an example, right? I think Ant Venom kind of fell off and then revived his channel by switching up. His, he completely pivoted his style. So maybe Ant Venom's is the, is the best example, but I, I, I don't know. Yo, I, I just went to the YouTube homepage and I get a big banner. This is actually crazy. I would never imagine this, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Big banner, YouTube featured, card stars. Treat your eyes to the art of cardistry, where hand-eye coordination and visual flourishes create mesmerizing performances. YouTube promoting cardistry. This this would have blown my, I mean, it kind of blows my mind right now. This is pretty crazy. Today's been a crazy day. I had the best game of Counter-Strike of all time. I played some pretty good TF2 before that. Then I played a game where everyone was really nice to each other. Like there was a whole team of people talking and being friendly and talking about Source 2 and it was really fun. And man, there's been a bunch of dubs today. Not just that, there was more dubs than just that, but yeah. And then there's a link that says watch closely. You click it, it takes you to a, a, a uh, playlist and it's got all my motherfuckers on there. Well, some of them, you know. Katie Morris, 
Bro, me and Katie Morris used to talk all the time. We we used to talk on this place called the called Tiny Chat. There was a like a I don't even know what it was, like how to describe it. It was kinda like a place where you could all stream your webcam and then talk, but it was like a website. I guess it's kind of proto Discord. I don't know why, but there, for some reason everyone hung out here instead of like Skype or anything. So it's pre Discord blowing up. <laughs> and this is when I was like 14, 15 maybe. Um, yeah, and there was this 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 website called Tiny Chat. I don't know if it still exists. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, Tiny Chat. And then there was a, a room called Cards One where everyone would join in and uh, everyone would just silently, it was a really, it, like, you'd, like it, it's not normally how this website is used, I don't think, but what everyone would do is it just like silently flourish using, cause you would use the webcam to like watch, you know, it was like practicing, but in a group practice sessions basically. And then there was a, even though it had the like audio support, it was pretty rare that people actually talked in audio. Sometimes people did, but it wasn't super common. Most of the time everyone just used the text chat, even though everyone's mic would be on, they'd still just be using the text chat and like flourishing in silence, just sort of uh, like these group practice sessions, I guess. It was super fun and play music as well. And you could, you could like, there was like a bot where you could like choose a uh, music to play. And this is when I was in peak emo times and Katie Morris was also an emo. And so we'd play like Black Veil Brides and shit and everyone would get mad at us. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, because we were around the same age. I think she's a little younger than me, but uh, yeah, and we used to just talk, like, I don't know, <clears throat> fun times. Uh, yeah, many a fun night. Like, you got Katie Morris, you got E. Katarina, Daniel Madison, Murphy's Magic, Anna de, de Guzman. Look, I'm going to be real, okay? <clears throat> I like I like Anna de Guzman. Okay, she's not a bad cardist. I'm 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 not sure about the choices of video here, right? Because you got the you got some like the the first one is this what is cardistry video. I've never seen it. It's like new, like two years ago. Uh, like that's good. You should have something like that. It seems to be a well made video. You got <clears throat> Katie Morris, Rep in Scotland. Fontaine, of course, there's got to be a Fontaine, uh, biggest cardistry guy, Zach Mueller. Got to have Fontaine in there. Shout out Zach, <clears throat> super chill. Um, Ekaterina, you know, she's been, she's been, she's been doing this forever. You know, she's an OG. Shouts out to Ekaterina. Daniel Madison is ex especially an OG, real OG, not really a, a mainly a cardistry guy, mainly a, a <clears throat> sleight of hand guy, but he was like one of the first people to, to do cardistry and post videos about it on the internet, even pre YouTube. Um, and yeah, Anna de Guzman, I don't know, like, <clears throat> I mean, I guess she's well known, but yeah, Murphy's Magic. I don't know. There's like a tutorial. This guy called Brendan Patrick's. I, I I don't know what this is. Maybe they're just trying to promote YouTube Shorts, and that's the only YouTube Short they could find. Kind of kind of boring video. Kind of bad. He's just doing deck flips. <clears throat> but then Noel Heath, Anna Viv, absolute beasts, absolute beasts. Um. Then this video. I don't know what this video is. I don't know if this this, this is more and kind of a tutorial. I don't know about that. And then an ASMR cardistry video which um <clears throat> i'm low watching yeah this guy's a oh, girl she seems okay <clears throat> a little bit sketch not the cleanest i've seen not super clean but decent fundamentals for a beginner a little bit sketch <laughs> a, little, a little bit uh yeah i don't know this wouldn't be the if i'm trying to promote cardistry as like this uh you know to a new audience and never seen it I don't think I'd be using the, some of these videos like <clears throat> this, uh, this card, like there's a much better cardistry a ASMR video. Um, fuck, I'm forgetting his name now. God, it's been so long. It's been so long since I've cared about cardistry that I've forgotten this guy's name. A guy from Singapore. Um, let me see if I can find him. <clears throat> uh, see if he still exists. Uh, ja -ja -ja. I'm looking. Sorry about that, kind of loud. I'm surprised. I would have thought it'd be one of the first things to show up when I search this up. Um, let me see. <clears throat> Jasper's, that's him. Jasper's deck. Yeah, absolute classic, legend. Yo, this guy's still still going. Shouts out Jasper's. I talked to him a little bit back in the day. Not a lot. We had a couple of interactions on Facebook and shit. Um, but yeah, guy's a beast. He has his own really cool style. Um, definitely very cool has a really yeah he was a uh, he was doing these really comfy um like cardistry vlogs back in the day which i really liked very original sort of innovative way to do car i don't know i like i liked the there weren't many people doing stuff like that at the time so it was kind of stood out and it was nice but anyway jasper's deck he made a really good cardistry asmr video 
Uh, he's made a couple, but playing card ASMR, it's called. And yeah, that that's a really, I mean, he's a, <clears throat> no offense to the person who was in that, the one featured on YouTube, but uh, that person was not particularly good. Jasper's is very good, goated, one might say. Although I guess he doesn't do that much cardistry in this video. He more just sort of rubs the cards against each other. But yeah, he has a bunch of these sorts of, uh, like <laughs> one hour of uh, card shuffling sounds to study, practice, cardistry, and work to. That's pretty cool. Like, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I would have used a diff some different videos if I was introducing people to cardistry. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know about this ASMR one. I don't know about this What's up? how to close a fan using one hand. It's kind of a, I guess is if you're looking for beginning tutorials. But you're not going to, the thing is, if you don't have a newer deck, you're not going to be able to do this anyway. So it's kind of pointless. Definitely no Heath being featured is and Aviv is absolutely based. Anna de Guzman, I mean, you know. <clears throat> this so, this one has giant steps in it for some reason, so I can't hate, even though it's just fucking TJ Murphy deck clips for some reason. I don't know why this is being featured. Uh, and this, this Murphy's Magic, I think they just really tried hard to put female creators, female cardists, because like... They definitely tried to have a 50-50 split of male to female cardists, but that's just kind of hard because cardistry is kind of male dominated. <clears throat> I mean, there's a bunch of great female cardists, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of how it is. But I feel like they kind of missed out on some stuff because they were trying to make the gender split 50-50. Like, I don't know, maybe I think if you're going to make what I'm trying to say is there's a bunch of really good female cardists that they didn't pick, uh, which is kind of a shame. But yeah, I, I don't know, it's this weird mix of like tutorials and videos and vlogs. I I, I don't know. I, I would I wouldn't I would have chosen some different videos, but shouts out to shouts out to all these people, shouts out YouTube for featuring cardistry. That's kinda crazy, kinda sick, kinda dope. Uh yeah. Unexpected. Unexpected cardistry moment. Some people I mean it's not super common, but there are some people who are saying like, oh, CS2, same game. And like you're not wrong, right? Like, compared to other games that get major up, like, like, games like, uh, I don't know. There are, there are lots of games that get more significant updates than this more frequently. In terms of, like, I think these people are kind of missing the point, which is that the real best thing about Source 2 is, I mean, I've already talked, said this, like, three times in this video. Shut the fuck up, notification. Is, is it allows Valve to be, to speed up development and to continue supporting the game into the future. Like, that's the real point. And the rest of the stuff, like graphical overhauls and whatever, is just a nice added bonus. But um, anyway, that stuff aside, the response to this has been, well, yeah, I mean, Counter-Strike is the same game it's always been since 1.6, which is true. And there are differences between the different versions of Counter-Strike as well. And I've played all the different versions of Counter-Strike. <laughs> Obviously, I have the most experience in CSGO, I have the second most in Source, and the third most in 1.6. I've never played Condition Zero multiplayer, but I do have a fair few hours in the campaign for Condition Zero deleted scenes. As you might know, I used to speedrun that game very, very badly. Uh, I could never figure out why I sucked so much at that game, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but that doesn't really count. <sighs> I still think it's fun though. If you, I actually recommend playing the playing Condition Zero deleted scenes. If you if you like Counter Strike, if you if you have in the past at any point enjoyed Counter Strike, and you just want like a casual mid tier single player campaign without anything too special to it, it's fun. You'll have a good time. Honestly, you can easily waste an afternoon playing that and have a good time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one point six has the best movement system arguably in any game ever. Cold source movement. Uh. Uh, and I think you can't like it's it's very pure. You know, there's a lot of stuff that isn't that doesn't hold up very well for 1.6, especially the grenades don't hold up very well. But the 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 wall banging being as powerful it is as it is in 1.6 is like it's kind of the main unique thing I think, um, which I think is a good mechanic. It means that you're never really safe anywhere, which adds to strategy in my opinion. Uh, and uh, I don't think you can have a more pure Counter Strike experience than going go on go on 1.6 and find a 24 seven pool party server and just play that for a few hours it's like so fun it's so fun it never gets boring it never gets old there 
it's uh yeah i really like 1.6 i i, I want to put more hours into it actually because it is really fun I, I think that uh spray and spray control in 1.6 is fucking brutal like that's always been the thing i'm worst at in csgo is spray control and in 1.6 it is brutal they don't help you at all like there's the feedback on where your bullets are going in terms of the spray pattern is is not as obvious as it is in CSGO in my opinion and the spray patterns are way bigger and harder to control um so yeah that shit is fucking brutal to me but it's you know so I am definitely not that good at that game but it is very fun uh I think 1.6 is the purest Counter-Strike experience with a couple of like obvious flaws namely the grenades kind of suck a lot of the popular maps like Assault Assault is not fun to play. Uh, Assault is really popular in 1.6 for some reason, but it's it's not fun. There's a few maps, like a lot of the the popular maps. I think they're just popular because they're old. Like I, I don't I don't really think that they hold up very well. Uh, excuse me. Uh, but yeah. Um, uh, source Source is like more casual in my opinion. Um, but that's not bad. I think it's really fun. If if the most fun 1.6 experience you can have is a 24/7 pool party server. The most fun source experience you can have is a 24 7 uh, CS underscore crack house deathmatch server. That I've spent hours just playing in that map. Deathmatch, it's so fun. It's like a, I don't know, man. CS source is, CSS is so fun. It's, it's something about it just feels right to me. I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it's definitely more casual. The, everything feels kind of loose about it. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, yeah, no, I I really like that game. I mean, I like all of them. There's nothing wrong with Source. I know people complain about Source. There is abs- like it's a good game. Uh, and obviously, CS:GO is like somewhere in between the two, and way more polished than either of them. Like that's the main thing you'll notice when you go back to playing the older Counter Strike games is that like CS:GO is so polished. It's one of the most polished games of all time. Like the way you you just glide across geometry, and never get stuck on anything. The way all the maps are so polished, all the weapons are so polished everything yeah like and i think what people forget is that it wasn't always like this there was like two years after the game launched where the game where csgo sucked and i'm wondering how long it's going to take for cs2 to catch up because there's clearly i mean there's a few game breaking bugs right now uh i've seen i mean the biggest game breaking bug right now is that you can pick up weapons while you're dead and carry them into the next round, which is fucking hilarious. Uh, I don't think anyone's mad about it, it's just funny. Uh, there's been a couple of like really blatant hit reg bugs that have been demonstrated. Uh, those are more serious. Not They might not be as easy to fix as the, the picking up weapons after you died and carrying them into the next round bug. That's just funny, but the hit reg ones might be really annoying and stay around for longer. Might be tougher to tackle. Uh, there's been a couple of like sound issues that people have, but it's hard to know how much of that is just because the sound engine is new and people aren't used to it versus what is a bug. Um, there's also an interesting thing about uh, the the way that the new smokes work, which is that when you shoot through a smoke, you, a hole gets made in the smoke. That hole actually depends on your view model. The direction of the hole depends on your view model setting um which makes me think it's actually drawing a line from your gun through the smoke well i mean it has to be right it's drawing a line from your gun to the smoke instead of from the middle of your face where you shoot bullets from which i mean unless they've done some crazy shit in source 2 where you no longer shoot bullets from the middle of your face like maybe you shoot but maybe you actually shoot from your gun now which would be pretty crazy uh i don't know what that means for the game but no, that can't be right because you can still shoot when you're just like at a headshot angle. So there's no way Un- unless they have some way to like check for that. And bullets are actually coming from your gun now. But that would be weird. But but it definitely works that way for smokes. I, I don't know if this is like an intentional feature, but it definitely makes things a little strange. Um, there's a couple of other bugs. Uh, like one I saw where they were managing to set up some sort of bug where uh, the guy had an orb and it would like continuously fire but i don't think the bullets were real like it was sort of just client side showing that he was just like firing an orb like it was a machine gun like ridiculous like like every two seconds um the thing that people are kind of annoyed at right now is the movement and this is this is like there's i'm i'm not gonna like i feel like i'm not gonna like this any any messing with source movement is just cringe but it had to happen so like when you uh when you stop in place suddenly 
your view bobs up and down slightly, which people are having a hard time getting used to. That is, that does make sense from a physics standpoint, if you think about it, sort of. Like, if you look at what the character model is doing when you stop suddenly, it makes sense that your view would move a little bit more, It wouldn't, right? Because your head sort of keeps moving. I don't know how to explain it, but it makes sense. But I don't know if it's actually good for gameplay. I think it makes the character model fit more accurately but i don't know if it actually is good for gameplay they'll probably tweak that i would hope um but yeah i've heard a few people say that the the movement feels weird some people say that it's harder to b-hop um but i think those people are comparing it to 128 tick servers i think it's just different i don't i don't know if it's actually harder to b-hop or not there hasn't been any rigorous testing yet um but yeah it's it's honestly surprising how good of a state it's released in and that's mainly just because they've stuck with everything from csgo <sighs> yeah i don't know the all, all, all the Counter-Strike games are really good. I, I, I really want to put more hours into 1.6 because that game is so fun. Um, yeah, I because when I was starting to get bored of CSGO, I, I, that's when I was like playing Source for a while uh, as to like change it up because I was really invested in this idea that it was the competitiveness that had ruined the game and the competitiveness was ruining gaming. And after playing TF2 for a while and then coming back a little bit, and realizing you can just play both like that's the optimal solution right it's just you have you it csgo is kind of a in a problematic situation where it's really laser focused on being competitive to the to, like detriment of more casual fun focused play, play styles which i think is a mistake but uh whereas like take tf2 for example tf2 does have a thriving competitive community and sometimes you'll get in a match where everyone's calming and tryharding that does happen uh but like the majority of it is, is very casual um i think there's no reason you can't just play both games i was worried that i wouldn't be able to because I, you know i thought if i'm playing tf2 switching between two games is going to fuck up my muscle memory but it turns out it doesn't at least not so far it turns out it just sort of my brain is able to compartmentalize it which is something i didn't expect would happen um like i really expected to go into csgo and catch myself leading my shots but i didn't i was clicking head like normal uh what was i gonna say yeah there's no reason you can't just play both but yeah, I, I disagree with my past self. I, I don't think competitiveness is ruining gaming. I think the, the, the problem is just when you don't have another option. When all of the popular multiplayer online games are highly competitive, that's bad. I think there needs to be some games that are like that and then other games that are more casual. I mean, not that those games don't exist still. I mean, TF2 is obviously really popular still. There's loads of other games that are relatively casual, but it would be nice to see something get a little more popularity that wasn't so crazy like that, you know what I mean? My phone arrived and I have now finished setting it up, mostly. Excuse me. Um, my phone arrived and I will now reveal to you what phone it was if you weren't in the live stream. It is the Nothing Phone 1. That is right, the Nothing Phone 1. Now if, you have, if you're not a, a tech bro and you don't know what the fuck that is, then do not be concerned, neither did I until I discovered it. Um, basically, it's a cool, it's a phone with cool Tron looking lights on the back. They look really cool and uh, like a sort of see-through back design that looks, it just looks really neat in my opinion. Um, not sure what else to tell you about it. It's a, I already said everything, it's like a modern up to spec phone, you know. For the price range, uh, from a company called Nothing, which was founded by one of the founders co-founders of OnePlus who left OnePlus to start this new company and uh <clears throat> yeah did I tell you this already I don't remember did I already tell you which phone I was getting I don't remember but yeah nothing phone one arrived let me tell you my take so far it is crazy fast at least compared to my old phone it's really cool to have a phone that, that is blazing fast um <clears throat> the case definitely fucks with the design a bit. It definitely looks way worse in the case, but obviously there's no shot on taking the case off. A um, little bit concerned that the case, the cameras, it has two cameras. Never had a phone with two cameras before. Has two cameras, not gonna use them. Uh, you know, I used to take the cameras out of my phone. Used to open it up and take them out. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, a bit worried the case doesn't seem to protect the cameras that much, but got a case, got a screen protector, applied all that. 
and then was immediately struck with how much I fucking hate phone interfaces and the realization that, you know what, I was both right and wrong at the same time. You, it's, smartphones are just inherently bad. I was expecting getting a good phone to let it sort of get out of my way more, to get that it would, that it would be, I wouldn't have to constantly think about how bad smartphones are as a concept. But no, smartphones are just inherently clunky. Even though this one is blazing fucking fast, it's got a massive, really high def screen, under screen fingerprint scanner, and so on, which is at a really awkward angle. I hate that. Should I much preferred the old fingerprint scanner on my other phone that was that was on on the back of the phone, so I didn't have to move my fingers or anything. The phone's too big. That's another problem. It makes typing easy, which I guess is just a trade off. But it, it's kind of awkward in my hand. I have to move my hands around a lot. Not sure I like that. <clears throat> I'll probably get used to it though, and then my other phone will feel really small. Uh, yeah, the screen quality is really nice, very high high def, and the colors pop a lot. Um, I was surprised, you know, one of the things that seems to have advanced the most in smartphone technology since, you know, from what I've paid attention to is the cameras. They're like, there's this race to have better and better cameras. And so I assumed this phone would have a really good camera, but when using it, you know, I don't notice that much of a difference. You know, I've used, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I briefly took photography classes. Um, I've had a DSLR forever. I've done some photography in a more formal setting. Not much, but I know a little bit about it. So I assumed that like, oh, these cameras must be like comparable to a DSLR these, but it's not. Like it still looks super flat. Um, I mean, it looks like a smartphone camera. I mean, the back facing cameras, they do look great. And the stabilization is insane. My previous phone had zero stabilization. The stabilization is insane. Well, I haven't looked at this properly. Holy shit, it's like I'm holding a gimbal. This is actually so sick. Okay, the st the, that's fucking sick. The stabilization, that's really cool. How does it work? How well is this, it stabilized? Oh, but the front facing camera doesn't have shit, which is annoying because that's the camera that I would mostly be using. Oh, you can turn stabilization on and off, but not on the front camera. Huh, strange, very strange. Oh, and the back camera's a 4K. I'm setting that to 720p, no shot. Oh, only the wide angle lens? Only the wide angle lens has stabilization. And then there's this zoom thing. How do I go back to the wide angle? Yeah, there we go. Um, 0.6 times. Yeah, the stabilization is insane. Okay, that's actually cool. And the picture quality, I would say it's pretty good. The this isn't the most well-lit room. Um, oh, the dynamic range is a bit, little bit sketchy. That's not terrible. It's not great. It's much better than my old phone, but it's not amazing. But that's fine. Um, oh, the little things on the back light up. You can set a flash or the little lights on the back. Now that does look cool. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Having them all lit up like that, it does look fucking cool. I'm worried about how look, how good, how cool it looks. Cause uh, you know, it almost looks too cool. Oh, there's an HDR mode. And it should have live H cause I said, yeah, that looks like HDR. <laughs> <laughs> HDR does be looking a, a, a kind of way. Um, yeah, but the front facing camera is kind of not really that much better than my old one, frankly. Um, which is fine, because I, I like to record in low quality anyway. But I was just surprised at how you know, I expected the camera to really blow me away. And I mean, the stabilization is really cool. But in terms of camera quality, it doesn't feel, it doesn't look like a DSLR. I don't know what I was expecting, but no, it doesn't, it just doesn't, you, you can't get over the fact that it's a phone fundamentally. And then the really big thing is, man, I fucking, I hate phones. I hate phones as a concept. It's just clunky. It's, there's no other word for it than clunky. Like they're all obfuscated and clunky and like hard to navigate. Let me tell you why. The number one thing, first thing I do when I get a new phone, or at least first thing I've done right now, is I, I, I hate Android launcher. I hate all the launchers. It's not just Android. Android's better than iOS. I hate these icon-based launchers. I don't think like that. This is like a, a Zoomer slash Boomer tech illiterate way to think about computers, is that, oh, it's just an icon you click on. Like, no, when I think about launching a program, I conceive of it as a program that lives in a name. It, it's a text file somewhere because it's Linux, right? It's a text file that lives somewhere in a folder structure. And so to run that text file, I think of it as a name fundamentally, not a picture. It's a word, not a picture. But, but it seems like people think about applications as just pictures in a bucket. Like that's how Zoomers, there's a, there's a, there's a big article about how like all the Zoomer comp sci people 
don't understand how computers work. They don't understand folder structure. They don't understand that programs aren't just icons. So when I want, like, this is why I like, I like D-Menu. I like Rofi. I like those sorts of application launches. I don't, I hate having to look for an icon. I hate this. I absolutely hate it. When I start on my phone, I'm like, where the fuck is the Play Store? Where the, like, what do I even click on? It's, they're all these stupid Google icons that all look the same. They all look the same. It's such terrible design. They all look the same color scheme. It's just like vague shapes. And you just have to memorize what each one means. It's in, I don't want to memorize what each one means. Thank you, Google. So I always install this launcher which I actually highly recommend which is called TY and it's gonna you might call me hella autistic but I've been using this since what 2018 2017 maybe no probably 2018 um I've been using this since 2018 and I've never looked back TY is basically a command line interface it just turns your 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 launcher your home screen I mean look it up it just turns it into like a Linux ass looking command line interface and you just you just type it brings up a keyboard and if i want to launch fucking uh brave which i'm using i don't know if there's a better mobile browser i don't i don't know anything about mobile browsers if anyone wants to tell me give me suggestions for what's a good mobile web browser um let me know because I, I i don't know shit about this uh, so I, I just installed brave because it i just i don't really know why i searched for web browser it came up with some options and i just like le shell lion that's funny so i installed it like if i want to if i want to launch brave I can just type in B-R-A-V-E, enter, and it launches Brave. Or I can type in, you know, B-R, and it comes up with a little suggestion that said the autocomplete to Brave. Or I can set an alias, as I have, which is currently F, because that's the key I use on my, that's the, the shortcut key, the hotkey I use for launching Cute Browser on my computers. It's always super F. So I just have F, enter, and it launches Brave. Or... I also have it set up, if I want to launch YouTube, I can either type in YouTube and enter, or I can just type in YT, enter, boom. If I want to call someone, I don't have to open up an application and fucking do that. I just type call and then the name of the person. It's like, why, why is this not the default for every, isn't this so much easier? Because I just tell it what I want to do. I'm not like abstracting to this weird layer of icons and shit. I, it's just like, Oh, I want to open this application. I just say the name of the application at the computer and then the computer opens it. It's so much more more obvious as to how it should work. Like, why doesn't everything work like this? I, I, anyway, the, the TUI is cool. By default, it looks pretty ugly. So I then had to spend a while writing it. And that's what's a fucking pain. Because you can do it, but, it, but they don't, it's not, I mean, it's partly the fault of Android. It's partly the fault of phones as a medium. But it's also partly the fault of the developers making it not super easy to, to switch out config files and so on. But I went on the Reddit for TUI, found some configs that I liked, took them into my own text editor, edited them with my own settings, and then dragged that all over to the folder. And then you have to apply each file one by one from within the app. So you can't just like, I don't know if this is true, but unless I'm doing something wrong, but like the app has a, a config folder, but you don't just drag the config in there, right? You don't just change the files in there. You have to manually tell the app to update the con. I don't know, it's annoying. You have to do it one by one for each config file, of which there are way too many. Um, but yeah, uh, TUI is, makes phones usable. Um, the other thing that's really annoying about this phone, given that it's so big, and that the screen stretches all the way to the bottom, is that I'm used to having the sort of three buttons at the bottom, but the three buttons at the bottom here are way too low down for my thumb to reach comfortably. I'd have to like, it's fine if I bring over my other hand, but if I'm using it with one hand, it's way too annoying. So thankfully they've thought of this and they've added this like gesture, gesture based navigation. And honestly, it's too early to say, cause I haven't used it yet. I put some chicken wings in the oven. Uh, yeah, it's too early for me to really say if it's good or not because I've only just started using it and I'm getting used to it, but it's fairly intuitive, but I would rather just have buttons, frankly. Uh, and that's the problem really, is that on a computer, it's, it's just a matter of form factor. It's just a matter of form factor. And what I mean by that is on a computer, it is no easier or harder to click 
it will interact with a UI element, no matter where it is on the, st the screen. Not really. Maybe right in, if it's really tiny, you know, that might be annoying. But generally, it is like having having a UI element right at the bottom of the screen or right at the top or right on the sides, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, each, all of them are just as easy to access. With a phone, you know, you, you have to take into consideration that you're using this with basically one thumb and that thumb is not you know able to to easily reach the opposite top corner or the opposite bottom corner so really like the the easiest access place to 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 use in a phone is like right in the just like bottom third like where the the line would delineate the bottom third of the screen that line is sort of where your thumb naturally sits. But that's right in the middle of the fucking screen, so no one can put anything there. And so all of these interfaces just suck because the easiest place to access that's most comfortable can't be used because it would cover up most of the screen. And so instead you have, like my thumb's like hurting from just using this phone, just from setting it up, because it has to go, go down so much and be in this weird position. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about phones, man. Also, it's gonna take me a while, the power and volume buttons on the opposite sides on this phone than my other phone. So that's gonna take me a while to get used to. Um, now, all of that aside, you know, the point is phones suck, not this phone in particular sucks. I don't know if there's a type of phone that undoes any of the suck. I don't think such a thing exists, other than if you were to like connect a Bluetooth keyboard, which I used to do, by the way. If you really wanna know how autistic I am, when I used to go to school, I used to carry a Bluetooth keyboard in my laptop to use with my phone because that's how much I hate phone interfaces. And I had everything set up with Vim keys, okay? I'm not even joking. I used to carry, I still have it, a cheap Bluetooth keyboard with me wherever I went in my backpack. And if I was on the train, I'd be whipping out the fucking Bluetooth keyboard to use my phone. That's how much I goddamn hate phones and their interfaces. I don't like touchscreen interfaces. I don't like any of it. It sucks. The thing I do like, I like fingerprint scanning. That's a good mechanic. I like um, having a camera with me. Actually, that's not really that important. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't really care about the camera. The thing I actually use my phone for more than anything else in terms of like practical usage is is a timer. Whenever I cook food, I'm always timing things on my phone and maps as well when I go outside. That's always useful. Uh, yeah, is there some way? I don't know, man. The, the, the fucking phones suck. Phones suck? Even this phone sucks. There is no good phone. I should have known this, but I mean, to be fair, as I said, the phone is lightning fast, the screen is really nice, the cameras have certain quality of life stuff, the lights on the back look really cool. You know, as far as a phone goes, it's definitely better than what I had. I can, I can definitely, I will, I will say, I, I'm not saying I'm experiencing buyer's remorse right now, at least not hardcore. <laughs> it's just that this is just making me realize even more how much I hate phones. The fact that like, this is like the best that they have to offer. This is the best a phone can really be, as far as I'm, like, the difference between this and a flagship is not that much, right? It's basically better cameras, more storage, faster chip for gaming that wouldn't even affect me because who's, I'm not mobile gaming. Although, you know, that is one thing, is that if I want to get addicted to, like, Genshin Impact or some shitty anime mobile game, like a true otaku, I can now do that. Yeah, you know, I tried to play Honkai Impact 3rd on my Nexus 5X once, and it was fucking 2 FPS dog shit. I bet I could play that game. I bet I could play that game on this phone. Do I want to play that game on this phone? I don't know. At the time, I was like, I just want to grind something. That's why I installed it. Sometimes I get in the mood where I'm like, I just want to see that number go up and I want to grind something. And uh, I think next time I get that that feeling, I'm just going to play Antimatter Dimensions though. I haven't really had that feeling recently. Uh, but yeah, cool phone. Uh, but, but phones themselves just suck. Also, no headphone jack is kind of annoying. I mean, the speakers are fine. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. Phones are phones, a phone's a phone. I need to go back to my Bluetooth keyboard carrying with me days. I don't know why I'm talking like I go outside. It doesn't really matter since I don't go outside. You know what I'm surprised like doesn't exist? It seems like a really obvious feature is like, say you're watching YouTube and then you're like, oh, I need to take a shit. There should just be a button 
that just says like continue watching on phone like in a drop down menu somewhere and then it should just auto start playing from where you're at on your phone isn't that such an obvious easy quality of life feature for them to add like that's not hard they already track where you are in a video they already keep video watching like per account they know what phone you have they have a thing that is like stream it to a tv right like, why is that not a thing i don't know it's kind of strange in my opinion uh the default fucking youtube app sucks ass though i don't know what a better one is someone messaged me with one or something i forget i know they exist i'll look for one at some point oh tachiyomi forgot to install tachiyomi i i will go do that now all right i will say i i caught up on um when i returned to my hometown my childhood friend was broken which is a pretty fun romance <laughs> The manga reading experience is significantly improved by having a better screen. I have to say, it's real. So that's good. Now I will tell you a story of failure. A story of disappointment, a tale, if you will, of regret, and that is chicken wing. I, I was doing online shopping as I am often want to do and the last time, oh my god, I'm gonna die to this fucking Jurati. Okay, I got it. Holy shit, that guy must- Oh, there's a fucking sentry there. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm going on online shopping. I'm buying shit, right? And I see frozen chicken wings. Now, I've made this mistake before. I have bought these barbecue frozen chicken wings. And they're absolute dog shit. The barbecue t tastes bad. Everything tastes bad. They're very bad. But, so I think about it, and I'm like, nope, they were bad last time I bought them. I will not buy them again. That's a normal human thing to do. Then I scroll down a little more and I'm like, I should point out at the time I was doing this, I was having a craving for fried chicken. I don't eat fried chicken that often, but at the time I was doing this, I had, I had I was having a craving for fried chicken, which is why I was even considering this in the first place, which is silly. You shouldn't go shopping when you have food cravings, but you know, they say never never shop on, on, a, on an empty stomach. Never go grocery shopping on an empty stomach. I made that mistake. I've made that mistake a few times. I went grocery shopping on an empty stomach. <clears throat> and um, at the time I was, I was having a craving for fried chicken and I was like, gotta, gotta buy some wings but these barbecue wings i've bought them before in a similar situation and they're dog so uh -huh, smart i will not buy them but then i scroll down a little more and i see same brand of wings but not barbecue hot and spicy type and so i think to myself now that sounds like it could be bad better right hot and spicy i'm thinking they're gonna be some southern style you know breaded wings that are that are nice as fuck or at least decent right which is exactly what i'm what i want at that time in my life that's exactly what i would like to eat you know Let's kill this oh my god he's getting here it's chaotic i'm on ski owl 24 7 sky 24 7 dust bowl because because that's just the sort of day it is um but anyway so i buy these wings and don't really think much of it along comes just now here's the situation i'm in i'm hungry i need some food i want to be playing team fortress 2 i don't want to be cooking so i want something i can just put in the oven and not have to worry about now i have a few options like i could make a frozen pizza i could just just give up on tf2 for the while stop being a little bitch and just go make some real food you know there's a there's a couple of options here i'm gonna die uh you know i could even just have a sandwich there's options when i'm but <clears throat> there's a key factor which is that don't smite is asleep normally when i cook i cook two meals because i live with another person <clears throat> but this time don't smite is asleep it's just me now i know this happens so i i purposefully buy stuff that i know don't smite isn't gonna like for occasions like this so i i if i well it's not necessarily for occasions like this but it's like i know these occasions show up so it's like i don't have to organize all of my shopping habits around what don't smite like for example, I bought some mussels, which I like a lot. I love mussels, but Dote Smite is not a fan of mussels. Um, and Dote Smite is not a fan of these frozen chicken wings. So I think to myself, I got to use this food at some point since I bought it for whatever reason. And I'm not going to make it while Dote Smite is awake. So just make myself a portion. These w Okay, the first thing to point out is that while they said hot and spicy, if you saw wings, wings that say they're hot and spicy, what flavor profile are you expecting? You're expecting crispy outer layer with sort of southern fried vibe, spicy southern fried chicken. Damn, what the fuck just happened? I just got like five, uh, uh, that was weird. Anyway, you're expecting southern spicy hot wings, right? These wings are fucking curry flavored. What? I smell them in the oven. I'm like, is that, is that cumin? 
I don't know about that. I don't know about cumin. They they got cumin on them. They they're not even spicy. They just curry flavored. Did I buy the wrong thing? I don't think so. I can I can check. In fact, I will. Once I die, I will go double check to see if I accidentally or if they they like sent me curry wings instead of fucking the ones I asked because I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have accidentally clicked curry. Wings. They said hot and spicy. I remember. Um. So so that's the first thing, and I'm like, that's not good. But then I eat them. Firstly, they get burned, even though I cook them according to the instructions. I didn't, I, I, I didn't even, like it said, cook them for 25 to 30 minutes. I, I went 25 because I know my oven is kind of hot, so I already, it runs kind of hot, right? So I already know to, to always use the minimum one when it comes to those sorts of instructions. So I cook it for 25 minutes. Shit comes out blackened on the outside in parts, not totally blackened, but I don't think this is my fault. I think this is the coating that burned. Because when I went to eat it, like the insides weren't tough, like they've been overcooked. It's the, the coating, the curry flavored, cumin flavored coating seasoning layer that burned, which is an obvious mistake to make that, that you know, the sort of thing that a home cook would do. I've done that. I've, I've, um, you know, sometimes I go to make wings myself from scratch and I, uh, or just chicken in the oven. I put some garlic powder on it. Sometimes the garlic powder burn. You know, this is a, a, a beginner mistake. It happens though. But no, this ship, it, it was a hundred percent the the seasoning that had burnt it wasn't the actual wings themselves but it just left this encrusted layer of blackened charred seasoning which did not taste on top of the fact that these are fucking curry flavored wings that taste like shit and you know it's not just the curry flavor that makes them taste bad it's the fact that the wings are really low quality and bad obviously because they're fucking cheap ass frozen chicken wing i don't know what i'm expecting what i'm expecting is that when you go to a chicken shop and you get four wings and chips from Boss Man. Those wings are cheap as fuck, and yet they taste good as fuck. Well, sometimes, depends on the restaurant or the, the chicken job. But they can be really good. I've had really good chicken from chicken shop. Um, so it's like, I guess I just have this expectation that wings being cheap doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be bad. But of course it should. Frozen fucking wings are gonna taste bad. Especially because, as I said, I already had the barbecue version of the same brand and I knew that it was bad. So I don't know why I bought these. Like, I, I, I legitimately don't know why. Like, I had some sort of fucking schizophrenic moment and then I don't know why I decided to eat them. It was a very strange decision on my part. Um, so yeah, I don't, they don't fit. You know what I'm always talking about? The food triangle? Healthy, cheap, tasty. Something has to fit at least two of those criteria to buy it. They don't fit any of the criteria. There's no reason to buy it. They're not like super cheap, right? They, they cost what you would expect. They're not tasty at all. And they're not good for you because it's wings. Like, and now I feel like shit because it's not just that they taste bad, but, but when you eat shitty food like that, it makes you feel bad. So now I like feel like shit and I'm gonna feel like shit for hours now, or like at least an hour. I'm gonna feel bad because I ate stupid food for no reason, for no goddamn reason. I could have just made had a sandwich. <laughs> I could have just had a sandwich. I could have just done Done anything. I could have made some pasta. I could have could have could have done anything. I have so many options for food, and instead I was like, mm, fucking frozen chicken wings. What am I thinking? Pre-seasoned frozen chicken. Look, I mean, I've had. You know, you can buy just plain ass wings that you have to do everything yourself at. And it's not difficult. Like I've made wings from scratch. It's not like a super complicated meal to make oven baked chicken wings. Sure, if you're deep frying it at home, it can be a bit of a pain, but I never do that because it doesn't taste much. Honestly, there's no reason to. The oven baked wings taste, uh, you can get them crispy. So yeah, I don't, I don't fucking go fo follow a J J Kenji Lopez alt uh, recipe for crispy oven wings. If you want to know a good recipe, works a treat, very good, very tasty. So it's like, why don't I, if I really have a craving for wings why don't I just buy some wings and make them myself it's barely anymore it's like 10 minutes of extra effort just to, to fucking season them myself it doesn't even take any time so so now i'm sitting here feeling like a fucking idiot and i have no one i mean first of all who expects I mean, let's be real. Who expects spicy wings to taste like curry? That You cannot expect a customer to reasonably think that spicy wings means curry flavored. That's, I'm gonna put that out there. However, even then, I knew that this brand had a bad history. So what was I thinking? I don't know, but trust me, I will never do that again. I gotta say, 
Fuck authors, man. Fuck authors. The 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 Internet Archive just lost the battle, the legal battle, you know, for uh, that they had in order to like share books. Um, <clears throat> pretty sad. It's pretty sad. Pretty sad occasion. Uh, I've been following that for a while. Of course, it's sad. We all know about it, right? Um, and there was a bunch of, you know, there was a bunch of authors. Are these guys still? But I can't tell if we're fighting or if we're friendly on this server. I think there's some people being for. Okay, this is a stupid fucking server. Give me a different. Sorry, Team Fortress Two moment. Um. Anyway, fuck authors. There's a, you know, people. They're gonna try and blame the publishing houses, and of course, those are in large part terrible. Uh. But it's not just them. Like, the, who do you think? It's it's the whole ecosystem of authors. And notice here that I'm saying authors and not writers. There's nothing wrong with writers. In fact, writers are kind of based. Um. You know. You you. You know, you, you meet writers and they're just fucking insane, like, alcoholics or whatever. There's, like, this stereotype about writers, uh, but it's kind of true. Writers are just, like, degenerate kind of base people the sort of people that a uh, hundred years ago would have would have had tuberculosis you know the, the the based people but authors are a different a different breed you know like people that the sort of person like people who write books fuck you if you write books fuck you because i feel like the people who write books like the thing is you meet someone who's written a book and they're like yeah i wrote a book you know what i'm saying like like it's just a bragging thing there's no books are a dead for like there's no reason to write a book in in current years there's no uh how do i put it books you know like you might be sitting here and thinking to yourself but what about you know books are this this masterpiece genre of, of all of these great works and there's all of these creative amazing people writing books and that's a tiny minority i don't know why i said it like that minority the vast majority of people who write books are like the worst person you've ever met <laughs> they're like they're like yeah i wrote a book you know what I'm saying? If they, it, as if like it makes them, it makes you, it makes them better than you. Like writing a book makes them better than you. Like hiring a ghostwriter makes them better than you. you yeah, they're literally like it's so easy to write a book that there are literally ghostwriters whose job it is to just write books for other people, and they pump like they pump out so many. You know what I'm saying? Like people act like it's some difficult thing oh, i missed uh it's it you know i couldn't do it sure i don't i neither want to that's not my skill set but th there are people i mean don't smite for example if don't smite really was just forced to write a book they could do it in like two days <laughs> <laughs> they, they type extremely far. Just ha like the majority of books are terrible. I think we give we give authors too much credit. They're greedy. Like this is another thing, right? Is that people people somehow imagine that artists can do no wrong. Like if if you're doing anything that's in the arts, like you're a musician, you're an author, you're a writer, you're a painter, anything like this, right? That somehow you're beyond criticism. That's not true. Like you as a person, like people could unless you do something like. Unless your art is morally bad or you do something like JK Rowling style, you know what I'm saying? But like, people don't see, people are like, oh, you're, you're, like, the, the attitude is that um, these sorts of morally bad artists, I mean, n not that I'm trying to be moral here or whatever, but um, the attitude is that, like, one of the reasons why people hate on JK Rowling so much, I mean, aside from the shit, like, obviously there are a lot of fucking authors who have done bad shit. People specifically hate on, on, or well, there are a lot of people who do bad shit. There are, there are infinite people who are kind of famous who do bad shit. But specifically, when an artist does something bad, it's like people have this mythological idea of the artist as this pure beyond reproach. Reproach, that's the word, not reproach. <laughs> beyond reproach uh, figure. Whereas in reality, because like they... And so they see people like J.K. Rowling as as like a, 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 a mark on this this pure idea of being a, a writer or an author or an artist of some kind. It doesn't, I'm using JK Rowling as an example, but I'm sure you can think of many others, right? Where it's like there's this pure, the most pure profession of, of, of art and these people are coming in and, and, and they're setting a, they're, they're, they're besmirching it, they're, 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 they're scarring the, you know. But this isn't true. There's nothing particularly special or pure about being an artist as a job. There's nothing particularly uh, special or pure about art. And artists are generally narcissistic fools. Um, God, I'm fucking terrible at this game, holy shit. I've ended up behind the entire enemy team. And now there's just a guy trying to market garden. <laughs> I don't know what just happened there. Uh, I, just, I, was, I was just standing between two soldiers, just standing still. I don't know. That was weird. Anyway.
yeah so i think this is why people like this receive like this level of criticism or it's not just criticism it's like it feels like like some sort of um what's the word cognitive dissonance where you have this idea of like especially sort of lefty progressive types who basically have a monopoly over the arts which is not like some insidious thing it's because it's because uh you know there was there was all of these years where um conservatives were sort of making fun of the art <laughs> You're going to art school, fucking Libcuck art school, you know, this sort of thing. And then they're like, why is all the art in the world left wing bias? Yeah, well, of course it fucking is, you returns. <laughs> you did this. Uh, <clears throat> but there's, so because of like that, this idea that art is this like progressive thing to go into and that like artists are this creative genius types who are true to themselves or whatever the fuck, right? There's this, that, that means that when some artist is is a shitty does something shitty then somehow this is like worse than a normal person doing something shitty because you're you're not just just being a bad you're not just doing a bad thing you're also like implicitly putting the rest of art uh holy shit i can't believe i got that kill okay you're you're implicitly like damaging this this pure holy sacred medium of or sector of society this isn't true this is bullshit there's nothing special about art there's nothing particularly good about art um artists are on the whole kind of shitty as as a thing there's like there's nothing surprising about authors betraying uh the public uh in in this example where they they ban sharing their books because they're greedy there's this concept that artists can't be greedy artists are fucking greedy every day artists are greedy every day and they're not beyond criticism just because they make art and i say this as an artist i should have i keep forgetting the air blast is a mechanic i'm playing pyro for some reason don't ask me why I'm, i actually misclicked on the main menu and then just stuck with it I was only one down from demo or one up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we, what I'm saying is uh, we need to be shitting on art. Fuck art. Art is dead. Kill all art. <laughs> what am I fucking doing in this game? You know what, what authors, what book publishers, book writers I actually have respect for? Is, is the people who publish like shitty romance novels targeted at women. Those guys. Those guys are fucking based. Uh, I don't I don't care about fucking Dostoevsky. That that guy sucks. There's nothing good about him. I've never read his books. <laughs> I, this is why I will never read a book because authors are just inherently bad. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, no, I have respect for these motherfuckers who publish in these low low mediums because they, these guys aren't doing it out of respect. Maybe they're doing it for money, but mainly they're just doing it because they're fucking degens who want to write books about hunky men. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Same reason I have respect for light novel authors and like, um, uh, fucking Shawset's Kani Nano authors and slash fiction authors. You know, these guys, uh, they're not necessarily, I don't, you know, I think it's more fair to call them writers. How did I just get that kill? I, that's one of the fun things about Team Fortress 2 is when, uh, when you be, you be aiming at someone and then like a spy, cloaked spy or a scout just runs in front of you and you accidentally kill them. I made myself pretty sleepy because, uh, I was uh, watching a video by the channel Lazy Posey, which is the second channel of Posey, who is a really good YouTuber and really good musician as well. Really cool, neat bleep bloops. Um, I was watching this Lazy Posey video about car adverts. Um, and in this car advert that he showed on the video, there was some really cool ambient music, which is kind of what the video is about. It's kind of about the soundtrack to this car advert being really good, which it is really good. And and I was like, damn, I want to make some cool ambient music now. I like ambient music. I like making ambient music. It's very fun. And then I thought I should stream it. I don't know why. I've never tried it before. So I did. And it was kind of cool, I suppose. <laughs> but it made me very sleepy. I'm thinking about Team Fortress 2. I played Team Fortress 2 for about 9 hours today. Actually, that's not true. I played Team Fortress 2 for about 9 hours minus the length of the movie Ocean's Eleven 2001. Because I took a break 
and watch that movie at some point. Good movie. I liked it. And what, I, what was weird about that movie is that normally the whole point of a heist movie is that they do all the planning for the first half of the movie and the second half of the movie is them doing the heist and it going wrong somehow. But in Ocean's Eleven, it doesn't go wrong. It just goes exactly to plan, pretty much, which is surprising. The whole movie, I was on, on my toes waiting for the twist where something goes wrong but nothing went wrong spoiler alert this is a spoiler alert for oceans 11 but it's a good movie nonetheless ensemble cast may i add i think matt damon was miscast in his role i don't i don't know why they cast him in that role but he was like there's nothing wrong with him i just maybe, maybe it's me that's the problem maybe i'm like that's jason bourne you know also don Cheadle's terrible terrible british accent what was that that's a weird decision to put in the movie that was a that was a strange directing decision i have to say it was funny but it was definitely a like in my mind i had to rationalize it by saying like he's not actually british he's a mentally ill man who is doing a british accent for some reason because otherwise the accent was just too bad to make any sense yeah i i don't know where i was at with that 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 accent um but aside from those two things and also, I thought it was a little weird how the, the ex-wife, spoiler, big spoiler alert, if I haven't already spoiled the movie. The movie's like fucking, tw- how many years old? It's a, over, tw- you should have watched it by now. If you were. It's very old, 20 years old-ish. Um, the ex-wife character at the end of the movie, I, 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 maybe this is just because it's an older movie before feminism was invented? I don't know. But it felt strange to me. Okay, big spoiler alert. So cover your ears for a couple, I don't know, somehow don't get spoiled <laughs> if you care about that stuff. So the, the the kind of thrust of the movie, I guess, is that the main guy, the Oceans in Oceans 11, is doing this heist because when he went to prison, his wife left him and left him for this guy who owns this casino. Um, and so he's robbing the guy's casino because for some reason he thinks this will get his wife back. And then you're sitting there like, no, this guy's clearly, you know, a, some sort of flawed main character. He's not going to get his wife back by robbing this casino. He's just, you know, addicted to the thrill of heists and also sees this guy as like t- having taken his wife, even though she divorced him before she met or at least before she's, t- you know what I'm saying? She divorced him independently of the casino guy showing up. Um, And so then at the end of the movie, he uses some clever trickery to uh, basically get the guy, the casino owner guy, to, to say something really mean. He gets him to say something really mean to his to the wife character without realizing that the wife character is listening. He sets it up so that he says something really mean and the wife character hears, he doesn't realize she hears, and then he she shows up and is like, don't you know there are cameras everywhere in this casino type of thing. I've heard what you said about me and then storms away, right? So it's like, oh, not only has all of his hundred million dollars been stolen, but also the girl has left him. And then you're like, that's kind of enough of an own, right? But then she, after the whole movie, just being mad at George Clooney, for re- for good reason, being mad at George Clooney, is randomly like, oh, I actually love him again. And then at the end, in like the, 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 the epilogue, is like dating him again, slash, I don't know, undivorced, remarried to him, or whatever. They're going out again. They're a couple again. And I'm like, hold on a goddamn minute. I understand how what he did would have made her want to break up with the casino guy, but he didn't do anything to, like, address any of the problems in their relationship that would make her want to get back with him. You know what I'm saying? Like, there was no... Like, I understand the, oh, it turns out the guy I've been dating is an asshole and you've shown it to me. Okay, that makes sense. But then they're like, so now I'm going to go back to dating you, who I already divorced? Like, divorce is kind of a big deal. You don't divorce someone over, like, petty squab. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was a bit strange to me. How she just, like, jumps back into his arms, essentially, to get back with him. Even though, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it seems like the fact that he's a, a heisting kind of thief guy was was part of they don't go into super depth about it but it seems like that from what they the dialogue that does exist about it they it seems like that did play a role in the collapse of their relationship so him pulling off a big high like the only insinuation that you can get from this is that she's just a gold digger 
and that now that he's really rich because he just pulled off the massive heist she wants to be with him again which doesn't like that's really a weird message to send like i, I mean it's not a weird message that was the, the wrong thing to say sorry it's it's a weird characterization because the idea would be then that he knows she's a gold digger but wants to be with her i know it doesn't make any sense is what i'm saying that that ending part about the, the whole woman arc didn't make it, it as stupid <laughs> also the movie would have been way better so so here's here's what happens the guy the casino owner guy gets absolutely fucking destroyed right he gets owned super hard that's the whole kind of plot of the movie is him being being like this control freak who thinks he's really powerful and he's very like you know power tripping trying to if if anyone fucks with him he like has them beaten and killed right like he's he's a and then he gets a taste of his own medicine where these heist guys they come in and they in one night they ruin his big casino event where he's hosting a big boxing event right they steal hundreds of uh, uh, like a, a shitload of money from him just and uh, like a lot of money in 2001 money and they steal his wife so it's like he's just had this day where everything he had going for him has just gone horrendously wrong and all in a really embarrassing way as well in a very in a way where it's like they ran rings around him. It wasn't even difficult for them. He should have shot himself in the face. The, what should have happened is he gets into the elevator and the, in the real in the movie, he gets into the elevator and the elevator doors close and you, that's the last you see of him, right? There's this lingering shot as the elevator door closed. What should have happened is this, a wanna. You follow him into the elevator. He has a sort of, he has this sort of straight face. He doesn't show much emotion on his face even when things are going really wrong. He's just a kind of stoic guy. So you follow him into the elevator he has this straight sort of stoic face you follow him up the elevator to his hotel room he's got this beautiful hotel room he goes into his bedroom he pulls out a gun and he just shoots himself in the face all one shot no emotion on his face really he just does it then you're like suddenly there's a little more it becomes a little more morally dubious somehow you know you're like damn they really just like fucked this guy over for like for money really like sure he's not a good guy but like they just they just ruined his life so bad he killed himself, which is what would happen in that. <laughs> like that feels like a more he he wouldn't just be a little bit upset. They, they they fucking ruined his life. That's what should have happened at the end of the movie. He should have just gone up to his room and just shot himself in the face. Anyway, that's my critique. But other than that stuff, it was a good movie though. It was fun. A bit wacky, a bit campy, but in a good way. Campy in a good good heist movie sort of way that it should be so team fortress 2 i've been thinking about team fortress 2 because i played a lot and i i seem to have hit a bit of a, a wall on my my skill level this is what i've noticed i've noticed i've hit a little bit of a wall on my skill level um and i'm i'm not quite sure what to do about it so i had a couple of experiences today the first thing is i played a little bit there was i was on uncle topia and the map got set to uh, Sweden. And on Sweden, as a demo, you know, you gotta go half Zatoichi. You have to. It's the only map where that sword's viable because everyone picks half Zatoichi on. It's a. It's what you do. If you don't know TF2, by the way, um, I'll explain this to you. So Sweden is a map that is. Uh, it it it's a set in like ancient Japan kind of. It's like a set in like an old Japanese castle looking place. Um, and the half Zatoichi is uh, katana. And the gimmick of the half Zatoichi is that uh, if you come across another player who also has the half Zatoichi, um, then it's a who it, it, you you enter like a basically it becomes a one shot kill on players who are wielding the same weapon um, to be like a, a, a Akira Kurosawa samurai duel, right? Like whoever just hits first wins in the cool samurai duel movie way. It's a really clever mechanic to like bring the vibe of old samurai movies into TF2 for some reason. It's it's fun. It's it's a very fun mechanic. But obviously it only works if other players are using it. And so there's sort of an unwritten meme that this is the map where half Satoichi duels take place because it's the Jap it's the Japan map. Uh 
So I was going, and the other thing that the Hafsa Toichi does, aside from that, which is kind of like a secondary thing, the actual central gimmick of the Hafsa Toichi is that uh, when you pull it out, so like when you un unholster it, when you switch to it, it, it takes away 25 health from you. I think it's 25. It does da self damage when you take it out. And then if you get a kill, it restores health. Um, that's the gimmick of the weapon. The, the, and then also as an added thing, it's a one shot kill to people wielding the same weapon. So because it does damage when you draw it, it's kind of not worth playing hybrid, uh, in my opinion. I think it's only really worth playing if you're going full demo night, so, because then you're never switching weapons. So you're never taking the damage penalty you only get the advantages. Um, but uh, Suijin doesn't have much trimming opportunities, in my opinion. Uh, it's it's good for, for rocket jumping and sticky jumping classes, but it's it's not good for, for trimping specifically. Not many slopes. Uh, and so I decided to equip the Charge and Targe instead of the Tide Turner. And because I'm full demo, I also could equip uh, Alibaba's Wee, Wee Booties. So what I'm saying here is that I got to experience being a class that wasn't fucking instant killable by every other class in the game for a split second. And I actually did really well. Best I, like, really, really well. I, I, I second from top scored. And this is on Uncle Topia, so the players there are, like, reasonably good. I was fucking owning, at first at least. About, I, I you know, it seemed like the other players sort of caught on uh, and started focusing me a little more or something, that I was a threat. I don't know. But towards the second half of the match, I didn't do as well. But the first half of the match, I was fucking owning. Uh, which made me think, you know, it's just 20 more health. It's just like, it's it's just 20 more health and some damage resistance. Uh, that's that's all that's all it's giving me, really. Uh, sorry, it's just 50 more health and some damage resistance. But that puts you over a certain threshold, right? Like, most weapons in the game, they do a set amount of damage. So it's like, the difference between 150 and 200 health can be quite a lot just from equipping a different shield um which yeah made me think like damn i'm like how much am i neutering myself by normally you know i'm playing tide turner islander iron bomber um which means i have 150 health and i'm slow as fuck and i have no resistances it made me think maybe i it really made me think how the fuck is how the fuck is solar light so good like i i need to my real problem here is like a fundamental i, I don't i don't i don't know I, what i know is that i i need to get more heads again if you're not a team fortress 2 player i will explain the islander is a sword which um the trade-off is you start off with lower health than normal you, you you start off with 150 health which is pretty weak but every time you get a kill you collect the head of that person which means you you get x uh higher it raises your max health and it raises your base speed every time you get a kill and so although you start off really quite weak once you get like three heads you can start becoming actually really powerful and by the end of it you can have uh like almost as much health as a heavy and you can run faster than a scout uh, if you max out your heads which i think is like i i don't remember actually how many heads you need to max out but if you max out like there's a cap and where you getting more heads doesn't make you faster or strong more more health but uh yeah once you get to that cap you're fa as fast as a scout faster than a scout slightly and uh almost as much health as a heavy if you combine it with a shield you can have as much like you can have the same amount of health effectively because shields give you resists to certain types of damage um so it's a trade like it is it should be the most powerful sword because because of this ability to to uh the, to sort of snowball um the extra movement speed and the extra health is just invaluable it makes you so much more powerful problem is getting that health in the first place uh and i think my problem is just that i i'm not taking into account the arc so i i tend to make i'm underutilizing the islander so i think what i'm gonna do tomorrow is i'm gonna try playing pure demon for a bit because i need to I need to, I'm, maybe I'm over relying on my Iron Bomber, um, and I'm gonna try going pure demo night, so I can just put some hours in to learn the rhythm, to learn how to pick off opponents slowly, patiently, get in, get, get the first three heads, and then I can start putting myself into slightly more dangerous, or slightly more, again, slightly heavier classes.
I'm fucking sick and tired of food. I don't want to think about food. I don't want to make food. I don't want to eat food. I don't want to have fucking dishes that I have to wash because I made food. I don't want to have to clean up the area because I made food. I don't want to buy food. I don't want to think about buying food. I don't want to spend that money. I don't want to think about the nutritional content of food and balance and vegetables and protein. I don't want to think about fiber. I don't want to do it anymore, man. I don't want to fucking do it anymore. I'm sick of it. I don't want to buy... I don't want to have to fucking do any of this shit. And that's why I've decided to go back on the Huel... Back on my Huel bullshit. You know what I'm saying? You know, I used... I had Huel for a while. I I bought one... You know, it's like a subscription service, but I only bought one is what I'm saying here. Um, and I, that was the powder. And I got the, the original formula and I got the vanilla one. And by the end of it, I fucking hated it. You know, I, I may be autistic, but unlike a lot of other autistic people, I, I don't really want to have the same meal every day. Um, well, I do. I want to have the same meal every day for like a month. And then that idea of even eating it disgusts me. It, a good example of this is the time when I decided to get really into sweet potatoes. There was a time when I was like, you know, I haven't had sweet potatoes in a while. Let me let me get some sweet potatoes. And then I ate nothing but fucking sweet potatoes with every meal for like three weeks. And then halfway through eating a portion of sweet potato mash, I suddenly realized I don't think I like sweet potatoes. And then as I kept eating this portion of sweet potato mash, I realized I really fucking, this is disgusting. It's sickeningly sweet. And ever since then, even thinking about like right now, I'm thinking about the taste of sweet potatoes and it's making me nauseous. They, I ate nothing but <laughs> I ate it with every meal for like three weeks and then went completely off of it. And this happens with pretty much every food. Uh, like I, I get really into a type of food, eat nothing but that food for a while and then get completely fucking sick of it. And it just happens like that. And this is this. So that's one reason why I stopped having Huel. The second reason is, uh, <clears throat> well, there's a couple of things that mix into it. It's to do with Huel itself. The, um, the second reason is that it's sweet. Um, I am not, I like chocolate and no other sweet things, pretty much. Donuts, maybe once in a while. Um, but I am not a fan of, uh, that having a major meal that is sweet all the time. By the way, when I say I stopped Huel, I have still drunk a couple of Huel's since then from the store. But I mean, I, I didn't, I, I exited the subscription service for the powder. Um, I didn't, didn't repurchase my subscription for the powder. Renew my subscription, I should say. I finished my two big tubs of powder and then didn't buy it again. Because it's sweet and I don't like that much sweet. I always buy non-sweet vape juice. You know, I'm not a, not a, a, a guy who can handle having sweet constantly. I like a little sweet treat and that's it. Uh, and then the next reason is that uh, sometimes I would, this was a sim around the same time I was going climbing and uh, I would take a bottle of Huel with me climbing. A lot of climbers drink Huel. It's, you know, for obvious reasons, it's kind of the perfect drink slash food to have while climbing it. You know, you can carry it with you very easily and it has nutrients that will support your body <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's healthy. Uh, a lot of climbers are, tend to be sort of like that. So there's a, yeah, but I didn't know that. I only noticed that when I saw other people at the climbing gym also drinking Huel and people online, but uh, it just seemed obvious. And sometimes, you know, I'd make the Huel in the morning and the journey to the gym might be <clears throat> a couple of, might be like an hour because it was across, across London on the other side of London. And then at the gym, you know, you'd be climbing for like three hours, maybe longer. Uh, let's just say three hours. And then... I would drink my Huel. And so that Huel had, would have been sitting in my warm bag for like four hours and it would start to go a bit funky. And <laughs> that taste of funky Huel, it does not taste good, man. It tastes really bad. Um, it's subtly bad, but it's noticeable. And I don't know what it is, but uh, that taste also really put me off because once you taste that, then even drinking Huel that isn't funky starts to taste a little bit like that. I think my choice of, you know, there was the reason I went with the classic as, as like plain flavor flavors as I could is because of this, this sweetness thing. You know, normally when I go to the store to get a Huel, I get the chocolate Huel because that's just one meal, you know, and, and that's fine. But I feel like if every meal I ever had tasted like chocolate, I would hate it. So I'm trying to solve these problems. Fortunately for me, Huel has solved these problems for me, which is that they offer a, a hot and savory Huel that you heat up. I don't know much about it, 
but I'm looking into it now. Um, Huel, hot and savory. The question is, do I have to heat it up in a microwave? Because I do not own a microwave. Um, <clears throat> it has, I mean, it's also cheap. I mean, look, there's a good, there's fine reasons to buy Huel, in my opinion. I will eat the bugs, and I will live in the pot, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. So you do that. Do you, do you, I, wait, maybe you have to put it in a pot of boiling water. How do I prepare? Micro, oh, you can either... I mean, this looks good. Cattle instructions. You can make hot and savory simply by adding 200 to 250 milliliters of boiling water to two scoops of powder. Stir, cover loosely, and leave for five minutes. Okay, I mean, that sounds, that sounds reasonable to me. That's very doable. I mean, look, I might have to send it. I think I'm gonna send it. Spaghetti carbonara, Mexican chili, Thai green curry, chicken and mushroom pasta, mac and cheese, Cajun pasta, pasta bolognese, korma, madras, tomato and herb, or sweet and sour. These are my options. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know if they're gonna taste terrible. Who knows? Uh, let's see. Well, Mexican chili can't go wrong with a bit of Mexican chili, and uh, maybe I do like korma. I like the sound of korma. Bolognese. I'm going to go with bolognese. And maybe uh, carbonara. Oh, the carbonara is more expensive for some reason. I don't know why the carbonara is more expensive. But I have to buy three of them. The fuck is Cajun pasta? Creamy Cajun style pasta with mixed peppers, sweet corn, and a kick of cayenne pepper and can... Okay. Thai green curry. I could go with Thai green curry, maybe. I highly doubt that's very good. Mm. I might go with... Uh, let's see. I might go with korma. Might go with Koma. Okay, I'm not gonna buy this. The other reason I didn't do Huel is because Dotsmite didn't like Huel. But I'm thinking Dotsmite might like this. If not, no problem. I will now check out. I'm fucking sick and tired of, of food. I am cursed, cursed with two afflictions. The first one is poor reaction to hypoglycemia. My mood is very heavily affected by having hunger basically low blood sugar or whatever i tend to get very erratic like erratic and depressed to low mood when i'm hungry to a more severe degree than i think a lot of people or at least i'm more aware of it than other people because i think i know some people who get pretty grumpy when they're hungry but then when i try and tell them that they're like oh no 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 i couldn't possibly just be hungry and yet every time reliably once they eat food, they cheer up. I know some people like that. Maybe you know some people like that. We are not as inf we are not in these infallible logic machines, okay? Maybe I'm just more aware of it than most people, but maybe it's a combination, I don't know. So that is my first affliction. You know, some people, they can just eat like fewer, larger meals. I can't do that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that I have, I have a bit of a taste for the finer things in food. What I mean by that is not that I am uh, a foodie or that I don't eat sort of low class foods. No, I like both low class and high class foods. I would be very happy to eat, um, <clears throat> I don't know, a, a, a steak. I don't know, what's a, what's a, a, a food that would be cla Lobster? Lobster? I don't know. I like lobster. Sushi? I don't know. Whatever. I would be happy to eat some fancier, nice foods as much as I would be happy to eat some nuggies, some tendies, chips, or burger, frozen pizza. You know, both of these things please. But I really do not like eating bad food. Like, I just, I don't care if it's high class, low class, whatever. As long as it's good, um, and some people think that the low, the like tendies and shit, that's not good. I disagree. I think it is good. Um, that's all I care about. <clears throat> but I care about that a little. I do care about that. Is what I'm saying. Like I can't just eat bullshit. When I'm cooking, I have one. It has to have some sort of flavor. Cause eating is not really a pleasant experience, right? So you have to make it a pleasant experience by cooking well. If you're not cooking well, what's the point? or at least eating something nice. Anyway, that's my problem. I like good food too much. I'm too lazy. What else did I say? I'm hypoglycemia, I don't know. It's all bullshit anyway. It's all fucking bullshit. I will live in the pot and I will eat the bugs. They call autism the disease of king. That's the thing. They call autism the disease of king. Capture more. No, thank you. I will capture nothing. I will not track and trace my own phone. That's the thing. The hell is flip to glyph? I don't know what that is. Not interested. The phone is nice. I need to... I'm, I'm gonna do some shit with it though. I don't know what I was just... why I just said that. I have no plans to do any shit with it. Today has been an 
an interesting day. I did some interesting things. I read a really good Lovecraftian fiction from a source I would not have expected. There's a Twitter account, which I have never liked, called Zero HP Lovecraft. Never been a fan of this guy's tweets. Um, he seems kind of miserable. Uh, I think if you look at his tweets, you'll kind of see what I mean. Tweets too much. Makes me wonder if he's got anything going on in his life. I don't know. I don't have anything going on in my life, but I don't posture like I do on the internet. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, I've previously read one of his blog posts, which was about right-wing politics, and I thought it was okay. I thought it was well-written, but it didn't blow me away. Um, but today, he randomly came up in a discussion I was having, and so I decided maybe I can read some more of his blog, because it's been a while. Because I know this guy's very widely hated, but I also know that he's also quite popular. He has a lot of fans, but he also has a lot of detractors. I was wondering what all of his fans like about him. So I was like, I'm going to go read some more of his Substack. And I read a couple of his fiction stories. I'd already read one of them before, but I read a couple of his fiction stories. One of them was called The Green New Deal, which I mainly thought was just funny. It was kind of funny. I don't know if it was as deep as, as he thinks it is. I don't, I don't know what he thinks or anyone thinks. But what I do know is that then I read this other one, um, and I'm forgetting what it's called now. By the way, I was called The Gig Economy, and that was really good. Unironically, no, no irony to be found here. With true sincerity, it was genuinely very good. I have read a reasonable amount of Lovecraftian fiction on the internet, and most of it is quite bad. <laughs> But this one was quite good. I'm very being careful with my language so that to only say in vague terms Lovecraftian fiction and not give any particulars about because I think you ought to go read it yourself. It is quite a good story. I will now go and eat food, unfortunately. I don't... I don't believe cryptocurrency exists. I don't believe that any of these people who claim they got rich on cryptocurrency actually did. Everyone who's in this online neat place knows a guy who knows a guy who's a crypto millionaire. Oh yeah, I bought Chainlink when, and I got rich off Chainlink. You know, everyone knows a guy like that, or at least knows a guy who knows a guy like that. But you know, the, the prevalence of these guys is very strange. I feel like there shouldn't be that many of these guys. Because in order for, th like, these are sort of zero-sum games, you know? Which makes me think of a lot of things. That, that, that everyone's lying, something's not true here. Or I fundamentally, misunder fundamentally misunderstood something. Something's gone very wrong. I don't think any of this is real. Like, okay, let me explain it to you. Let me explain my thoughts in as clear a way as I possibly can, which is not that clear at all. Crypto is supposed to be this thing that suckers buy into because someone in an authoritative tone tells them that if they don't do it now, they're gonna regret it. It's a classic psychological trickery, which is uh, that the, the same trick as a, a limited time sale. The idea is that you get someone to buy something by telling them that if they don't do it right now, they're going to miss out. And the idea is all of crypto is based on this idea that it's a speculative asset and it's going to increase in value. So every second you're not buying, you're losing money. You're losing money, guys. You've got to buy now. You've got to buy it now. Every second you don't buy. If you wait two days, the price is going to double. Okay, that means that's two times your money you just missed out on. You gotta buy this shit right now. It's gonna 10x, it's gonna 100x. That's what crypto is supposed to be. It's supposed to be that scam where the trick is that people buy it because they're, they don't want to feel stupid for missing out. And uh, they don't want to feel stupid because they don't want to feel like they missed out. It's all about FOMO. They're like, if you don't get it right now, you're going to miss out on free money, essentially. It's supposed to be a scam. But then how, you know, I'm convinced that, that there's this culture where everyone massively inflates the amount that they made on crypto. Because 
libertarians have a, a a meme where they never say the amount of money they have. I don't know why, but they do this, right? They they they're very secretive. They always imply that they're very rich. All libertarians do this. They always imply that they're very rich, but they will never tell you how much money they have. And crypto guys, I feel like the that like there's this culture where they all are constantly trying to signal I made a lot of money on crypto but back when that was a thing. I made a lot of money on crypto, right? They're all just trying to signal this. But I don't think anyone made it. I think very few people made money on crypto. But that's like what I'm saying is even everyone knows this. Everyone knows that very few people made money on crypto. But loads of people claim to have made money on crypto. And some of them have evidence to prove it. So then it's like, where's this money coming from? How did you make money? You know what I'm saying? I don't believe any of it. I know where the money comes from. It comes from boomer investors who gave a bunch of money to to fintech crypto startups. That's the money. Those are the guys that made a bunch of money on crypto. They didn't buy crypto. They scammed investors. That makes sense to me. And people losing money on crypto or or you know this this meme that like hey if you buy it right now you can double like that yeah hey, maybe it works for some people. I get it. But logically, I don't see how it can work as much as it's worked. That I don't understand how everyone can know a guy who got rich on crypto. It doesn't make sense. It's like, I don't know. I never I never wanted any of this crypto stuff. I never wanted any of this crypto stuff, man. Crypto sucks. Here's why crypto sucks. Cuz it sucks for buying anything. You can't buy anything with it. You can't really buy anything with it. It's not really decentralized and you can't really buy anything with it and it sucks. So why is it worth money? I don't know. I don't understand it. And then this is the thing, right? Another part of the crypto scam is this idea that like there's something really deep to understand. That uh, they, like anyone who's not involved just doesn't get it and that like we, you and I, we're the ones who really understand this is the future or something like this, right? But in reality there's nothing to understand. Like they use a lot of of lingo, but there's no actual I mean, very few of them actually understand the tech behind Bitcoin. And even the ones who do, that doesn't really mean much on a practical it means you can make your own coin from scratch, I guess, but from a practical level, what that's not got anything to do with the market itself is what I'm saying here. I guess it does, but most people who made a coin just copy pasted open source code and changed some values. No one programmed a coin from scratch except for fucking satoshi whatever his name is so what i'm saying is they all act like there's something to understand like there's some deep thing here that all oh, these guys just don't get it right that's part of the scam is that everyone there's this myth there's two myths the first myth is that everyone's getting rich off crypto and the second myth is that uh there's something to get that the pe- other people just don't get it um the problem is no one can ever tell you what it is because it doesn't exist but you can never question it because if you talk about how it doesn't exist in the crypto place they'll just say oh well then you just don't get it everyone has to uphold this um faith a false belief everyone has to pretend that they believe that they're gonna get rich or that they are rich already and that they get it and never ask any questions it's an obvious scam it was an obvious scam from day one which is why i didn't buy any fucking crypto because all of this shit was obvious right like for example there was adverts in london and these adverts had a picture of the bitcoin logo and it said if you're seeing bitcoin on a bus it's time to buy the second i saw that i was like fuck you (laughs) like okay that is the clearest sign i've ever seen to not buy crypto that's a terrible idea i'm not gonna buy your speculative asset that is being advertised on a bus you're just trying to artificially increase prices you're doing i don't that's i'm not gonna participate in this you're trying to steal my money so everyone's pretending to be rich, pretending to be successful, and pretending that they get it, and that it exists. And yet, they pretended hard enough that somehow they actually got rich. I don't understand it, man. You got people, they're like, yeah, I got rich. I'm a crypto millionaire. And I'm like, what? That's not possible. <laughs> somehow, the meme hyperstitionally created itself. The idea that you can, like... It got out of hand. It was supposed to be a scam that you can't actually get rich. The only people that get rich are the people who create 
coins and scam investor money or create some sort of Web3 stuff and scam investor money. That's the point. The hype around crypto is just so that investors think that it's the next big thing and give you money, right? That's why you perpetuate it. It's a really obvious scam. Everyone should see this, right? This should be super apparent to anyone. And yet, you know, the problem with this scam is that hype has to continually build in order for investors, because the more they invest and not get anything back into you building your next fucking fintech firm or whatever, the more they invest and don't get a return, the more they're going to be like, okay, you need to show me that this is going to be a real thing or I'm going to pull out. And so the hype has to snowball and increase and increase and increase. And so that's why you get Bitcoin on buses, Bitcoin adverts on buses, because at a certain point, it's not enough just for every susceptible person on the internet to have bought into the crypto myth. Now we've run out of targets. We have to continue building hype so that investors continue to invest so that we can take their money. But they built hype to the extent that the hype get, bought, got a mind of its own. And suddenly, people actually were starting to get rich. How does this make any sense? I'll tell you, it don't. Let's see what's going on. Oh, why am I yawning so much? Holy shit. Why am I fucking yawning so much? Let's see what's going on on biz, shall we? What's going on on biz these days? Nothing. Fucking nothing is going on on biz right, right now. Boy, you should not be making purchasing decisions when you're going fucking schizo. I just spent 55 pounds on Huel fucking bullshit. What was, what was I thinking? This shit looks disgusting. I should have, for some reason, I didn't look up any reviews of it before I bought. I mean, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. But let's just say the promotional images look a lot more appetizing than the, the, the videos on YouTube of the actual thing. I should have just bought regular Huel, maybe. I don't know. I'm still in favor of the concept of Huel, but I don't know if I should have, I think I should have just bought the regular fucking thing instead of this, this nonsense. Well, I guess we'll find out. My laptop's gonna run out of battery soon, and I have a couple of things to say. Um, the first one is just a brief note, which is, I hate, I hate this concept of, like, valid. Everything has to be valid. Like, when people say, oh, but your opinion's valid. It's like, hold on a goddamn second. You're implying that you have the ability to validate or invalidate my fucking opinion. What are you talking about? You don't have that ability. Shut up. Okay, got that out of my system. I just rewatched Everything Everywhere all at once. I gotta say, it's a great movie. Fuck all the contrarian retards trying to counter signal <laughs> so hard by being like, oh, it's mid or whatever they think. I don't know. I just know they exist. I don't know that they, I don't know what they think. I'll probably run into one soon. Most people, they're just like, eh, it was fine. Not most people. Most people love it. These people, they're just like, eh, it was fine. I guess if it doesn't click with you, like, obviously, let's say you're a, uh, a hardcore Christian, right? Let's say you're like a super religious guy. I think you're not going to really line up with the messaging of the film. Um, or if you're uh, like hardcore pessimist you might not line up with the messaging of the film um but i think that's because you're 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 you, you, people are unable the thing about the movie is it asks you to let go the whole movie is about that and that some people just aren't capable of it and i think that's the their problem like i'm watching it and i'm like how can you possibly not think this is amazing and i i think that the, the answer is that some people aren't capable of letting go of the their then their preconceptions and actually meeting the movie on its own level i think this is the problem with so much media people are just unwilling to meet the stuff they watch on its own terms they're so like hmm, well you have to <laughs> like I, it's not just this it's like everything a lot of people have terrible fucking opinions about movies and art because they're so unwilling to just let go of their bullshit and and do the work to fucking meet the story on its own terms and just give in for a second and i think i unironically think it's kind of a sign of low intelligence because i think it's the fact that you're unable to entertain an idea without fully believing it like do i 100 percent agree with all of the messaging of everything everywhere all at once from my personal philosophy i mean i think it's powerful i i have you know, it's it's not a fucking philosophy textbook, okay? Like, it's not the sort of thing you can say clearly that you agree or disagree with. So it's a little complicated. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe not, 
right? Like I don't necessarily think in my life that you can just settle for laundromat and taxes and actually be satisfied in life. Or at least I couldn't. Some people could maybe. But I, I don't I don't think that's that's necessarily the correct course of action, right? Like I, I wouldn't say because the movie is sort of saying you ought to do that. Like nothing matters, blah blah blah. But what does matter, like but we ought to value and cherish these small insignificant stupid moments it's stupid it's silly it's a farce it's meaningless but in spite of that it's also profound and serious and incredibly meaningful which is just how the movie itself is like that's the point of the movie is that it reflects that in its construction that's why there's stupid scenes with so guys with sausage fingers of course there's that because it's a reflection of the themes it's smart but it's also stupid and that's the point maybe people get that maybe people don't i don't know the point being whether or not i actually agree with that which i think i somewhat agree with it but i also am maybe a little more d different as well in some senses it doesn't matter i put that aside and i meet the movie on its own terms i don't come into the movie being like hmm, hmm well clearly my opinions are correct on everything therefore I am going to judge this movie entirely by my biases. Hm, yes, quite mid. No, I don't be doing that shit. I want the movie to ask difficult questions of me, and I want to not have all the answers to them. I don't want to dismiss them. I want to watch this movie and then be, and then the movie, not necessarily just this film, any film, like Tokyo Story, my favorite movie. I watched that movie going in, I had nothing but, uh, I had no real sympathies for older generations. I watched that movie and come out of it and I'm like, you know, okay, fuck, I now have to answer for my fucking, uh, uh, you know, I have to, you know what I'm saying here? I think people just aren't willing to meet movies on their own terms. Like, imagine watching Tokyo Story as previous me who's like, fuck old people. And the whole movie, I'm sitting there like, Pfft. yeah, but they're just old people. So it's like, what do they really know anyway? Like, yeah, sure, the kids are doing their thing. But, you know, Pfft. of course they're doing their thing. They don't have a choice. Like, look at it, right? It would be dismissing the entire... You go into everything like that. You're going to just dis live a miserable life. You're going to dismiss everything interesting. And then you'd be like, yeah, I thought it was well shot, but it was kind of mid. That's what you'd come out of every fucking movie thinking. I don't know. This is... It's a very strange... I, I, I think it's a, a midwit attitude. I see this with everything. I see it with anime all the time. People b go in with their moral convictions or convictions about how storytelling ought to be done properly and are unwilling to, to relinquish that control over to the whatever they're watching. Whether it, you know, I'm not just saying in terms of morality, but in terms of like worldview, in terms of structure, narrative structure, narrative design, everything. To to let go for the the time frame that you exist within the narrative space, and you know, a bad piece of art, it it doesn't it's it it doesn't let you in properly because bad art is dishonest art. Like you can't, you know, even as long as something is honest, it can't really be that bad. Right. Because even if even in the ways that it's bad, it is revealing. So as lo the, the, the really bad art is dishonest art, right? stuff that is made by committee or corporatized or disingenuous in some sense. Um, the stuff that is like bad, but incredibly in a very revealing way is sort of good. You know, that's, I think, part of how you end up with so bad it's good um, art movies whatever you know i see people so it's like the, the that that's the stuff that's bad because that's the stuff it's unchallenging it's boring it's lying to you it's lying to itself it's being dishonest and then it's impossible to even enter the narrative space to to, to do anything but yeah that's my opinions on everything ever all at once i i get it i talked to someone who doesn't like it i talked to to lv who my friend who was the one I was thinking of, who who I remember talking about when I first watched the movie, talking with when I first watched the movie, who didn't like it. Um, or I think he, he gave it a 6.5 out of 10, so mid. Um, I think he, uh, so his criticisms were that the, the it was incredibly well made, right? He's, he, you know what, I will just, so I'm not misquoting him. Um, uh, it's not a bad movie by any margin. It clearly has a lot of respect for the cinematic art form with its references to Ka Wai Wong. 
I've only ever heard him called Wong Kar Wai, but I guess that is the maybe that is the correct way around to put his name. The references to Kar Wai Wong, for instance, but it also muddles the impact of the more poignant and serious scenes with its le epic randoms Reddit nonsense that feels incredibly out of place and jarring. The juxtaposition of a Rick and Morty filler TV episode with in the mood for love scenes is just too jarring to make for a great cinematic experience. Like I can see how that. I mean, like again, I think this comes from a failure to meet the movie on its own terms. Like I think if you're if you're going into it and you see these the the wacky stupid scenes, and your brain immediately goes to Rick and Morty, like I think you're just media poisoned. <laughs> I think you're just like because the movie is nothing like Rick and Morty. You know, like I like the first season of Rick and Morty. I I think it had some good parts. Right, I I liked it a lot when it came out. I've rewatched it since then. I think the first season is still pretty good, and then the later seasons. It goes downhill as from there, but it's honestly, it's not the worst show ever made. You know, I've enjoyed some Rick and Morty from time to time, but I think it's clear to anyone that Rick and Morty and Everything Ever All At Once are not on the same fucking level of anything, right? They are, they are not comparable, really, in any way. It's just two movies or two properties, or oh, God, I hate calling them properties. God, erase that from the world that I just said that. Fucking hell, they're intrusing in my brain with their new speak. Two, two pieces of media that um pieces of of visual art uh which both happen to share the theme of there's a multiverse and sometimes wacky things happen but i i think like if you really want to compare both rick and morty and everything ever all at once to something it would be hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy because while that doesn't have a multiverse necessarily it does have an infinitely large universe where everything wacky is happening all the time um and you know hitchhikers is amazing uh that was one of my favorite book series growing up yes it's a series everyone seems to forget this there's a whole shitload of books in that series it's not just the first one it keeps going and they they're really the other ones are really good too um yeah it kind of reminds me of that but at least rick and morty kind of kind of is in that tradition but all three of those things aren't really comparable because they're kind of doing different things with it. I mean, yeah, they're, they're kind of doing different things with it. Like, I think it's kind of weird to approach the stupid... To Like, I can understand. I think either you get it or you don't. Like, either it clicks with you or... It, that makes it sound like I'm being a little condescending. What I mean is, like, either it clicks with you or it doesn't. Right? Like, there's some people... I just happen to be one of the people who uh, doesn't find the juxtaposition... Or I find the juxtaposition effective, right? The jarringness, to me, works. I think it's... I think it... I'm able to to jump between... Like, I don't... The point of the, the jarring jumps is that it's supposed to happen so quickly that you don't emotionally readjust. That's the point. Is that when you when you go from sorry I keep dropping my fucking shit and making a really loud noise on the computer when you go from the more grounded um, dramatic scenes to the wacky universes immediately without any space to reset the point is that you carry the emotional weight over and it like that's what it does to me at least when I when it jumps from serious grounded universe to wacky rakakuni universe they it it breaks logical continuity but it doesn't break emotional continuity to me when those scenes jump over it i carry the emotion from one scene into the other and that's why it's effective because it's showing that like it's it's recontextualizing this stuff in order to show you that like you know this obviously meaningless stupid silly little thing can carry emotional weight uh that's how it works for me but i guess if it doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work for you. I really think we need to be spreading a culture against these stupid fucking video game item shop bullshit shit. You know what I'm saying? On the one hand, I like the fact that I can play Counter-Strike and Team Fortress 2 for very cheap one-time purchase because a whole bunch of other suckers are willing to spend money on pixels which supports the game for me to play for free that's kind of good i guess so maybe maybe this is dumb but like i really don't like the culture where it's like if if you don't have a knife you're kind of cringe if you don't have a cool hat if you're wearing a gibbous you're an f2p noob you know what i'm saying like what if i just don't want to buy cosmetics what if i just want to play the fucking game 
bro, I don't understand this fucking things with Linux. How is everyone having so much trouble with Linux? Just install a normie just works OS. Like, what are these people doing? I don't fucking understand it. You don't, none of these problems that everyone talks about exist. It's all a fucking meme. I've talked about this before. I, I only, the, the, I've only ever had like two times now where Linux has broken from something that wasn't my fault where I was poking around with something that I didn't understand and broke it by poking around with it or because I was purposefully trying to do something that I knew was difficult and unnecessary. Like, for example, installing an obscure op- an obscure distro uh, and then finding that it had problems in the uh, a couple of situations, including Alpine, right? Or trying to do something hyper-specific. But for normal, everyday shit, I, ha- I don't... There's no problems. Like, what the fuck are you people talking about? That it crashes and bricks? Like, it's nonsense. It doesn't happen. This shit doesn't happen. It's not real. That doesn't... And you're just making things up for no reason. Like, I understand being terrified of the command line, but that's a you problem. You need to get over that. Once, like, it takes you a week to get used to. It's just a slightly different way of doing things. And then once you've done it for a week, once you've figured out LSCD you know, and all the basic commands and how to use a package manager, it's so much easier than Windows. Like, it, it going back to Windows, it starts, you realize how little sense the normal system makes. And like, I understand complaining about that because that's a learning curve. Of course, doing anything new is going to have a learning curve. It's not a massive learning curve. People act as if this is a crazy, oh my God, it's a crazy steep learning curve. I have to learn five fucking commands and I have, oh no, how am I supposed to do that? If I want to install Firefox, I don't just open Google Chrome and go to the, type in Firefox download and then have to go to the website and download Firefox, and then it runs me through it in an installer, right? Instead, all I have to do is open a terminal and type sudo apt get install Firefox, and it does it for me. It's so hard. It's so much... Oh my god, Linux is so hard. It's so much harder. It's such a steep learning curve. Like, what the fuck are you talking about, you fucking retard? I think these... Like, I don't understand. What are these people talking about? How are they having, like, all of these issues with Linux? It never happens. I've installed Linux on so many different computers. I've never had these issues that people talk about. Where, like, oh, it's always crashing and bugging and you have to install drivers and it's all really complicated. It doesn't exist. None of this exists. I'm using, like, fucking rolling release bleeding edge distros. None of it exists. Like, my system has never broken and crashed. I've had to downgrade a package once in my entire fucking time using an Arch-based distro, I have had to downgrade a package once. And it's not even hard to downgrade a package. Like, a fucking Windows breaks every 10 seconds. I don't understand what these people are talking about. Like, it's just, it's just, they're just making shit up for no reason. Why are they just making shit up for no reason? It's incredibly frustrating. Unless I am just the world's luckiest person who has, like, I don't, I don't understand it, man. I don't understand it. It's painful. It's painful. Look, I don't care if every normie on the street uses Linux. I don't fucking care if your grandma wanted to use Mac OS. Okay, I'm on Mac OS right now. I don't give a fuck if you, what you use on your computer anymore. Okay, I don't fucking care. But don't start lying for no reason. Don't do it. Don't start lying for no reason. Just be honest. Say, it. look, I've been using Windows my whole life. It works well enough for me. I don't have any problem with it. I'm just going to stick with it. Just say that. Just fucking say that. Oh my god. Holy shit. Why lie? I don't understand. I don't understand why everyone feels the need to like l- to just make shit up about this. I'm currently trying this Huel. My Huel arrived. I'm in my Bugman pod. In my 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 uh Goyslop. Mmm, Goyslop. 
tastes like shit. <laughs> it doesn't actually taste like shit. It just tastes extremely mid. I don't know what I was expecting. When I bought it, you heard me, right? I was like, this is gonna solve all my problems. And then I realized the next day, once I was a little less uh, schizo, like, what have I done? <laughs> I should probably look up like real videos of people trying this. So I know what it like tastes. And uh, all of, none of them, I will tell you, there were a few different reactions, but none of them were, yo, this is really good. None of them, none of them were that. They were all like, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's okay. Which makes more sense for the Huel drink because it's just a drink. Like, you, a drink is a drink, you know? It doesn't matter, you get it over with. But this, it's like you have to boil water, you have to wait five minutes for mid-meal. I mean, sure, that's still quicker than most meals and less effort, but, and it's healthier than those meals, or at least, allegedly. Mm. It's not bad. The main thing that's bad about it is the texture, because it's just very, very watery. Like on the website, it looks, it doesn't, they lie to you on the website. Like if you go to Huel and you go to the hot and savory section, the, it looks thick. Like it, it very obviously looks like a thick sauce that's clinging to the pasta. You can see it if you go on the site. Like there's no, there's no mistaking it that that sauce is like, has the texture of a sauce, right? But, but the real shit, the real one is just uh, water. <laughs> it's very watery. It doesn't have any uh any thickness. Like just put some xanthan gum in here, man. It just doesn't it doesn't cling to the pasta at all, which kind of sucks. But and also obviously like rehydrated soggy ass pasta is not great. It's not exactly al dente, put it put it like that. Mm. But honestly, it tastes fine. Like the actual taste component, I'm pretty sure it has some sort of MSG in it or something similar. I'm getting that sort of savory flavor, uh, but no, obviously it's not got any meat in it. Mm. The actual flavor profile is fine. It's not great, not terrible. It's a little uh, understated, I would say. It's not super flavorful, but that's fine. Like it's kind of a subtle flavor, but that's not a problem. You know, I mean, this one I'm eating right now is the, the bolognese version. But I wouldn't say it tastes like bolognese in any <laughs> sense of the word. It's kind of blasphemous that I would even call it that. Um, but when I'm eating bolognese, when I make bolognese, it's all about that that big umami punch, that slow cooked umami punch, and the the sort of texture that you only get by slow cooking meat. Um, so obviously none of that exists. It's it's more of a subtle, um, vaguely tomatoey, vaguely umami kind of flavor with chunks of, I, I don't know what this stuff is, maybe it's tofu or pea protein or something like that. Mm. Which honestly, they don't do a terrible job of emulating the texture of meat. Like it's very clearly different, but it gives you something to chew on, which is really nice given that the pasta is extremely soggy and gross. I mean, it's not gross, it's just not toothsome. And there's a little bit of a flavor that's trying to emulate cheese in there, like a Parmesan. It's very strange tasting this stuff because it's like clearly not the thing I'm used to tasting, but I can tell that it's vaguely gesturing at Parmesan. It's vaguely gesturing at Bolognese meat sauce. It's 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 a very strange experience. But honestly, I can't say I'm super dis- I'm neither particularly disappointed nor appointed. <laughs> I, it's, it, it is just incredibly mid. Um, my review is, I mean, this is just for the Bolognese one. I'll, I'll tell you about the other ones. Yeah, it is just incredibly mid, but given how cheap it is, it's like two pounds something per meal, which is not, I mean, it's not amazing, but it's pretty good. And given that it's a nutritionally complete, that fits two of my three criteria on the food triangle, right? It's, it's good for you and it's cheap. So it doesn't really matter if it's tasty. But this tastes better than like a salad, so which also is similar in the food triangle of being cheap and good for you. This is significantly better than eating a salad. Tasty. Yeah, yeah. You'll like it because it just tastes like bland. The texture sucks though. Uh, you don't like it? The texture is awful. The texture is really bad. Yeah. They need to fix the te- the, the, the taste is not that bad. It's the texture that sucks. Yeah. It's like mushy and, and, and not good. Now, I think I have a particular bias here because specifically the, the, the feeling of mushy pasta is a little nostalgic for me because at my school they used to have mushy pasta in the canteen cheapest possible mushy penne that had just been boiling or in hot water for like hours and so it's kind of nostalgic for that feeling to me 
but that doesn't make it good. But I can't exactly say I don't like them. I mean, if it, it is what it is, you know, it could taste better. More importantly, the texture could be better. The texture needs work, but it's not terrible. I have just tried the korma flavored huel hot and savory as my dinner t or maybe because i'm starting to notice what i think is the number one problem with huel hot and savory and that is the portion sizes man like it's just not quite enough food for me it's definitely enough food for someone who's a little smaller than me and if i wanted to maintain a calorie deficit i could do worse you know, maybe it's good that it's not quite enough food, but it does not leave me feeling full at the end of eating it. Maybe this is a good thing, you know? I'm gonna look at this as like a, a form of calorie control because it, it should be 400 calories per meal, right? So that's a reasonable amount of food, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it's just not quite enough food. That's the that's the first big problem with Huel. Uh, as for this particular korma, I have to say, again, fairly mid. I think calling, it's, it's a little insulting to call this korma and to call the, the bolognese bolognese. You know, it feels insulting to Indian food to call that korma. Like, it has some cumin in it and some coconut flavor in it, but it's not really a korma. It doesn't have the texture or the taste or the mouth feel or the experience of a, a good korma, okay? I'm not the world's biggest curry guy, but I've had a good few kormas in my life. It's one of my favorite types of curry. It's just not comparable. I would not call that a korma, really. It's kind of a different thing. That being said, on its own merits, is it is it terrible? No. Is it weird? Yes. It has raisins in it. That's weird. And it has loads of flaxseed. Too many flaxseeds, in my opinion. I know some people, they love to rant and rave about how great flaxseeds are. Personally, I haven't seen that much data which shows how great they are. However, I will say in praise of Huel that damn, these meals have a lot of fiber in them. That little meal I just had was eight grams, 8.7 grams of fiber. <clears throat> That's a lot. That's good. That's very good. Is it? All of, none of the benefits of Huel are benefits. If, if, if you hear me out here. In the sense that like, there is nothing that Huel provides that you couldn't do for yourself better than Huel does it. As an example, is Huel cheap? Well, it claims to be about two pounds something per meal. Let's say two pounds 70. You know what, even, yeah, sure. Uh, I think it was something around that. Now, buying in bulk, which Huel forces you to do, it makes you buy in bulk, which is how they can afford to keep it cheap, right? Because when you buy the single servings of Huel that are much nicer, because they're blended together industrially, so you don't get the grainy texture of the, the Huel drink. Uh, compared to when you make the powder at home, it's quite hard to get rid of the grainy texture. Uh, but that aside, uh, it's very possible to eat a fully nutritious diet for cheaper than Huel. You could definitely eat a nutritious diet that was as healthy as Huel is, or whether or not he was healthy, I, I don't want to get into it, but it can provide all of your macros and micros to the same extent that Huel does for cheaper. You could definitely buy bulk lentils and, and dry beans and grains and vegetables and so on. You could even throw in some meat in there maybe, if you, um, maybe not, a bit expensive. And maybe some, like, you could probably fit some tinned, tinned fish, I think, canned, canned fish into a really cheap diet, I think, um, you know, which is good for you. Better, better for you than a vegan diet as a pescatarian diet. <coughs> Although... A lot of things are better for you than a vegan diet. Veganism isn't actually healthy. This is just one of the lies that they make up to convince you to be a vegan. Well, any diet that gets you to eat your vegetables is going to be healthier than not paying attention to your diet at all and eating shit, which is what most people do. So in that sense, veganism is healthier. But they make some outlandish claims, is all I'm saying. Anyway, that aside... <coughs> excuse me. Um, it is possible to eat for cheaper than you can eat for Huel, you know what I'm saying? But the difference is, to do that, you would have to be thinking a lot about it. You would have to put a lot of thought into meal planning. You would have to buy things in bulk. You'd have to cook in bulk, which takes a lot of time and energy and thought and effort. Huel lets you do the same thing, not quite as efficiently, but in zero time, zero thought, someone else does the thinking for you. And that's nice. 
<clears throat> was the korma good? Not really, kind of bad. I wouldn't be happy if I got that from an Indian restaurant. I wouldn't be happy if I made that myself. I've made curries before. I haven't made korma, but I've made other Indian curries and Thai curry and Japanese curry, which is was the best curry I've ever made was Japanese curry. Man, that shit was good. Katsu curry with chicken katsu. Anyway, that was a while ago though. I haven't made it in ages because it takes like four hours <laughs> to do all the prep. Anyway, that aside, I wouldn't be happy with a meal that I cooked myself that tasted like that. But the trade-off here is I didn't have to cook it myself. It's like, am I willing to trade off a bit of the taste being not so great for having to just boil some water and that's it? Maybe, maybe. I will say it, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not enough food. It's just not enough food. I'm still hungry and I'm not sure what to do about this. I have to figure something out. I mean, maybe it will just, I'll feel fuller in a bit once it starts digesting, digesting and stuff. Maybe I've just been overeating my whole life, possible. Uh, but <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely not a super bulky or high calorie meal by design. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so two scoops should be 400 calories. 400 times three, 1,200, which is, yeah, that's not enough <laughs> fucking food. Okay, no wonder I'm hungry. I have to up this. I have to up my amount of meals per day then. Which is annoying. That kind of counteracts the point of Huel, doesn't it? Maybe I have to just eat two Huels in a real meal and a big meal. I'm not sure. But yeah, 1,200 calories is definitely not enough fucking food by like a lot. <laughs> that's like over a thousand calories less than I would need. No? 2,500? Yeah. That's kind of fucking stupid. What were they thinking? Okay, in that case, I need to figure this out. What am I gonna eat? Damn. So this hasn't worked at all. The point was that I don't have to think about what to eat, but instead I just have to shovel Huel bullshit down my gullet. Huel shit, one might say. I'm gonna need to figure out solution. God damn it. I thought I had solved food. I thought I had, I thought I could, could get away with not, not having food. <laughs> Shut up, Discord notifications. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a disappointment. I should have thought, I, I, I could have thought about that at any point, but I only just thought about it. <clears throat> I mean, I suppose I can, it depends. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I wasn't planning on losing weight right now. <laughs> I guess it's possible. I can. 1,200 is a very severe calorie deficit. That's a pretty extreme diet. Uh, that's not really a safe diet. Or, I mean, it's fine, but <clears throat> it's like not an easy diet, is what I mean. Not something you can. Normally, those sorts of extreme calorie deficits don't go well for people, as in people don't stick to them, and then they just rebound, <clears throat> which is what happened to me multiple times when I've tried crash dieting. Uh, and I, I didn't lose any fucking weight either when I did it, which is insane. It's like my my body just isn't capable of that. <clears throat> I fucking went on a crash diet where I was eating about 1,200 a, a day, and, <clears throat> and uh, I fucking didn't lose any, I think I lost nothing. I don't think I lost anything. And I was doing that for like two weeks, three weeks. What the hell? Wait, how did this, wait, hold on. It's, it's, isn't it? Hold on, wait, I think this person applying to you do less, I know you're listening. Isn't it just that? Huh, what the hell? My Neo Cities is down? Wait, what? When did this happen? Wait a minute, I, I just put two and two together here. Shut up. I just put two and two together here. I'm getting goddamn scammed, aren't I? I'm getting fucking scammed. Cause they say, hold on a goddamn second. Hold, hold on a goddamn second. Two pounds 66 per meal. But each, I'm doing air quotes right now, big air quotes, meal is fucking 400 calories, which is nothing. Two pounds 66 per meal is not enough food for a human being. I don't think so. It's expensive. It's more exp I'm fuck this, fuck this shit. Um, let me, let me cancel. I, I accidentally made a subscription service to this. I need to cancel my subscription immediately. Manage subscriptions. Fucking, how do I do this? Oh, that's the button. Oh my God, these dark patterns. Holy shit. Fucking, Huel is too expensive. Confirm cancellation. Confirm. Not interested. I'm gonna, it's way more expensive than the, the normal Huel. How much is the normal Huel per meal? Does it say? Huel powder. Wait, what the hell? Huel essential? They made a cheaper version? One pound per meal? Holy shit. Okay, but what's the scam here? Why would anyone buy anything else then? Nutrition, duh, duh. what the hell is this? What is the difference between Huel essential and regular one? Okay, well, look, fuck, fuck whatever I've just spent money on. I don't know why I'm doing this. I, keep, I just don't want to fucking think about food for a while. I, that's all I want. 
all I want is to have like two months, two months break from having to think about food. I've had to think about cleaning up, cooking, all of this shit, too much. I'm sick of it. It's the only thing I do. The only thing I eat is food, as I said to myself out loud a second ago. The only thing I eat is food. <clears throat> There's more interesting things to be thinking about with my day, but thinking about how to solve the food problem is making me think about food more. <laughs> I don't want to think about delivery. I don't want to think about any of this shit. I just want, I just want a fuel in a thing that I can fucking guzzle. Okay, give me that. I don't know why I decided to do this hot and savory bullshit. Get stupid. Really stupid decision from, from me. Very stupid. What I should have done is not that. What I should have done is just get the classic Huel powder or something like that. I don't know, man. This shit's bullshit. This shit's nonsense and bullshit. I could just get... You can order bulk the bottles, which are way nicer than the powder, but they're not cheap see does it say how much it costs no they don't advertise that they don't fucking advertise that do they they've got they've got this goddamn Huel professional what the fuck how can you be professional at Huel it's just fucking nothing suitable for professional athletes what the hell bro the Huel essential i kind of like this as an idea i like this as a, a gimmick as like a dystopia meme this idea that there's like this this cheap ass fucking powder that you eat that is like just barely fulfills your nutritional needs this is kind of based kind of it's kind of based i don't know man i like it from a dystopia point of view but that's not a good point of view to like things you start liking things from a dystopia point of view next thing you know you've written a, a, a master's thesis called capitalism and schizophrenia and then a few years later you're the ceo of buzzfeed and the huffington post you know about that guy you guys know about that guy um Jonah Peretti, this fucking guy, man. Jonah Peretti, this guy, I'm telling you. He wrote he wrote a fucking article called Capitalism and Schizophrenia where he literally it is like argues for like the 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 only way out is through accelerationism and then went on to actually become a fucking CEO of like the worst, you know. This guy's kind of like listen, I respect it. He actually did he actually did the praxis. There's a YouTube channel called Plastic Pills, and um, I think he uh, he had a bit of an awakening or some kind of a revelatory experience when he just made this discovery that in the 1970s, um, having heard about the radical critical theory being taught in French universities, sent operatives to spy on those French universities. We're talking about all of your postmodern friends, Baudrillard, Deleuze and Guattari, Foucault, all of the guys that you know and love so much. They, they sent people to infiltrate and study what was going on here. And in declassified documents, it was revealed that their conclusion was that it didn't present any real threat that it was was basically meaning like that the CIA was not concerned about this um, and this plastic pills fella seems to be uh, quite disillusioned by this having happened but I think there's a counter argument you know not that I'm saying it's not a meaningful event I think that that is a meaningful event I think it's clear to see that there's there's that that sort of thing does there's definitely ways in which this sort of critical theory does not present any threat to American hegemony or capitalism in the same way that like the threat of communism did uh but that doesn't mean it it's it's useless or bad or pointless right like the thing about communism and all of those revolutions is that they they sucked right in large part i mean some of them were good for a while and then sucked some of them sucked from the very beginning some of them continue to suck to this day various levels of suck but none of them succeeded in doing what they set out to do even ardent communists only really argue that it's like marginally better than capitalism that like any of these existing or existent examples of communism you know they might like yeah they had slightly better whatever that's pretty much what they say but none of them you know for how fucking hard they campaign for it i feel like yeah it was just like a little bit better isn't really explanatory you know it doesn't really make any sense um and since they also had so many problems the point being a lot of these the critical theory in that era is specifically a reaction to the failures of the French communist uprisings and the failures of existing communist states and trying to not repeat those failures and analyze 
things beyond just class struggle, right? And not all of them are communists, not all of them are revolutionaries. They're more just, none of them are doing the same thing that the communists were doing, who were arguing for violent revolution as soon as possible. So of course, the CIA is not going to see it as a threat. And secondly, it's all wrapped up in this academic language. So it's like how much the CIA even understood is questionable. But it's worth remembering that the American military uses Deleuze as a part of their military strategy. That's not a meme. They, they, they use Deleuze, directly reference Deleuze in parts of their military strategy. These things are just descriptive analyses of the world. They're not like, it doesn't have to be instructions on how to build a pipe bomb for it to be good or useful. I think the plastic pills fella kind of is a little too disillusioned in this direction where he, he's, he sees this one circumstance as proof in some sense that like this is a dead end we're barking up the wrong tree but i don't think it is proof of that i think i might report huel to the the advertising standards agency i'm i'm sure that the reason they can get away with this is because meal isn't a protected phrase with any definition but i think that's misleading i mean i'm not gonna go i don't know i i mean i'm yeah like if you're trying to if if the scientific advice is that you should have three meals a day then i think a meal could be defined as something which by having at least or at least three of them and most three of them constitutes your daily calor- caloric intake you can't call uh something that is barely 400 calories a meal that just seems misleading to me and plus their pictures are misleading because the the source in the pictures looks like it's a completely different texture than it actually is in real life the it's it's ridiculous it's false advertising but i'm sure that they know this like the huel company isn't stupid they put a bunch of stuff I mean, even when you go to their website, their nutrition information is is unclear. Um, Like, when you try and read the nutrition information, it says one portion equals, like, uh, here, you read the nutrition information, and it says something like pasta bolognese, each bag contains 707 grams, serving size, 101 grams times one to two meals per day. What does that mean? Does that mean, and then... It says per 101 gram serving, but what is this times one to two meals per day then? What does that mean? Does that mean that these servings are actually two meals? I need to weigh how much each scoop weighs so that I can figure out what this even means. Um, And then they have like a different column for per 2000 calories, which implies that you're getting 2000 calories, but you're not. You'd have to eat a shitload of this stuff to, I mean, I'll try in the future to actually go a full day with pure Huel, nothing but Huel, 2,000 calories of Huel. Um, <clears throat> how much would that be? 2,000 divided by 400. That's five. I'd have to eat five, five Huel, five double scoops of Huel a day in the, in the day. Which, so is that, I mean, you can just have one scoop or like one meal, what they call a meal, in the morning for a, a light breakfast and then for dinner and lunch you can have or for for yeah you can have a, a seconds space um the problem is it just means that the bags are a really bad deal because one meal like you can't sure what they call one meal is two pounds something but you need to eat two meals to get your recommended daily amount of calorie like you need to eat five meals sorry to get your recommended daily amount of calories and that's own that's a minimum that's for women for men it's supposed to be 2500 so you'd have to eat even more six meals so eating six the bag contains seven and you wouldn't even be getting your rdi of calories you wouldn't even be getting 2500 calories eating a whole fucking bag in a day this is actually a scam holy shit this is a massive fucking scam this is a i've uncovered a scam here guys i've uncovered a conspiracy to scam the public i think i'm gonna make a video about this so that i can expose this as a, as the scam that it is bro why does this not fucking work i'm molding and balding what the hell is this i'm trying to play a visual novel called Renai royale and i've been playing it for like three hours today on the desktop and i think well fortunately steam cloud exists so i can just open it on my thinkpad and my save will be transferred but for some reason it doesn't work on the thinkpad i'm using proton it's the same thing it's linux 
What is not working about this? I don't understand it. I do not understand it at all. Not one bit. I've installed every... I've even tried Proton GE, which I've never been able to get to work before. I don't know if it... I mean, it doesn't help. It's installed properly, I think, but none of the Proton versions seem to work. What happens is, and I've had this happen before, and I'm trying to remember if there was some way that I solved it. What happens is, you launch it and it just it launches for a split second and then closes itself. And I'm pretty sure it's some sort of DRM thing that's broken. I think it's trying to check if Steam is running and then not finding Steam running. Because that's what happens when you open it in Wine. It gives you an error message. But whatever is happening, I don't know. But it, it the thing is, I remember this happening, similar thing with fucking Yuzu Soft Visual Novel. Let me see if this, the, the fix works. Yes, you have to put in... You have to put in this, right? Maybe in the in the options. Let's try that in the launch. Cannot find file. Hold on. See what happens. Cannot find file. Well, of course. It's the next day, and I have had for breakfast the final of my Huels, which was the Huel Mexican chili. By far the best one. By far. Uh, texture is way less bad than the others, and the flavor is way more actually fucking tastes of something than the others. Which makes sense, because Mexican chili is already basically Huel. If you just make chili yourself, you've basically just made a nutritionally complete meal out of beans and tomatoes and stuff. Chili is already a complete meal. I could have made this for two seconds. Wait, what? <laughs> I could have made this for, for less than half the price of what I have ended up paying for it, technically, sort of. Yes, actually, no, I literally could have made five times the portion for half the price, I think. So vegan chili, although vegan chili sucks. You gotta, listen, if you wanna improve, look, I'm not here, I'm not saying chili con carne gotta have meat. When I say vegan chili, I mean vegan, not vegetarian. Vegetarian chili, great. Vegetarian chili, great. But when you're serving your chili, there is nothing better than a scoop of sour cream with it, man. That is how you fucking make, that, that shit tastes good. Scoop of sour cream with your chili. That that makes it delicious. Um, <clears throat> but you know, sour cream aside, it wasn't bad. And yeah, it was it was kind of fine. I also had three scoops instead of two for six hundred calories, which is actually a reasonable meal. And that was my breakfast. Sorry, you guys probably aren't very interested in this, especially because you've probably seen the video I put out about how it's a scam. Actually, you probably haven't because no one watched it. But that's fine. I just I, I this that video is not for you. That video is for people who are thinking of purchasing it and search up Huel Hot and Savory and then get clickbaited into watching the video so they can see that the, that it, the pricing is a little bit of a lie, in my opinion, just a little bit. Uh, I'm watching a video by JX called A Deep Dive Into The Plot Hole Rabbit Hole. Good video. I always, you know, I never liked <laughs> the guy that, that JX is um, responding to, Patrick something, Patrick H. Willems. This, this guy, this guy's videos never clicked with me. I don't know why. Something about them. There's something about them, and I think there's something about them. <laughs> I would like to talk about minimal software and computing philosophy, because I might sound like a hypocrite, and in some senses I'm sure I am, but I want to clarify what any of this means to me. Why run GNU slash Linux, or as I've recently taken to calling it, GNU plus Linux? Why use minimal software? Why use old hardware, etc. Why care about any of this stuff when you can just not do it? In addition, how can you say you care about that stuff while recording this on a Mac and buying a modern phone? Well, there's a few answers to these questions. Um, and it, yeah, it comes down to the first one. Why, what is the point anyway? I've personally never really understood the point of running lightweight minimal software on high-end hardware. Some of it is just better, but it's not necessarily better, but not, not all of it's just better, is what I'm saying. So, for example, on the desktop, which, as you can imagine, is reasonably powerful, powerful enough to run most modern games, all modern games, pretty much, that I've tried, why bother with my desktop environment, right? I'm using BSPWM, I use software like Dmenu, uh, you know, what's the point of this sort of minimal environment when this computer could definitely, I mean, Dotsmite uses the same computer with KDE. Well, aside from the fact that I just like 
I am very used to the workflow of tiling window managers. I mean, actually, that's just the main thing <laughs> is that, well, I know how to use it. I'm, it's, it's how I feel most comfortable using a computer is with BSPWM. I have spent many hours learning how to configure it. I have spent many, you know, I have a, a config file on GitHub that I can use to set up and configure it how I like it. And I'm very used to it. Everything's ingrained in muscle memory. Uh, and I understand how it works, but you know, is it actually appropriate for that computer? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. There's a few things, but uh, yeah, the fundamental. So oftentimes the software is just better, uh, but it's not always just better. You know, Alpine Linux is not better than Arch Linux or Artix or any other distro that I've used because it's more minimal. It's not better as a desktop distro. It's just not, it sucks as a desktop distro. It's not made to be a desktop distro. I understand now what people are talking about. You can make it work, I have made it work, but it required a lot of workarounds and effort to make it work. But it is super fucking minimal. I'll tell you that much, it's highly minimal. It could even be more minimal than I have it set up right now. I could uh, do some spring cleaning even, make it a little slightly more lightweight. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's running on a fucking X60, just three gigs of RAM. It's an old ass computer and I want to minimize the overhead as much as possible. Pretty, pretty fucking simple to understand. Um, the ThinkPad X220 is slightly more powerful, but not powerful enough that I can afford to go ahead and, you know, run fancy ass Electron software in the background all the time without having the fans spin up. You know, I still want to keep it relatively lightweight. No problem. Not a problem, not an issue. You can do that. But then this computer, the MacBook, this is a modern, fast computer. I don't need to bother with minimal software. Now, I've been thinking that I will eventually install Linux on this Mac. I will install Asahi Linux once it gets out of alpha because Mac OS is not particularly good. I'm not a big fan of it, but it's not terrible. It's not as bad as people make it out to be. There's a few ways in which it's bad, but honestly, it's better these days than it's ever been before. Uh, Apple have decided to market themselves heavily on, on privacy and security, which is something I, you know, I appreciate. Unironically, the privacy features of Apple software are relatively good these days. Like iPhones having the uh, no cross app tracking system is genuinely really good for privacy. Anyone who says otherwise is just trying to hate on a big company for the sake of hating on it and doesn't actually care about privacy. Now, yeah, of course, it doesn't make Apple a good company. It just means they've spotted a niche in the market that they can, uh, you know, pander to. But that's fine. That's how capitalism works. It's fine if they if that that's how it doesn't really matter why I'm when it comes to my moral philosophy, I, the intentions don't matter as much as the results. Um, and so there was if the result is an, an increase in the average user's privacy, then it's good. You know, my Mac is constantly asking me every time an app wants any permission to do anything. Anytime I want to modify anything in the system, it's constantly asked, like warning me. It pops up stuff. It makes me put my password in or my fingerprint in, you know, that's good. I want my computer to do that. Now, sure, I could configure Linux to do that, too. Um, but it's nice that it just works that way out of the box. That's good. I don't necessarily need Linux to do that. Um, you know, the point the point is not to, to me some sort of overarching philosophical goal that large tech companies bad, uh, like morally evil, this software morally evil, etc. The point is to have fun. The reason to use a minimal operating system is the same reason to use an old school computer or anything like this. It's that uh, when you have a complex system with loads and loads of different moving parts, it's very easy for those things to break. And unlike with a simple system, a complex system is not going to be easily understandable by one human. If something breaks on Alpine or Artex, let's say, you know, I am vaguely familiar with most of the programs that are important that actually do shit on Artex. I'm vaguely familiar with them. I know how to read error messages. I know how to Google error messages. I, you know, I know how to use, like, if something breaks, now, again, the Artix computer is still pretty complex as far as computers go, right? Uh, even the output, any Linux operating system is still relatively complicated compared to, like, uh, you know, say, a, a, a Commodore or something like that. 
a machine running basic or uh, you know one of these sorts of old school operating systems or old school 8-bit computers those those are very simple machines now they require you to fully understand them or at least to partially understand them to a higher extent than they than modern computers do but that means if something breaks you know how to fix it you know you can go around poking individual memory addresses in those computers you, you can't necessarily do that on a, a mac or whatever or even if you could it probably wouldn't help you in any way because the it's it's too many it's too damn many of them it's too the process is too complicated uh so it's a trade-off sure the system is less capable by definition it's less capable slower and it has a higher learning curve but you're trading that off for if something breaks you know few, fewer things means fewer things that can go wrong and it's easier to fix if something does go wrong because there's fewer options for what broke and you can understand those options more easily if they're minimal. Uh, whereas a complex operating system is, you know, lots of things that can go wrong and so on. But the thing is, you don't need to worry about that if it just doesn't break. It will break eventually. That's the difference, is that the ThinkPad won't break. The Mac will break. And when the Mac breaks, I will have no choice but to take it in to be fixed or something like that. Although in reality, if the Mac breaks, I'll probably, I don't know what I'll do. Just get rid of it. I, I expect this to be the last Mac I ever buy. Um, hopefully, really trying to move away from it. it doesn't make me happy. Like that's okay. Let me clarify. I, I should have really led with this, but I, I was trying. Sometimes when I'm trying to organize my thoughts for dramatic effect or persuasive effect, uh, I come up with an idea and then I realize it doesn't work. But the idea was to build up to this. The fundamental thing is to have fun. That computing is not about productivity or efficiency or any of these things. It's about having fun. It's about being enjoyable and soulful and uh, a tool that is enjoyable to use. Um, that's how I see it, at least. Right? I'm not using my computer to make money for my boss. I'm using my computer because I want to have fun on my computer. And it is way more fun. You know, the the, the Apple sucks all this, the fun out of it. Right? It's very matter of fact. It hides all of the interesting stuff from you, but it does just work. Whereas Linux, you know, last night I was trying to play Renai Royale and having a lot of trouble getting it to work because uh, various things, <laughs> uh, Vulkan drivers, Artix packages that aren't the same as the Arch Linux packages, um, boot options, a few different things, right? I was having a lot of trouble. But now that I've solved that problem, and I've solved that problem before for various visual novels and other programs I'm running through Wine or Proton, every time I solve a problem like that, I learn a little more about how, how my computer is working behind the scenes. I learn a little more about how software operates, how software functions. And it's honestly a pretty pog moment. Like you might say, it, oh, it's completely illogical to use something that makes it hard on purpose just so that you can get the 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 thrill of solving the problem. Well, hold on a minute, you could have just not had the problem in the first place. It's like a game. It's like saying, well, why play, uh, you know, why, why play football when you could just pick up the ball and put it in the enemy's goal and score without it being difficult at all? Because that's not fun. You, you put, you set little challenges for yourself to overcome because overcoming challenges is fun. This is the principle that I think is making people depressed, is, is that convenience is not actually a good thing. That overcoming problems, setting yourself up in life so that you have these satisfying problems to constantly solve is what keeps you from fucking killing yourself. That's what keeps your mind active and keeps life interesting and fun and exciting. It's called hard fun, you know? Sitting there and watching Netflix all day, you're not having fun. You're depressed. You're, you're, you're just sitting there zoned out your brain is just full of nothingness you might be vaguely you might you might not realize that you're bored you might be just entertained enough to not realize that you're bored but if you study the brain waves of someone in that state or you survey them as to their experience you'll find that what they're actually experiencing is a very mild state of sort of a depressive slump that it's the same it's the exact same emotional experience whereas do, solving a, doing something that's hard fun solving a complex problem going on a hike, going on a run, doing something that is difficult for no reason other than because it is difficult. That, that is, that is hard fun. That is when you, you, you get a, a, an entirely different type of joy. And I don't, I don't think soft fun doesn't have a place in our lives. Okay. Soft fun is important. You can't be constantly pushing yourself 
all the time as hard as possible it's not healthy you need to rest and relax and and recuperate you need you need those times when when nothing much is happening and you can just sort of relax that's actually incredibly important for overall health and well-being um but i think most people have far too much soft fun and far too little hard fun and i include myself in that you know i i definitely include myself in that i mean this is why people play competitive video games like Counter-Strike or even Valorant or Overwatch or any of these things. This is why these, the League even, these games are incredibly popular because they provide something that most sort of computer-based sitting in your room entertainment doesn't, which is hard fun. There's a sort of meme, at least in the Counter-Strike community, of like, you play this game thinking that it's something fun, but that actually just makes you mad every time. But the thing is that being mad every time is enjoyable because it makes those wins even sweeter. That's what raises the thrill. You have real emotional stakes. Now, is this actually a good thing? In those games, no. I think those games are designed to psychologically manipulate into to a sort of addictive cycle. Um, taking advantage of the principle of loss aversion, right? It feels worse to lose a match than it feels good to win a match. Um, but you're always chasing the higher... And I think, I think that the, you know, you should be aware of that. I'm not saying you shouldn't play competitive video games. They're very fun. But I think you should be aware of this, the, your relationship with them, at least, so that you can make an informed decision as to whether you think this is a good thing to be doing. Whether you actually want to do it or not is up to you. I think, I think they're fun. But, um, you know, that you should, you should try and understand your relationship so that you can make sure you're making a good decision. Uh, whereas the thing is, solving problems with Linux, I very, very rarely run into something that I can't eventually solve. Eventually, after hammering away at these things for days even sometimes, the problem is solved. And then you get to use the computer with the thing that you just did. And every time you use it, it reminds you like, oh hell yeah, that was me. I fixed that. I made that. I did this. Sure. Am I, am I stupid? Would a smarter, more technical person not have even run into that problem in the first place? Yes. Someone who really deeply understands a particular system, would they have even had to troubleshoot it? Or would they have just known exactly what the problem is from the get-go? Or would they have not even run into the problem? Yeah, sure. Does it make me smart or intelligent that it took me a few days to... No, it doesn't. But it's mine. I did it. It doesn't matter. I'm, I get to feel happy with myself, proud of myself. I get to experience the joy of solving a real world problem that then has real world consequences. It's like building something that you then get to use every day. But as I said, you know, that's not the only type of thing that's valuable. That is extremely valuable. And this is the, the thing that I, I really don't like about, about the discourse around Linux is even though, you know, as I said before, Linux doesn't break. Sometimes, Linux doesn't break in everyday use for doing normal boring stuff. But once you want to step out of the normal boring stuff, once you want to do weird stuff, like, you know, these days, running Windows programs on Linux via Wine or Proton is, is kind of considered normal stuff. But it's not normal stuff on any other offerings. You know, you wouldn't sit on Windows and be like, why can't I run this Linux package? Oh my god, this operating system is so bad. Why can't I run this Mac OS um, program? this operating system is terrible. You know, that's an advanced thing. That's a weird thing to, it's kind of a weird thing to want to do. The fact that it's even possible on Linux at all is kind of amazing. And the fact that it's not, it's it's seamless enough and easy enough at this point with Wine and Proton that it's considered to be a normal, easy behavior that should be seamless and is weird if it doesn't work is crazy. It's a, It's kind of miraculous, right? that we have this compatibility layer like it shouldn't exist by all means it shouldn't exist and it's amazing that it does but once you step into that realm of doing weird shit that's when shit breaks once you want to dive into customizing you know once you're like okay kde as default stuff is fine i've changed my wallpaper i've changed my theme but now i want to dive into to proper hardcore racing or like you know, uh, Firefox is fine, but I want to make my own cute browser configuration or any of these sorts of, you know, I want to run this particular game that isn't working by default through Proton, you know, something like that. Once you step out of the normal basic stuff you're going to want to do with your computer, then it becomes a challenge. And I don't want to lie to people and say it, it's not a challenge. I think that these sorts of, you know, and you could argue that Windows is more versatile in this sense, right? Like more things are seamless on Windows than they are on Linux. And that's just due to popularity. 
more things are developed natively for Windows. Windows has a much larger customer base, a much larger support base. There's lots of incentives to make things seamless on Windows. There's not that many incentives to make things seamless on Linux because it's already assumed that Linux users are more technically capable. So I don't want to lie to you and tell you that, that everything is easier on, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to lie to you and say that, right? But the thing is, that's the point, that's the fun. Linux is a, it's a, it's not just Linux, but computing itself should be a game. It should be something, something you do because, because it's enjoyable and challenging. Not something you, where it just, you know, sometimes you don't want it to get in your way. I, I understand, right? Like if all of your friends are, are loading into a Apex lobby and you're like, sorry guys, I can't play Apex. The anti-cheat doesn't work on Linux. That's that's mad. That's that's that that makes you mad. I get it. That's frustrating and bad. I will, I agree with you. That is bad that it doesn't work. Um, it's Apex is it's like who, whoever makes Apex's fault that it doesn't work because they don't develop for Linux. But it's understandable that they don't develop for Linux given that it's much more work than it's worth. I understand it all. You know, that's just the way things are. Um, <clears throat> but that's yeah, that's very frustrating. And if you have a situation like that, you probably isn't probably not for you. Or at least dual boot, you know, makes sense. Everything is reasonable, perfectly reasonable. And, you know, there are situations, like I said, with my phone, right? Like my phone, I don't want my phone to get in the way. I don't, I don't want to have to think about configuring my phone because it's really bad, right? Like today, uh, not today, I don't know why I said that. Um, like when I first got the phone, I set it up with TUI, right? Which is this um, launcher, which I really like and you should all check out. Um, and by default, TUI looks kind of terrible. Uh, I used it in that default state for years, but because I got the new phone, I decided, you know what, since I've got it and I'm doing setup stuff anyway, I may as well try and rice it. And I got to tell you, even just doing like to rice any program, which by the way, it's amazing that you can rice TUI and it's very, um, cool, right? That you can go like, yeah. Uh, but unlike on a you know, normal Linux install, it would have taken me five minutes. I would have, you know, gone into a terminal, vim, the text files, changed the values, saved it, restarted the, the, the program, and it would have been up and running like that. But just editing text files on a phone is fucking painful. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. And having to get around all of the locked down features of Android is fucking terrible. The fact that, that this app has to work in obscure, obtuse ways, not necessarily, you know, partially because it's not very well designed in some aspects, but also in large part because they have to design it like that because Android is very limiting without super user access, which I have not booted my phone. I don't even know if it's possible to root this phone. Um, you know, that's, that's frustrating. I don't, I don't want to have to deal with issues like that on my phone, especially because the point of a phone is that you can whip it out at any second you're generally going to want it for like split second stuff like i'm lost uh give me a map right i don't want to have to if i'm lost that is not a good time to have to troubleshoot why the map isn't working if i am you know uh <clears throat> trying to take a call not a good time if i'm trying to respond to a message not a good time if i'm trying to uh i don't know listen to music when i go outside not a good time if i'm trying to take a picture Probably need that picture to be taken right now. Probably not a good time to want to troubleshoot a camera app. Don't want it to open slowly. Don't want it to bug out and have to fix it. You know, phone, I understand. I want it to just get out of my way. But a computer, a real computer, I, I mean, that's a fundamental feature of phones because phones suck. I, I can't, uh, you know, get this across to you as enough. The reason that phones have to get out of your way is because they fundamentally suck as an idea. If they were good, they wouldn't have to get out of the way. It would be it would be a whole different thing. Normal computers are good. And so I don't want them to get, you know, them sort of getting out of my way means them limiting me, means them like doing a bunch of shit in the background that I'm not in control of or even aware of that's too complicated or or obtuse for me to understand or or really know about. You know, I don't want that shit. Get that shit away from me. This is my shit. I don't want my shit to be doing stuff without me telling my shit to do stuff. I don't know. So stupid rant. Can I tell you a pet peeve of mine? Rounded corners. I hate rounded screen corners and all of this shit because they don't really exist. Sometimes they do. Okay, my phone has rounded corners on the screen and those are real. But but most of the time, you know, that's that's expensive and pointless. Most of the time, rounded corners are just square corners that you can't see because they're covered by a bezel of some kind. I hate rounded screen corners. Why, why am I cutting off? Even if it's just a tiny, tiny part, 
why lose that for no reason? It's it the way the text. Okay, when you're using a computer, you're mainly looking at text and video. Text is designed to be displayed on a square sheet of paper. Video is designed for square aspect ratios. It just doesn't make any goddamn sense. You have a long bit of text at the top or bottom of the screen, and the fucking edges are getting cut off because the corners are rounded. It's stupid. Imagine you have. I mean, sure, bad design to have text. You probably shouldn't have text right up into the the. The edges, right? But there's no reason to have. There's just no reason to have a radical. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't improve anything for anybody. It just cuts off space for no real reason. But you know, that's not that bad. Since it's just, a, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it. But what really grinds my gears is on Windows in in the computer in the software. <laughs> In the computer, the, the, when software windows have rounded corners on a display that doesn't, like I understand why my my uh, phone has a lot of rounded corner elements in the design because the phone itself has rounded corners, so they all sort of it all sort of flows together. I get it, I don't like it, but I, it makes sense to me. When motherfuckers are on a laptop and everything is like rounded off, motherfucker just have a square corner, normal fucking corner. Rounded corners look so bad. They don't look good. It means that windows don't fit together neatly. It's just bad. I don't like it. And then the worst is when when you see someone's fucking desktop race and it, and some windows have rounded corners and some have square corners. Oh my God, that triggers me so hard. At least be consider if you're, look, rounded corners are already a sin in my books. They look awful. Even on my phone where it makes more sense because everything's already rounded. Uh, you know, I still don't think it's good. I would rather the notifications and icons were just fucking square because that just makes more sense to me. I, there's no reason for them to be rounded off other than style over substance bullshit. There's, just have them be square. Have a thing be square. It's easier to do squares. They look fine. You don't have to get fancy with it for no reason. I don't like them at the best of times, but I can put up with them if it's designed to fit into a form factor that is rounded. But there's no excuse for having it on a laptop that doesn't have rounded corners on the screen. And if it does, it shouldn't have rounded corners on the screen. And on top of that, there's absolutely no reason to have fucking some windows round and some windows sharp. That, that grinds my goddamn gears. You know what else grinds my gears? When you go on, when you go on people posting their desktop and, and they have, you know, window borders that are either way, way too fucking wide or way too fucking thin. Thin is less bad, but still bad. Really wide is unforgivably bad. I don't understand that. It's stupid. What are you doing? Unless you want a tiny, tiny screen, in which case it makes sense, but you're not. Why have really, really wide window borders? Shrink them bitches. You don't need that. And the really, really thin ones, they just create tension in the design. Because you, like, having, I, I don't know, it's stupid. Man, TF2 is making me kind of depressed. I played so much, I probably played over 10 hours of TF2. Too. Which might not sound that crazy, but for me, it's put, that's fairly unusually high amount. Probably more than that, even. Maybe over 12 hours of TF2. Like, can I check somehow? I don't know. I don't care that much. But I played a fuckload. I played TF2 almost all day with almost no breaks. Well, that's not true but I played for a long ass time. It wouldn't surprise me if I played 12 hours of TF2 today is what I'm trying to get at. Why the fuck did I choose? Why is the most fun and rewarding class in the game, Hybrid Knight, so underpowered and fucking impossibly hard? And why did I pick this fucking class to main? Like, it just needs a tiny buff. It just needs a little bit of a buff. It's not that difficult. I know how to, like, I don't understand. I, I, it's incredibly frustrating. TF2 is making me mad. Because, like, I, I play these these games and I come across good demo nights. And it's like, I can't, like, I can't tell what it is that they're doing differently from me. I really don't understand it. Like, I try and spectate them. And I, I, it looks like they're doing the same shit, but they're just relying more on their sword. Which I've been trying to do. They'd almost always use Islander. And somehow... Is what I don't understand is that whenever I islander someone, they they fucking like get shot away from me, and then I can't follow through. Like I go up to a, a, a guy, I and then and then they get like like the the they get knocked back by like they jump or whatever, and they get knocked back. But but these guys, you know, I watch these demo nights that I'm the good ones that I'm playing with, and it's like they they just. They don't even do it. It's like the enemies aren't even trying to hit them. Whereas for me, it's like I have fucking 150 health 
I'm too shocked by any reasonable class. And then they get flung away from me, so they're outside of melee range. And if I'm lucky, you know, if I'm particularly good, which has, it happens a lot, like this is like the default reliable combo, is shield bash, one swing of the sword, they get knocked back, then I switch to the iron bomber, read their movement, and hit them with the pipe. And I can pull this off, I wouldn't say reliably, but it's not unreliable as a combo. I definitely, it is definitely a strat that I use that is like, works sometimes. <laughs> it, it's, it, it takes a lot of, you know, cause you kind of have to hit the first pipe. You don't really have much recourse if you miss your pipes. You kind of have to hit it pretty much immediately cause you're gonna get hit a few times cause it takes so long to switch between weapons. But fucking, what am I saying? The problem with that though is that you don't get Islander heads when you get the kill with the Iron Bomber. And so it's like, what's the goddamn fucking point? Cause that like, I, I don't understand man. The only like, Hybrid Knight is a good class once you have five heads, but getting five heads, like, and even as a good class, I'm not, it's not even a top tier in terms of strength class once you have like five heads, depending on what shield you're using. But like, you're not a heavy, you're not like crazy OP just because you have, you know, unless you still have to be good. It's, it's not like the other classes, right? Like I, today I played some, uh, I actually experimented with a bunch of different classes today. I played some engineer for the first time on two fort. Uh, it's fine as I guess. Uh, I played, I played some scout in, uh, some some king of the hill maps played played a reasonable amount of scout scouts that fucking easy it's like playing scout is like it's like suddenly no one can hit you <laughs> you can just dance around them you know you don't have to try you don't have to like it's none of the other classes require you to try except for spy i tried spy a little bit for the first time and i was, and that's the closest thing to to demo night that i've yeah but even spy if you get caught in a bad situation you can cloak and run away to get behind enemy lines, you can cloak, you can disguise. You can't do that as Demo Knight. You don't have the option to put yourself in a positional advantage like that, except with the, the charge. But the charge is really limited. It's way more limited than than Spy's arsenal is. Because, you know, as Spy, you can cloak, you can dead ringer, you can uh, disguise. There's, there's a bunch of options. And... You know, not to mention the fact that you have a one hit kill option on anyone if you actually pull it off. Demo Knight, it's like you don't have cloak. All you have is this really limited mobility option, which you like the cloak bar, it, it drains, but it drains slowly and it refills fairly quickly. You, you don't use up all of your cloak all the time. You can't semi charge. You, you charge and then you have to wait 10 seconds or more. I forget how much it is exactly for your charge to refill, unless you're using the um, fucking Persian Persuader. But the Persian Persuader has big downsides for Hybrid Knight, because it, it massively reduces your ammo. Uh, so Persian Persuader aside, not really viable for me. Um, no one really uses it anyway, it's not very strong. You have this one mobility option, which is fairly strong, but incredibly situational. In that situation, it's very strong. But in others, you know, it's good mainly as an escape tool. But how do you get into position in the first place? It's really difficult, is what I'm saying. It's it's very underpowered, in my opinion. And I, I you know, I, I I think I'm correct about this. Which which I don't know, man. But then I don't understand how people are doing it. Well, I guess these guys have thousands and thousands of hours in the game. But then here's what I'm worried about: is that I have thousands and thousands of hours in Counter Strike Global Offensive. And I'm fucking trash at that game. I'm dog shit. I'm not even good. Like, I, I don't think I've improved in the last thousand hours of CSGO. TF2 is just going to be the same shit. I'm just going to be fucking bad for the rest of my life. I'm never going to have a single game that I'm good at. So I played some Scout today. I played some, a little bit of Spy. Scout, easy. Spy, hard. Needs more practice, if, but I'm honestly not super interested in it. Because a lot of waiting around, not really my idea of fun. 
NG, easy. NG, you're playing a different game. You're just playing a single player game. Scout, no one can hit you, so you can basically do whatever you want as long as you don't have absolute dog shit movement. You just have to have decent aim. I have decent aim. You don't even have to, like, it's not even hard because you won't have to go for body shots. The only thing that's kind of difficult is, like, managing your range against certain classes who can knock you back or, like, being aware of the, the what sort of range you want to be in for fighting various classes. Like, knowing just how to stay outside of Pyro's, uh, you know, range. Managing to get right up in a heavy's face so that it's hard for him to aim these sorts of things right um but you know it, it's 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 not difficult to hit two meat shots <laughs> it's not it's not hard to hit three shots on someone two three shots it's not hard um yeah obviously pyro is a is fucking easy pyro requires zero skill and then i also played some sniper today i haven't played sniper in ages but just just last couple games i was playing sniper bro sniper's easy <laughs> it's not even like you just click on them you don't like the only thing you have to worry about is that the is spies existing and it's like okay even if you do even if a spy does show up once in a while to kill you you're still gonna be getting like two three like without even trying you're gonna get two three kills in between each getting stabbed you're easily going positive right and you know all it takes to not get stabbed by a spy is to just have some awareness which you can't have perv you know people say that it's not actually true right like you need to i mean spies go invisible there's no like just have a just have awareness bro just to unscope from time to time it's like um you know that doesn't help when the guy you're looking for is literally invisible i think that's nonsense but you can definitely like it's very easy to spot disguised spies as, as sniper um yeah one thing I realized this time playing Sniper is you are fucking easy dubs against rocket jumping soldiers because their movement is so predictable. Like I've always thought those clips of snipers hitting headshots on rocket jumping soldiers is really impressive. No, it's actually really fucking easy. <laughs> like that's actually the easiest play. It's like borderline the easiest way to hit a headshot is on a ro Like those guys are fucking easy prey. And you don't, the thing is, you don't even have to care about headshots. Like, it just takes two body shots, really, to kill most classes. You don't even really have to care that much about headshots. So, you know, sniper is easy. Like, let's, like, I'm just talking from a KD perspective here, right? Just from a KD perspective here, it's easy to go positive as sniper. It's fucking trivial. It's trivially easy to go positive as scout. It's trivially easy to go positive as pyro. Um, it's it's trivially easy to go positive as heavy. Uh, obviously medic, you're not gonna get kills with, but uh, it's uh, easy. If it's easy to be to be a decent medic, it's easy to 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 be better. It's better that you're playing than not playing as a medic. It's quite hard to be a really good medic. It's hard to be really good at any of these class. But you know, with with hybrid knight or demo knight. It's hard to just be, to just go positive at all. It's really fucking hard. I, like, I, I, I've put well over a hundred hours into Demo Knight at this point, uh, slash hybrid night. Like, uh, over 150 hours, I think, which is, in the grand scheme of things, not that much. But most games, I do not go positive. And I'm trying. I'm not playing brain off. I am trying. And yes, I'm on Uncle Topia. The players are better there. But I see other people playing Demo Knight and they're racking up those Islander heads and somehow, you know, I can't kill them and other players can't kill them and I don't understand what they're doing differently. I just don't understand what they're doing differently from me. I, I feel like I should, I don't know, I hit pipes better than them. I literally hit pipes better than them. Like I see demo knights and hybrid knights and stuff who, who are doing well scoreboard wise and getting kills and like we, we, we get into pipe battles and i win i literally hit pipes better than them but it doesn't matter because they they can they can fucking close with this the islander and and for some reason i'm in cave like i don't know they're just better but i don't understand like it's fine if they're just better and i was like okay well then clearly you know if i'm playing csgo and i'm playing against the guy who's just better it's very obvious how they're just better i don't mind it because it's like Okay, I just need to aim better. I just need to, um, pay, you know, maybe use utility better. I need to have more game sense and uh, positioning. But in this situation, you know, aim is not super important with a melee weapon. 
obviously you have to have some aim, but it's not like CSGO, right? So it's not that they're just aiming better. Aim doesn't really play a part in, in melee. Uh, I don't understand what it is. I just don't understand it. And it's very frustrating because I see people who are good and I don't know how, I don't understand how they're good. It doesn't make any goddamn sense to me. <sighs> it just makes zero sense. And all the other classes are so much easier. And I bet if I just played normal demo, it would be so much easier. But for some reason, I, well, I know why. It's because the charge is so much fun. I don't, I want, since the charge is such a fun mechanic, it's very annoying to me that you have to trade off. Just to have fun in the game, to have this really cool, unique, fun movement mechanic, I have to trade off, like, being a ridiculously underpowered class unless I'm cracked. Because I guess I'm missing something that, that everyone else knows, or, or I don't, I don't know. Like, there's, there's this one mechanic, literally the mechanic that drew me to the game in the first place, the thing that made me want to play Team Fortress 2, it happens to be attached to a class which is just underpowered. Like, it's just nerfed for no reason. There is, like, they, they don't want Hybrid Knight to exist, I don't know. The, the fucking... You know, here's here's how you here's how you balance hybrid knight properly. It's very easy. You just have to make it so that the uh, the holster speed and the drawing speed, the switching speed between between your your sword is less fucking slow. The fact that it's so slow is honestly ridiculous. Um, that's the first thing. The next thing is that the Islander is the only sword that is meta because no other sword can give you any kind of benefits that come close to it. The only thing that comes close, for Hybrid Knight specifically, where you're not going to be purely relying on your sword, is the, the Claymore. The Claymore, if you want to do proper Gaelic pronunciation. I think that's how it's pronounced. Claymore. 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 I don't know. Claymore. That's probably how it is, right? Claymore. The Claymore. Uh, the extra charge range is actually really useful uh it just needs to be optimized for hybrid knight a little more uh like uh i watched a video about demo man weapon balance change ideas and one of the things they said was uh to, to i actually forgot what it was what was it i forgot okay i don't fucking care anymore was it to make it was to make iron bomber shots recharge your charge or something i fucking forget hold on i got a I gotta look at the stats, because I will remind me. Yeah, yeah, because currently it's m melee kills refill 25% of your charge meter. I think if, if fucking, if, if it, if the, if this sword just meant, if, if it just was just kills, refill 25% of your charge meter, it'd be way better. Way better. Because the, the slightly increased melee range of swords is honestly not worth what they think it's worth. It's really not worth what they think it's worth. They they think it's like, I don't know, man. Like, the Clay the More is, is clearly the hybrid knight sword. It's clearly meant to be the hybrid knight sword. And I switch between it and the Islander. But all of the good ones I see all use the Islander. Pretty much. I don't fucking... I'm, I, I don't know, man. I just... It's depressing. It's depressing to just not... It, it's depressing that all the other classes are so much easier. But, like, there's so much... I can't begin to explain this to you. They require no skill. <laughs> like, there's no... To be... To be... I'm, listen, I'm not shitting on it, right? To be really good at anything, in any class in TF2, requires incredible amounts of skill and practice. Every class has a really high skill ceiling. It's one of the things that's good about the game. But the skill floor of the other classes is way lower. You can be a decent pyro, a decent scout, a decent heavy, a decent medic, a decent NG, a decent soldier. Um, what other classes even are there? A, a decent sniper, even a fairly good sniper, with a couple of hours of practice. Like, you can be a decent scout with 10 hours of practice, I think. If you have experience in other shooter games, and you're reasonably confident in your aim, which I am. I, I'm not amazing, but scout and sniper, you know, hit scan weapons, it's it's not super fucking difficult to, to click on a, a guy. Right? It's not the hardest thing in the world. I think people, I don't, like, it's not even in the same realm to hit two body shots as sniper, which generally kills a lot of classes, especially if there's like full damage involved and stuff, compared to hitting 
two pipes where you have to read movement and lose your shots and predict the arcs. It's not like it's just so much harder to to be a a hybrid knight than it is to be anything else except maybe spy. Like even classes that are known to be fairly difficult, like snipe. Like for example, spy is I think considered the most difficult class in the game out of the nine normal classes or particular subclasses like trolldra for example trolldra requires excellent movement and precision however you get rewarded for playing spy you get rewarded for playing trolldra with a super powerful attack that is like an instant kill or a really powerful combo like a uh, combo pyro is is like a pretty difficult like a really good combo pyro I think that stuff's difficult but you get rewarded with this super powerful thing but l- like trolldra it's really hard to land the goomba stomp market garden combo um reliably you're sacrificing your your rocket for the rocket jumper you know you you have to land the combo you basically have no other options except that if you do land the combo it's an instant kill on most classes you 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 get the kill 100% of the time on on most classes sniper i mean sorry or hey, you know what sniper counts too, right? Hitting headshots on on moving targets is difficult. If they're far away, it's difficult. But you get rewarded with an instant kill on a lot of guys, or at least a shitload of damage if you hit it. Spy, you know, getting backstabs is really hard. It requires a lot of patience, timing, positioning, clever acting, and all of these other things. But you get rewarded with an instant kill. Demo night is just as hard as any of those other things if you're using the hybrid knight loadout where you only have you know eyelander 150 health tide turner iron roller right it requires just as much skill as any of those other classes as that i mentioned to get to close the distance and put yourself in an advantageous position as it does to land a market garden trolldra thing or to land a cool backstab or to land a uh, headshot as sniper you know Except you don't get the instant kill. You get fuck all. You get you get two to three sword swings to kill. You it's it's honestly it's un, it's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of fucking ridiculous. And what reward do you even get? Slightly larger melee range. It's it's barely noticeable in almost all such circumstances that your melee range is slightly longer. It's it's barely fucking noticeable. It barely makes a difference. Like, it's not the class isn't viable as is. It's just that it requires way more skill than it should. Like, it's it's obviously a viable thing. There is loads of... You can go on YouTube and search up Demo Knight TF2. <laughs> you can find loads of videos of people being absolutely cracked at Demo Knight and Hybrid Knight. They're, they're ridiculously good. You can go into Uncle Topia lobbies and you'll stumble across them eventually. Right? These guys, are, they exist. They're clearly good at the game. They're clearly way better than me. Somehow. I don't understand it. I don't understand how what I'm doing is any really any different from what they're doing. You know, at first I thought that it was all about hitting pipes, but it's not all about hitting pipes. You know, hitting pipes is one part of it. And yes, I have a lot of room to improve in that area. It's one of the hardest skills in the game. Uh, but that's actually, you know, I think pipes are balanced well. They're, they're, high re- they're, they're difficult to hit, but the reward is proportional. Flat 100 damage reliably is is a, is pretty good. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. It is much, you know, it is... The thing is that hitting your first pipe and hitting your second pipe on an enemy is, like, they're no more difficult than each other. It's no harder to hit the second pipe than it is to hit the first pipe, you know? It's the same thing twice. They're both equally difficult. Whereas with melee, it's actually pretty easy to to get one melee hit on any on someone. If you just charge in to an enemy, the chances are, especially if you're using the tide turner so you can, like, not go in exactly straight lines they can't just shoot you on your way right you can get one melee hit in pretty easily the problem is one melee hit doesn't fucking do anything it's the the follow-ups that are borderline that are just so hard i don't know how like I, i say hard as if like there's some skill that i don't know or that i haven't practiced enough but i don't know what that skill is they just go like when you hit them they just move away from you and then you're sitting duck and then if you have Iron Bomber am- ammo loaded, you might be able to finish them as they're running away. If you don't, you are just fucked. You, a lot of times, you will end up in a situation where you're trying to play 
with the iron bomber, you're sort of hanging back and shooting pipe. Maybe you're trying to hit a pipe, the guy decides to come towards you, so you try and hit another pipe. You maybe hit it, you maybe don't. Maybe there's a couple of guys. Maybe you turn a corner and you realize that the one guy you thought was going to be there is actually four different guys. Suddenly, you physically don't have enough weapons to do that dodge damage to kill them. You can't really run away because you charged in after the guy. You've used up your charge. You miss your pipes or there are just too many enemies so you can't hit all your pipes like you you charge in you don't know what's going to be around that corner sometimes you charge uh, you and it's just one guy and you get the kill but sometimes you charge and there's four guys waiting for you you have no way of knowing there's no level of game sense or anything you have no way of knowing what's going to happen even experienced players make this mistake i've seen it on youtube you, you know you, you you're just taking a risk with no idea what's going to happen and you don't have the ability to do that much damage and so you what, ha what ends up happening is you miss your iron bomber shots and then you go okay i gotta charge him to finish him off with melee because otherwise he's just going to shoot me. I have to either retreat or charge in. And so you think, well, I hit one shot, so I'm going to charge in because he's minus 100. He's definitely killable in either one or two melee swings. Definitely doable. So you charge in, and it turns out two of his buddies are there. Or you charge in, and he gets knocked back by the shield bash or by your first melee swing, and now he's out of melee range, right? You have no iron bomber ammo loaded. You are too far away to do melee damage. You have no charge. There's nothing you can do. It. No amount of being good at the game can save you in this situation. You can't good yourself out of the situation. That is just a die. That is just dead. You're just dead. There's no option. You have zero options. It doesn't feel good. Trust me. That does not feel good when you're in this situation because the iron bomber loads so slowly. It reloads so fucking slowly. And you only have four pipes. You only have. It's it's ridiculous. Man. The clay the mom needs a it needs a buff okay it's been a day it's been a whole day since i recorded a thing so i'm gonna update you on everything that's happened i played a shitload of team fortress 2 and today i actually did okay i actually had a pretty good day today in tf2 we we got some solid dopamine uh I hit my pipes sometimes, I hit my Islander stuff, I still am molding and think that everything is underpowered, but also I should just get good. If it's under, no one's forcing me to play the class and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I played some Scout as well, played some Sniper. Sniper, I had fun on Sniper. Sniper is fun. Scout is also fun. Anyway, that's the TF2 news for today. I played a shitload of TF2. Uh, had some more Huel. Huel was good today. I don't know what it was, but I think yesterday I had the... Or, sorry. Day before yesterday, I had the, the Bolognese Huel and thought it was whack. Today, I had the Bolognese Huel and whatever it was, my scoop must have gotten in much more powder than it did last time. Or perhaps I... Well, that's definitely part of it. And maybe I put in less water. The sauce was much nicer and thicker today and more flavorful. Um, I also had a korma and that was good too. The huel, it's growing on me. I am actually starting to like the flavors of it much more than I did at first. Uh, you, you think? I think you want to fill it a little bit less water than they tell you to. Uh, but yeah, it's growing on me. I'm starting to actually enjoy it. I'm still not convinced that it's good value for money, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, next, anything else? Uh, did a live stream. Live stream had fun, had fun streaming. Uh, new people, welcome to all the new chatters. And uh, yeah, now I want to talk about some bullshit because it's my podcast and I can talk about whatever the fuck I want no matter how stupid it is. Uh, and the thing I want to talk about is is stupid streamer drama because uh, I'm invested in this for no reason. I'm not even that invested in it. I just want to call out hypocrisy of people who I see as being in positions of authority and power, even though it doesn't really matter because they're just fucking Twitch streamers and... Who really cares? Except it's not actually the Twitch streamers that I have a problem with so much as it is uh, capitalism. <laughs> uh, so here's the current or one current Twitch controversy. There's a streamer by the name of QT Cinderella, one of the biggest female streamers who doesn't do uh, like hot tub ASMR bikini streams, right? She just does normal streams like a normal person. She's been fairly outspoken in terms of like uh, feminism on and like women's experience online, especially in like Twitch and space and so on, which is fine and reasonable. Uh, the problem with it is that she's a liberal feminist who doesn't have any conception of like the theory behind what she's talking about. And I know I'm literally mansplaining 
feminism to a woman, uh, but I don't really give a shit, fuck you. Uh, so as an example, uh, she got really upset recently because a fellow streamer who she actually knew personally, a streamer by the name of Atrioc, was caught having having watched um, deep fake pornography of other streamers, not even Cutie, just other streamers. He was caught with a page open that had um, deep fake porn of other streamers. Now, personally, I have nothing against deep fake porn. I think anyone who does have something against deep fake porn is retarded. Uh, I don't think there's anything about consent because nothing is happening to you. You you don't get to consent for other people's actions. That's fucking retarded. Um, so you know, I I think anyone who has a problem with with uh, deep fake porn of them as some sort of violation of consent uh, is stupid. Uh, Cutie made a very big fuss about this. Basically forced Atrioc to cut off their friendship with certain people. Um, made a very big deal, big stream where she cried on stream about how difficult it is for women on the internet, revealed that she pays uh, thousands of dollars each month to keep her in, like, bribe money to keep uh, deepfake sites from not hosting her shit, right? She pays them money in order to have them not host her shit. This is obviously fucking retarded. If you don't like the industry, why are you paying a shitload of money to them? You are literally supporting, like, you're supporting the industry more than anyone else except the people who actually run it. That is the worst thing you could possibly be doing, is literally paying them money to keep their their shit going. It's so obviously stupid, I don't know how it's, how you, you know what I'm saying? It's so obviously the worst thing to do. The real thing to do is to grow a pair and be like, who fucking cares? It's just a deep fake. It's not even me. It doesn't matter. What are you going to do next? Come at someone for imagining you naked? Anyway, the hypocrisy was she got very upset about this, then proceeded to host an event called the Streamer Awards. Now, the Streamer Awards is fucking cringe because it's a fucking award show for streamers where they just invite themselves and give each other awards. It's stupid. The Oscar, it's like they all of the normal award shows are already extremely fucking stupid, and they made of one where they, t- it's very silly. It's like they take themselves way too, si- it's like, bro, you don't get a fucking award. What are you doing? You're playing video games and talking to a camera. You're not, what are you fucking doing? And none of the good streamers ever go to these awards anyway, or win or anything. Like, Northern Lion, the only person who deserves Northern Lion and Jerma don't fuck. Actually, Jerma did win an award once, but who cares? It doesn't matter. Awards, uh, uh, awards shows are retarded, and they're extra retarded when it's for fucking Twitch streams, bro. It's a Twitch stream. We mean an award for a Twitch stream. Are you stupid? They're just just patting each other on the back and sucking each other off. Oh, look at you! You're the best streamer. What the fuck is this? So stupid. Um. So this this award show has a big ceremony with a proper venue rented out and a proper camera crew and everything that you would expect from a boring TV award show because Twitch streamers want nothing. These sorts of Twitch streamers, not all Twitch streamers, but this particular brand of Twitch streamer that QT and uh, Ludwig and that sort of ilk, they just want to be TV. They they just want to do TV shows as much as possible because that's what. They're just trying to emulate it. So it just feels like a TV show, except bad because the hosts are all fucking streamers and don't know what they're doing. Because being a good streamer does not make you a good host. It is a different skill set. Um, so the reason I bring that up is, aside from being stupid on its own, the event was also sponsored by a company called Fansly, who have sponsored multiple other Twitch events. They're, they are a big sponsor of Twitch events. Now, Fansly is OnlyFans. It's, it's a different brand. It's the same thing as OnlyFans. It's a subscription-based porn website. Um, and, uh, you know, th- there's another bit of controversy, which is people are very mad at a streamer that I really don't like. I really do not like this person. It's a guy called Aiden Ross. I think Aiden Ross is absolutely fucking retarded. I think he's one of the worst people on the internet. People are very upset with him because when he was streaming on a different website than Twitch, a website called Kick, which is a competitor to Twitch, to show how loose the rules were on Kick and how he wasn't going to get cancelled or banned, he pulled up porn in front of his audience on stream. Now, his stream consists of a lot of underage viewers, and so people got very upset about this, that he was showing his underage viewers porn, as if they're not already watching porn themselves, but, 
you know, that aside, I understand why you're upset with this. That's a reasonable, I, I don't think that's too, you know, yeah, sure. He was an idiot for doing that. He's a fucking idiot. I'm not going to play defense for him. However, the hypocrisy is that Q- QT Cinderella uh, and Ludwig, her boyfriend, both also have fan bases full of underage people and they're advertising a porn website directly to them. You do not get adverts for porn websites on daytime TV for a reason. Uh, um, not to mention, you know, that the, a lot of people are, are defending this by saying, oh, oh, OK, so you can see the hypocrisy here, right? Which is uh, if if you're going to complain about one person showing porn to their audience and you're going to complain about uh, deep fake porn being promoted, because that was the big deal, right? It's not just that the Atrioc watched something. It's that like him watching it drew attention to it and promoted it. That was what QT was really mad about. Um, because apparently it's like that evil or that you can't even, it's unmentionably evil. Um, so th- that was what QT was mad about, that it was promoting it. Whereas she is then obviously promoting a, a porn service to her underage fan base as well. A porn service which allows you to sign in with your Twitch account without an age check, by the way, just to point that out. Um, you know, think that might be worth men- mentioning. Um, obviously, the, the default, uh, you know, pre-programmed response to this is that it's about consent and that you don't consent to deep fake pornography but if you're posting um porn of yourself on fansly you're consenting therefore that one is completely okay the other is completely not okay um as i've already established deep fake pornography isn't a problem because it's not you but i can see how you'd have a difference of opinion on that however um anyone who's done any fucking research or thought about it for a split second knows that uh platforms like only fans and fansly are not fucking good uh they are literally pimps they are digital pimps you know what a pimp is a pimp is someone that you have to if you want to be a prostitute you have to or a sex worker whatever they call them these days you have to work under a pimp who gets a cut of your uh money that you earn that is literally what fansly does if you upload your own pornography to fansly uh, your you, the fansly monetize itself by taking a cut of your income it's a pimp pimps are not good for for sex workers pimps are exploitative this is not a good thing to be promoting okay uh these websites are famous for being exploitative anyone who says otherwise is blind just because someone like consent is not the end of the story consent is very important but there is something uh, called like decisions made under duress uh in other words like uh you have to consider what sort of options are available to people um, in in an in an economy in an econ- economic situation like this. Uh, like, for example, if if you're going to a really really shitty job, right? Let's, which is basically what sex work is. Like, sex work is mostly a pretty shitty job. Sometimes it's a really good job. Some people get a lot of value out of it and whatever. But for most people, it's kind of a sh- it's either a neutral to a shitty job, depending on what sort of stuff you're doing and whatever. Right. If you're going to a shitty job, it would be very bad for someone to come up to you and say, well, you consented to working there, therefore nothing is bad. Right? If it's like, well, look, uh, sure, your boss is taking most of the money that you make, you're working ridiculously long hours for low pay, uh, and, you know, though you're, etc., right, and the work environment is hostile towards you or something. But, hey, look, you chose to work there, Bo, you have to pay the price. That's not quite how it works, because... People don't have ultimate free choice over what sort of job they get. There just aren't that many jobs to go around. Maybe your circumstances mean you don't have that much qualifications, or maybe you do have qualifications, but there just aren't that many jobs available. There are so many, many reasons why you'd be trapped in a job that you don't particularly like. Uh, It's the same for this. You can say that uploading to Fansly is completely consensual, but if you want to actually make a career off of, um, you know, online sex work, you basically are forced onto a small handful of platforms. These platforms are well known to be exploitative. They are run by capitalists for profit, and that profit is exploiting the workers, literally in a I know I'm being a communist here but uh, in a very literal sense they are pimps right they they take the money that other people earn by doing sex work that is what pimping is uh, but you can't do make any money doing sex work online unless you're on these platforms so that choice you know sure you consented but that choice was made under duress you don't really have another option uh, the second thing is that these websites are known to uh, be somewhat predatory on both sides of the equation. They're known to be predatory on uh, lonely, often neurodivergent male user base. Uh, they're known to be de- predatory on uh, trying to coerce 
women into working for them. Uh, it, for example, no one makes money on OnlyFans. No one makes minimum wage on OnlyFans. About a tiny, 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 tiny percentage of the top creators actually make minimum wage doing porn on OnlyFans. The vast, vast majority of people make fucking nothing. They work relatively hard and make fucking a tiny bit of extra money on the side, okay? That is not acceptable. That Like, that is exploitative. Uh, this is like a gig economy bullshit. Uh, the fact that this is normalized is bad, and if you're promoting a service that does this, I'm sorry, you. I don't want to hear you taking the moral high ground on anything. Cutie's defense against this in tweets that she deleted was, look, Fanly was the only sponsor. If they didn't sponsor us, the event wouldn't have happened. Full stop. That does not make it okay in any fucking sense. Then maybe the event shouldn't have fucking happened. No one forced you to do it. You're just making an event to suck off your other streamers for no reason other than your own ego and pride, okay? You, you're like, oh, well, look, I had to promote the website that exploits women because otherwise I couldn't be special. What are you fucking talking about? That is that is not good. Uh, these these websites like OnlyFans and so on are, are not... See, it's not secret that they're exploitative. Everyone knows this. Uh, they are less exploitative than the porn industry used to be. I agree with this. If you want to argue that, I will 100% accept it. Uh, you know, the, the sort of traditional porn industry was fucking and still is, still continues to be, uh, fucking atrocious for women. Uh, it's not good. Uh, atrocious, look, it's not great for men either, uh, but let's be honest, it mainly affects women, at least in straight porn. In the gay porn industry, there's much more exploitation of men. Uh, um, yeah, lots of uh, coercion into doing hardcore scenes that you don't want to do, shoots, the, uh, lots of abuses behind the scenes, lots of terrible things. That is definitely minimized with platforms like OnlyFans and Fansly. Uh, that doesn't make them good. It just makes them less, slightly, slightly less bad. But it doesn't make them less. It doesn't make them not exploitative. They are definitely still exploitative. Specifically, exploitative of women, coercing, co co coercing them into selling their bodies and exploiting their labor to make a profit, and lying to them with the myth that you can make a good living off of this for cheap and easy. When in reality, it is not actually easy free money it is quite difficult highly ridiculously competitive uh almost no one makes a living off of it even minimum wage which barely even counts as a living in america these days uh you know it's a, it's a lie and it, even in that lie it's digital pimping not to mention uh as qt has previously said okay here's another thing you ready this is just an extra layer of hypocrisy because the stuff I said right now, that's fairly radical, right? The stuff I'm saying right now, you have to be kind of a, a, a pretty lefty to, uh, you know, agree with it. Uh, so I'll just use Cutie's own hypocrisy, which is that not so long ago, Cutie was railing against hot tub streamers uh, and people, streamers who hard promoted their OnlyFans because she was saying that there's this sort of trickle down effect where if it's expect, if it becomes a norm that every female creator on Twitch is, uh, you know, has an OnlyFans. It just creates an environment where any female streamer is like inherently sexualized by by their audience. They're like, if you're a female streamer, you're gonna get people in your chat asking you, do you have an OnlyFans? Like, etc. You're just seen as a sexual object. It's normalized that that's what it means if you're a woman streaming. She used to go on tirades about this, and rightly so. You know, I think that's literally that's very true. Um, that is, I think she identified something completely correct there. Uh, you know, I I wouldn't want to fucking be a woman and streaming on Twitch just being a, trying to be do normal shit and have people immediately like do you have an only fans implying that like you know they're only coming to watch me because they think i'm gonna they're gonna be able to see me naked like that would that would be kind of fucking annoying if i was a female streamer i can imagine that that would not be nice to go through uh so hold on a second it's bad when uh, certain streamers promote their only fans, but hold on a minute, it's suddenly good when you promote Fansly, which is just the same fucking thing, because they sponsored your event. In other words, you have principles until someone pays you money to get to not have principles. What is that? What is that? You you have principles until someone pays you money to not have principles? That's ridiculous. I, I want to clarify. I don't really give a fuck who or what or when any of this shit is happening Right, because the ultimate answer is that the fact that 
Fansley is exploiting the labor of their creators, you know, only matters if you think that sex work is in some way like fundamentally different from other forms of work, which some people do. I'm not going to come with a particularly hard stance on that, right? They're like all labor under capitalism is exploited, right? But they're like sex work is in particular this thing that shouldn't be commodified. The sex, in, sorry, like sex in particular shouldn't be commodified. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what sort of opinion anyone will have about that, that it's like particularly bad that platforms like Fansly are exploiting sex for money worse than other platforms taking money from their creators, like Twitch, for example, if it's not sex related. Now, I, again, I'm not going to come down on any particular side of this argument. Um, the, the fact is, any company ever promoted is going to be exploitative in some sense. Uh, and so, you know, it, it would be impossible to get funding to do anything. Not that you need... I mean, my point would be that these big event streams like fucking uh some of them are good most of them are bad the ones that germa does are good that's pretty much how it goes um but listen i like the germa dollhouse stream but it's not as funny as like average it's just a, like i don't know it's interesting all right I'm, I'm not neither complaining nor particularly happy about any of this um but like whatever if you want to do some sort of event stream you need to, to have a sponsor to afford it. Should these event streams even exist? If that's how they work, a lot of them don't even make money, uh, don't even make back their money. I don't know. I guess if people want to make them and people want to watch them, then whatever. The problem I actually have is not with just showing a sponsor that's kind of weird, right? That's not the, that's, shouldn't fundamentally be the responsibility of some streamer it should be regulated properly by an advertising standards agency. There should be some sort of government regulatory body that is saying, no, you're not allowed to advertise a porn website to underage fans. That is not okay to do on whatever, right? If that's something that you think is is ethically appropriate, that, that like that doing that is bad, then that should be the role of government regulation, not necessarily... I mean, we're only putting the onus on the streamer because it's this, the government is too fucking slow to regulate anything about the internet ever, and they don't care, which is fine, I guess. Uh, you know, whether or not fans, I'm never going to fucking participate in any of this, right? I'm not, I'm, I myself, and I would hope you too, are never going to give money to an OnlyFans bitch, okay? You, there is no reason to ever do it. And I would hope that you're smart enough to see that. Uh, you are not supporting anyone. You are... It's bad. Let's just move on. Don't do it. It's you're, you're an idiot if you do it. Uh, you also probably shouldn't be giving money to successful Twitch streamers. If you want to give... If you want to donate to small streamers, that's fine and reasonable and good. But any of the top streamers, you probably shouldn't be giving them money. They already have deals with Twitch. They're already making millions. They're all millionaires. It's insane to donate to a millionaire. Like, just think about what you're doing right now. Normally, when you donate something, you're donating it to a charitable cause or someone who needs the money. None of these people need the money. I don't give them your Twitch donations. I've only ever donated to one Twitch streamer. His name is Simple Flips. He's a mid-sized streamer. Doesn't get that many donations. And I have watched thousands and th or hundreds and hundreds of hours of his content. I think it's I think that that's reasonable if it's a smaller streamer. That actually the money from donations actually affects their ability to pay rent and so on. That makes more sense to me. But giving money to top streamers makes no fucking sense to me. In fact, I think they should turn donations off. I think it's kind of weird that they even have that as an option. Uh, anyway, don't give anyone your money for bullshit is what I'm saying here. You already know this. I don't need to, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't need to fucking give you self-help advice for, sorry. The point I was actually trying to make is that I don't have a problem at like, I'm, I'm, although all of the, the stuff I previously said about ethical concerns is true, you know, I'm logically sound, I should say. You know, I'm not, I don't really care that much about that. What actually annoys me is just the, the, the hypocrisy of Cutie Cinderella, that she has this big platform and she is just being a hypocrite 
and not taking accountability. That's what actually annoys me. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a feminist, if you're going to be a visible feminist who is making it a part of your persona and therefore on Twitch, weirdly enough, a part of your career, then the least you could do is do good feminism. You don't get to do one thing, act like you have principles and emotionally manipulate your audience while taking money to violate your principles in order to run some sort of event that doesn't need to happen just so that you can get money. Yeah, that's what annoys me. It wouldn't matter what principles they were, I just don't, I just find it hypocritical. Especially for the amount of money it is. Like, they're probably paying well, but let's be honest, like, look, if if you were there, like, I, I hate, I, I, I don't know, I hate this, like, get your bag culture. These motherfuckers don't need a bag, they're rich. They're literally already rich. If you're going to be a rich, fucking, out-of-touch, white woman Twitch streamer in L.A. and, you know, play play it being a feminist, I, it wouldn't matter to me if you were, what, what fucking ideology you were peddling. Just be consistent. That's what annoys me. It's not... It's It doesn't matter what it is. You know, I, I, I think... And maybe this is harsh, but I think a lot of the, you know, the, the, there's a definitely an exploitative nature to being an OnlyFans person. If you are, like, you are exploiting lonely young men and taking their money most of the time. I I don't think, I you know, I don't see that as a positive for society. I don't think you're, you're doing good by doing that. And, you know, some people might argue that, well, they need the money. But the truth is, most of them don't make that much money anyway, and their goal is to make more money, which means they're going to naturally do more exploitative behaviors where they egg on their fan base of lonely, often neurodivergent young men by implying, you know, the possibilities of a relationship or something. I think I think they're incel creators. I think these are the sorts of people who create... Um, they don't set a good example, is what I'm saying. Like, I'm not overly sympathetic towards them. I'm not completely unsympathetic. I understand if you if if making a little bit of extra money on the side, you know, that's ne- that could be very very helpful to some people. Sure, like you know, it is what it is. But I'm not saying that like oh these poor sex workers, right? I'm saying the whole situation's fucked. Everyone is fucked. The the men who feel entitled to uh, sexual content of women uh, women's bodies is fucked up. The exploitative porn industry is fucked up. The the, the plat- digital platforms who are digital pimps are fucked up. The um the, everyone involved is bad is bad. I don't want anything to do with any of them. So Osaka Syndrome sends me this website, which is a new social media platform because that's definitely what we needed is another one. Um which is called Cohost. And this is an independent social media platform uh, which is doesn't have any ads tracking data collecting and uh, doesn't have algorithmic feed. Uh, they're very proud of this. Uh, it is created by a group called the Anti-Software Software Club, uh, who I have discovered and found. And I am currently reading through all of the co-host terms of service to privacy notices and um yeah okay well you know here's what i'm here's what i'm saying okay 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 i just woke up sorry so they're trying to it's another group of guys who are trying to fix social media so normally the group of guys trying to fix social media look i don't fucking know okay it's a group of guys trying to fix social media by making another social media platform doesn't have the stuff they don't like on it that's fine i guess here's immediate fucking problem if i want to look at co-host to try it out i have to make an account this is bad i hate being forced to make an account for something i don't want a million billion accounts let me fucking look at the feeds just look at my friend's shit or whatever without making an account that's retarded like i can't you really use the website without fucking making an account that's dumb that's very silly. There's no reason to do that. It's a little bit silly. Okay, so that's one thing that's bad about the website. But that's not really the thing that's bad about the website. The thing that's actually bad about Coho's is uh, that they're not going to fix the fucking problem. Because they they really have done nothing to do that at all. They're, it's all sort of words without any fundamental change in how social media works that would fix it. Which is not that difficult to do, right? It, it, clearly the problem wasn't uh, it's too centralized because decentralizing it in the form of the Fediverse, uh, if you go on any Fediverse uh, 
place. They're all terrified of getting block listed, uh, you know, so that they all sort of act in accordance with each other. The decentralization doesn't really work because of this blocking instances feature. It means that uh, you're sort of, if, if the big popular instances decide to block you, that trickles down into all the other instances blocking you and you basically live in your own tiny space cut off from the rest of the Fediverse, which is pretty bad. Uh, and that's just for having, you know, rules or users that those other people don't particularly like or really anything because they're all it, it, the big block lists get passed around and those big block lists get curated by powerful, uh, essentially bureaucrats, party bureaucrats. Let's just call them party bureaucrats. Uh, and so Fediverse aside, this is a centralized. Um, so the big advantage of the Fediverse, right, and the advantage of decentralization in general, in architecture, in anything, right? The the decentralized things are resilient, right? It's harder to kill them. It's harder for them to die. This is why torrents are so good, because uh, if you're downloading a file from one server, that server goes down, you don't have your file. If that file is distributed across hundreds of different people's computers when you're torrenting it, it doesn't matter if some of them are online and some of them are offline, you know, you can still download your torrent as long as at least one node is still working. That's why the distribution is good. Um, a lot of social media platforms are very centralized, which means if at one point YouTube goes bust, all of the YouTube videos will be dead. If Twitter goes bust, you will lose all your tweets. Now, who the fuck cares about preserving tweets? I don't know. Apparently the people who made the Fediverse or not. I don't know what their philosophy is. Fediverse aside, okay? I, I don't want to talk too much about that. I just want to put it as a counter example, which is you know, de not super centralized, although still in effect somewhat centralized. Co-host is fully centralized. There's no activity pub protocol stuff going on here. It is purely just a normal centralized website platform thing. Uh, so that's, is that a problem or a good thing? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter because none of that really fixes the problem. So I go to the Andy Software Software Club's uh, website and read their manifesto. And, oh, they're, they're trying to say some fairly radical left-wing stuff. Uh, quote, as leftists. Right, there you go. I put, I put that in right there, okay? That's an exact quote from them. As leftists. Um, and then we feel that every cent that stays with the platform, particularly every cent that gets turned into profit and paid out to shareholders and dividends for the invaluable contribution of having had one months, is a theft from the people doing the work, who are people owning less than minimum wage while peeing in bottles and falling asleep at the wheel. Those are all links to, like, bad things that tech companies have done. We know that not everyone shares our approach on this issue, but we believe even left liberals can agree that the status quo, where platforms, companies lure vulnerable people into working for them, just to piece together a living and then juice these people for every cent they're worth is unacceptable and frankly disgusting. Okay, right. Now, uh, the thing is that social media platforms aren't anything without the content. What the, You know what would actually change this if you're a fucking lefty is you need to make a democratic fucking website. Is it that hard to wrap your head around? The website needs to be owned by its users. The platform, sorry. the pl Not just the site, but the platform as a whole needs to be at least partially owned by its users. And they need to have democratic say in how it's run. That's the real fucking problem here. But oh no, you're a pussy little bitch who doesn't want to do that. Or you're doing Stalin for some reason. <laughs> you're doing you're doing Lenin where you're like, well, for now, get, we'll have total control and then maybe we'll give you some democracy later. I don't know if you're going to be doing that. But look, co-host people, if you really want to make a left-wing alternative to, to regular social media, I, I support the no ads, no tracking. The, the no algorithm is a little bit of a weird decision, but it might be good. I don't know. Uh... But simply saying, oh, no, no, you see, we're getting paid well, so it's good. That's not acceptable. Or that's not a, a vi that's not a really a good alternative for the end user. Uh, yeah, that's not, uh, sure, you did the work of, of building the site, and you obviously deserve compensation for that. No one's saying you don't. Uh, but, you know, you, the, also, end users are doing the work of making your site actually a place where people want to be and providing you with money, as in... You're sustained by donations right now from end users. Uh, those donations ought to let you have give give them a share. 
Give them a share in the company. Give them something, you know? Give them some democratic ownership over the platform. Or you're just reproducing the exact same power structure, but you at the top are getting equal pay, which isn't fucking socialism. That's just nonsense, is what that is. I don't know what it is, but it's not fucking socialism, okay? You you want to make a... Like, you can't take the form of an old-school worker co-op and apply it to, to uh, social media... Because then you just end up completely uh, recreating, reproducing the power system that says that uh, users are the product, that we who use co-host are the product that you're selling to investors and so on, and to other dozen companies. But you're literally not doing that. So instead, you're just saying we are the product for nothing. You're not selling our data, allegedly, assuming you're not lying to us, you're not selling our data to ad advertisers, you're not... Um, you know, shilling yourselves out to uh, venture capitalists. So wh why why do you have to still maintain the uh, social order where there is a direct separation between the governance of the platform and the users of the platform? If you're really a leftist, you would create some uh, you know system for democracy. Is that that like that's literally the point? <laughs> Okay, so Van Neistat, Casey Neistat's brother, just made the worst video in the history of YouTube. And um, probably one of the worst videos I've ever seen. Uh, if you scroll down to the comment, it's actually fucking hilarious. If you scroll down to the comment section of the video, there is not a single person defending him. I've never seen that. You always get contrarians in these comment sections where someone will defend him. No one, not a single person. I actually implore you, before the video gets deleted, I'm gonna try and post this quickly. <laughs> the video might be deleted by the time this podcast comes out, I don't know. But go to his comment section of that video. It's called something like, oh, let me see. Balls on Parade, that's what it's called. Um, you know, and go to the comment section, it's literally only people shitting on him. It's only people just saying he's wrong. So, because the video might be deleted by the time you see this, because it's just so embarrassingly wrong, and ill thought out, and bad, so I will just briefly explain what he's saying. He's basically saying, um, the only reason that you're hearing about banking collapses as some sort of negative thing is just because the news wants to scaremonger. Uh, th these sort of bank collapses happen, you know, once every 10 years or so, and it never really has any sort of impact. Not Nothing ever bad happens, uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, if you care about it, you're stupid. It doesn't affect normal people. Uh, the only people, you know, it, it, it's, it's not going to matter. The most it will happen is, like, if you're rich, you can't afford another private jet. Oh, no. Like, you can't afford to buy the thing. Maybe there, he says this almost directly. He says, yeah, maybe there'll be a couple more tents in a couple more shitty neighborhoods. Like, who cares, right? Um, so th the video is essentially a very long-winded, kind of me-style manic rant about how uh, economic recessions don't actually affect anyone. Uh, they just happen once every 10 years and everyone's fine. So this is obviously wrong. <laughs> I think we all know this is wrong, right? We all lived through the 2008 financial crash and we remember the impact it had. And we're currently living through another sort of pretty shitty financial time. And uh, I can say just personally, I, I, I've noticed everything's 10 times more expensive than it was a couple years ago. That sucks. You know, I don't like the fact that when I go to the supermarket to buy fucking groceries, everything is way more expensive, but I haven't earned any more money. You know, I'm in a place of privilege. Hey, listen, I, I accept it. I'm, a neat, I'm in a position of privilege. If I was living paycheck to paycheck with stagnant wages, which is the majority of Americans, by far the majority of Americans, 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, okay? Uh, let's say you go to your boss and, and their wages are stagnant, uh, but inflation is rising, and bank collapsing increases the rate of inflation, uh, which is why it's bad, right? Um, so, uh, because, you know, the government pumps bunch of money into the economy, it's bad, right? All of this stuff makes inflation worse. Uh, or it causes a recession, which is deflation, but that's also bad for other reasons, because no one wants to put money into the economy, everyone loses their jobs, right? So, let's say you lose your job for one reason or another. Um, in either a highly, uh, a, a, an economy which, like right now, where inflation is too high and wages are stagnant, uh, so, you know, you might be like, I can't afford to live anymore because my rent has gone up and the price of living has gone up, literally everything has gone up, right? But my wages are the same. Uh, now I can't afford to live anymore, I'm gonna be homeless. So you get together with some of your buddies and you go to your boss and you say, hey boss, knock, knock, knock. 
Knock, knock, knock. Hey, hey, boss. Uh, can we have a little more money? Can we get a raise? Because uh, we cannot afford rent and food anymore. And your boss says, no, and if you ask again, I'm going to fire you. Uh, because that can happen in America. Uh, actually, it can't happen in America. Uh, they, if you go alone, it can happen. It can't happen in America if you go with a buddy. Know this. If you're American and you want to raise at your job, you have to bring at least one other person with you into your boss's office. If you go alone, they can fire you. If you go together, that's a violation of some sort of labor law. So always bring another friend with you or a colleague with you when you go into your uh, boss's office to ask for a raise or ask for anything. You should just always have a witness and generally be... I mean, hopefully, you, it, ideally, you're in a one-party consent state and you can record the interaction as well for future purposes. Your boss is never your friend. Don't kid yourself. Um, but that aside, right, so you go in, your boss fires you. You're one of the 60% of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck. That means you are one month away from being that tent. You are one month away from being homeless because you live paycheck to paycheck. That means you have one month of money. You don't have any savings. Uh, that, remember, majority of people in America are live like. So you have, you have nothing, right? You have one month to find another job. Can't find another job in that month, which is not that crazy. Okay, a lot of, it's not that easy to find a job right now in a lot of places, depending on where you live, right? You, you might not have an education. You might not have that much because maybe you grew up poor or something, right? or maybe, you know, any sort of particular circumstances. It, but even if you do, you know, it's a well-known phenomenon that there is lots of people with, who are well-educated, um, you know, college degrees and can't get a job and end up, you know, working uh, as a, a server or in Starbucks or something like this. And even then, you know, everyone knows this. This is a pretty common phenomenon in America right now. So the majority of you live paycheck to paycheck. What are you going to do? Like, what can you do? You have to definitely look for another job in one month or you are, you are done. You're done. You have no money. You're on the street. You're homeless now. Oh, but it's just a bank collapse thing. It doesn't affect anyone. Otherwise, you know, you're in a recession or you're in a situation like COVID, right? All these, all these tech companies overhired, literally treating people like cattle. It's like, oh, we hire them when we need them and we fire them when we can't afford them anymore. Well, there needs to be more labor protection laws so that's less easy to fire people. That's the case in loads of European countries. It's, it should be hard to fire people. It shouldn't be just like that, click, fired, done. Not, not possible, it shouldn't be legal. The fact that it's legal is abhorrent. Okay, it's like treating, it's literally, it's basically what slavery is, right? Slavery is when you just treat people like cattle or a machine, not a person. Yeah, sure, you can buy buy a machine when you need it and sell it when it, if it becomes too expensive. But humans aren't supposed to be treated like that. Shouldn't treat humans as a, as a, merely a means that is an end in themselves, as Immanuel Kant would say, or he would say something like that. Uh, yeah, the video is patently fucking stupid. I mean, he literally is so dismissive of homelessness. He just says, like, uh, this doesn't affect anyone, but there will be a couple more tents in a couple of shitty neighborhoods in basically what in whatever city you live in. He says LA, and then he says, or whatever city you live in. So he's basically saying, yeah, it doesn't affect anyone, even though homelessness will rise across the entire United States. What the fuck are you talking about, my brother? That is the definition of affecting anyone. He just is in his little bubble where he's like, well, that could never happen to me. I could never be homeless. If you're making bank, motherfucker, again, most people are one month away from not being able to afford rent. What do you think happens when you can't afford rent? And most homeless people don't, aren't rough sleepers. The, 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 only a minority of homeless people are actually living in tents. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not fucking happening. Most homeless people live in hostels, shelters, or couch surfing. Um, only a, a pretty small handful of people are, are living on the streets. And if even that is visibly rising, I think you've got a pretty big problem on your hands, buddy. So, you know, this guy's fucking ridiculous. Uh, he, his, he says, oh, you won't be able to buy the thing this year. Oh, well, no big deal. No, none of these people can buy the thing any year. There is no year when these people, when most people can buy the thing. <laughs> and then his argument is that when a bank collapses, the money doesn't just disappear. It gets spent and it goes into the hands of tech companies who create iPhones for everyone. And isn't that just wonderful? What he's actually saying there is that when a bank collapses, the money gets funneled into the hands of the already wealthy, wealthy tech corporations who don't need it. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a good system. How is that? How does that make any fucking? How can this guy be so delusional? I don't understand that he's that he thinks that's a good thing. You know, and then you know when the economy's in shambles, what does the government always do? The government always implements austerity, even though it's never never actually gotten anyone out of a recession. Uh, what does austerity mean? Well, again, 
it means less bargaining power for workers, because that's the point of austerity. Austerity doesn't actually help the economy. The point of austerity is to prevent capitalism from collapsing. Because in a crisis situation, imagine your economy's in shambles, but everyone has a nice, cushy social safety net. Suddenly, all of these workers uh, can fucking have a lot of bar- bargaining power, right? Because if your economy's in shambles, right? Stagnant wages, high inflation, uh, high unemployment, right? Uh, you you might get into a problem where <laughs> you know these these uh, workers can suddenly uh, band together and demand higher wages or better conditions or fewer hours or collective ownership of the means of production uh, <laughs> and there's not much that people can do to stop it because they have this social safety net you can't fight you you fire them they're fine they're not scared of being fired right and that's that's pretty much all, all you can do uh, other than like bring the police in to, to violently get them to stop which happens but um you know all of the union busting policies or anti-labor policies don't work once people don't desperately need a job if there's some sort of safety net if um there is lots of good social housing if there is uh if rents are kept low through some means i'm not necessarily arguing for rent control i don't know enough about economics to know whether that's a good or bad idea most people say it's a terrible idea i'm inclined to believe them but most people also don't understand how economics works so i don't know especially economy um so you know you you the free health care Free housing, uh, a good unemployment benefit scheme, perhaps universal basic income. Suddenly, you know, these workers who you're trying to fire can be like, well, hold on a goddamn minute. And if you do fire them, suddenly there's a bunch of disenfranchised people with plenty of resources out on the streets and uh, they're not going to be nice to you. <laughs> like they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not going to be friendly. Uh, but if you do a little bit of uh, austerity, you remove these social programs, you remove the subsidies, you remove all of these, these protections and safety nets, then workers can't afford to bargain for higher wages. Workers can't afford to bargain for anything because if they get fired, they're out on the street and they might die, they might starve. At the very least, they're pretty fucked. Suddenly, you remove the power of labor to organize. That's the point of uh, austerity, right? And that's what most people have to live through. In a recession, most people have to bear with the, I mean, it's class warfare. I don't use that term very often, but it is, the, it is a very, very obvious form of class war, directly from the rich to the poor. It is literally enacting military policies to fucking directly harm the working class. There's no, there's, there's literally no other explanation for it. I don't want to hear some fucking Econ 101 Noah in my comments being like, um, actually, uh, you have to uh, cut spending in a recession because the government has no money and they're going to go into debt. I don't want to hear one fucking person in my comment section saying that because you have no fucking clue how the economy works. Let me explain it to you, okay? Like you're, like you're a fucking baby, okay? If you go to the supermarket and you buy something that you can't afford, right, you're, and you have to borrow money, that's bad. You don't make money from doing that, right? You just spent money... If Johnny has buys 10 apples but only has, you know, not enough money, suddenly he's borrowing money, it's not good, right? He suddenly doesn't have enough money. But Johnny isn't a fucking government, okay? Governments aren't people. They work differently. If you spend money on social programs and welfare and all of these other, you know, things, as a government, surprise, you get the fucking money back and it's multiplied. Because the more money you spend on like social safety net stuff and all of this welfare stuff, that means uh, more people who can ask for higher wages, higher wages that can then be taxed for more. The more people that can, uh, you know, take time, uh, have more free time to innovate and work on their own projects, which can turn into, uh, you know, new businesses, uh, which you can tax. The more people who make more money, the more people you can tax higher, you know. Um, the, the more people who have more financial stability, right? Like, let's say, rather than just making them have higher wages, something like free healthcare, right? So it's like if they don't have to always keep an emergency fund so high in case they get into some sort of accident and need to pay for healthcare, or, uh, you know, people don't spend all their money on healthcare, suddenly you have this whole bunch of new money that can circulate in the economy, which you can tax. Uh, And it's literally, it's called a magical money multiplier. There are a few of them in the economy. One of them is the way banking works. Uh, Fractional reserve banking is a magical 
money multiplier. And deficit spending is also a magical money multiplier. Uh, <laughs> this is a well-known thing. How the fuck else do you expect uh, governments to pay back their, their, their debts if they're not spending the money on something in order to invest it into the economy, which they can then tax to get the money back, plus loads and loads of extra money, uh, which they can use to pay off their debts. I'm a tax and spend liberal, motherfucker. It's, this, is, this is not like crazy, wacko economic theory. It's really obvious. Okay, why would the government have to cut spending for a recession, which is something that takes place in the private sector, you fucking idiot. You absolute buffoon, okay? A, a, a recession isn't a, a b crisis of the public sector. It's a crisis in the private sector. It's not the government needs to cut spending, it's fucking corporations. The government needs to increase spending. There's never been a time in history. I mean, look, you can, you can, you can have your theory econ 101 bullshit as much as you like, but the thing is those models aren't based in reality. Like, let's do some practical economics for a second here. Do some actual real world economics, not just looking at the supply demand curves and thinking that that's how the real world works. Those are models that are supposed to approximate reality. If the models don't actually line up with reality, then you have to discard the models. I'm not saying those models are never useful. They often are useful, but they're not always useful. Sometimes you have to check if your model is actually working. And if it's not, you have to come up with a better model. If there has never been a time in history where a major superpower has implemented austerity and it has brought them out of a recession, then I think the idea that austerity solves recessions might be a little bit fucking wrong. Sorry, I've just been reading this book about recessions and austerity policy. Um, Van Neistat, you fucking idiot. You fucking idiot who doesn't understand how economics works. When, when banks collapse, their money is given to the rich. It's not distributed to the majority of Americans. Van Neistat, you say that America is this unprecedentedly rich country, richer than any country has ever been in the history of the world. Um, countries are not rich, people are rich. And only a tiny fucking handful of Americans are rich. I know it's a cliche to even use this phrasing at this point, that's how overdone it is, that's how much everyone already knows that this is how it works, but it's the 1%. The vast majority of wealth in America is owned by the top 1% of Americans. You, you, most Americans d are poor. Just because 1% of Americans are really unprecedentedly rich doesn't mean the country on a whole is actually rich. It just means there are a handful of really rich people that inflate the numbers. It's literally the Spiders Georg meme, right? It's like the average person eats uh, seven spiders a, a year in their sleep. Well, actually, the average person eats zero spiders, except for Spiders Georg, who eats uh, 17 billion spiders a year, right? That's the mistake you're making. You're making the Spiders Georg mistake of, of, of averages. That these are, there, are, there are a small percentage of people who make a ridiculous amount of money and the most of people make no fucking money. America is not actually a rich country because it's so unequally distributed. I know I'm making trad lefty arguments here and it's kind of boring, but we're doing economics. It's always gonna be boring. <sighs> this fucking guy, man, how can you be so stupid? I don't understand it personally. Guy reads books. I've seen him. He shows books that he reads. He never talks about, he, he, he constantly talks about how much book he read. He, he shows book on camera. He's like, look, look at me. I read this book and this book and this book, right? Um, motherfucker, what are you talking, how can you do, how can you read book? How can you read a book and not understand basic economics? Like this is not some fringe fucking thing. This is modern, current, cutting edge econ. It's not even that modern or current, but like, you know, this is like not some, this is the, this is the current trend in economics. What I am saying right now, and like behavioral economics as well, are the, the most popular current strains of economics. Post-Keynesian, um, like uh, left-wing economic theory and uh, behavioral econ are the biggest things in economics right now. Uh, if you study any of those things, you're going to have a high paying job. <laughs> I'm not saying fringe weird theories from Marx 10,000 years ago. I'm saying modern current shit from well-respected eco economists, you fucking idiot. Okay, so I think I've dealt with all of the Econ 101 retards in my comment section. You better not show up. You better not fucking show up and, and, and say no bullshit, I swear to fucking God, okay? I, I know what the fuck is going on with this, okay? You think I spend, you think I spend my time reading the most boring shit imaginable 
to ha- so that I can't be accused of being typical lefty who doesn't understand economics. Like, you think I spend my time doing that for fun? It's not fucking fun. It's just so that I can have this particular argument, this exact argument, and people won't say typical lefty doesn't understand economics. That's literally the only reason I do it. So don't fucking come at me with none of that bullshit, you fucking idiot. Okay, Van Neistat, you a retard, um, kill yourself, uh, anything else? Anything else to mention? I think that's it. Fucking ThinkPad inflation is real. I don't need a new ThinkPad. I already have three. Technically four, one doesn't work. Three for part, three three working, one for part, mostly working. One of them has a broken touchpad, but I don't use the touchpad anyway. So I'm fine ThinkPad wise for at least 10 years, I think. Um, yeah, I don't see a ThinkPad breaking that often. Uh, thing that sucks is in 10 years, <laughs> there are gonna be no fucking ThinkPads left. There are gonna be a single one. And unless someone takes up, I mean, there's a few different companies that are making decent laptops. System76 makes decent ones. Uh, there's one that I'm forgetting the name of right now. Uh, I am forgetting the name of this laptop company. <clears throat> But people have shilled, lap- shilled ThinkPads too hard. It is no longer a cool secret for slash G slash Entelman. Um, it is instead just well known. You know, there's a video right here called Why the Best Cheap Laptop is a Used ThinkPad, which has 820,000 views. You know, where, uh, where, where, let me, let me go on eBay right now and look up like ThinkPad X220, because that's a pretty common suggestion. Uh, oh, this, oh, that's parts only. That's bid. Let me see. Okay, let's go buy it now. I can get a good sense of what price they're going for. Oh, this is, uh, still fairly, uh, 254. That's pretty fucking expensive. 165 to 355. 489. Lenovo gaming laptop. This is not a gaming. So what the fuck are you talking? Wait, why is, oh, this is parts only. I was like, why is that one so cheap? You can still assemble them from parts if you if you're good with that stuff. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, they haven't. Yo, this one has core boot pre-installed. X two thirty with core boot pre-installed for one hundred and seventy pounds. That's that's almost that's kind of worth it actually. That is that is kind of a that is a good deal. How come this didn't show up when I was looking for a new ThinkPad? All the good ones are just fucking new. Okay, the problem is not, I mean, the price is inflated, but it's not as inflated as I thought it would be. But these things are going to be very expensive at some point soon. So ThinkPads, anyway, I'm just telling, I'm telling you, don't, don't, do not spread the news. Do not tell people to buy ThinkPads. We need to keep this secret so that we can still have them. It's too late. It's too late now. The secret's already out. But, you know, we can do our best to stop the spread. We can flatten the curve. Try, try and try and keep ThinkPads on the hush. Don't convince your normie friends to buy ThinkPads, which is what I used to do. I convinced Oldsmite to buy a ThinkPad, which turned out to be... Well, actually, that's not true. I sort of did. It's a bit more complicated than that. But that turned out to be fine, because that is now my ThinkPad. (laughs) Um, But I convinced my ex-girlfriend many years ago to buy a ThinkPad, and she bought three. Um, do not, do not get your normie friends to buy ThinkPad. Avoid at all costs, okay? These are... We need to lock these down. Or I could just start hoarding. I could just, I could just start hoarding. I mean, they are a hundred percent gonna go up. And okay, actually, let's not start saying that. <laughs> um. Anyway, this is not supposed to be about ThinkPads. So I gotta be honest. I've kind of flipped. 180 degrees on my stance on this Huel hot and savory stuff. Somehow it's really grown on me in the past, you know, it's now day four. I generally have a regular breakfast of eggs, cheese, and bread because I'm a white man, as, I, as I've as i taken to saying, because I'm a European white man uh, <clears throat> when it's convenient. Uh, and then, you know, I have Huel and then maybe something before I go to bed because the Huel's not that, I mean, just not that, you know, you you don't get that many calories out of it, but no, I've actually started to really like the taste of it. Um, The problem with it is that the, you just have to add slightly less water than they tell you to add. That's pretty much all it takes to make it good. Um, Is it good value for money? Uh, 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 (laughs) It's not amazing. Uh, It's not as bad as I thought at first, I think. It's a little more filling than I thought it was. It's not that, I don't know, honestly. 
are undecided as to whether it would. We'll have to see how quickly it takes to, to run out of these three packets that I bought. Because um, it might be kind of worth it. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll have to see. I, I still don't think it's great value for money, but it might it might be less bad than I thought it would. It might, it might just be okay. Um, and as for the food triangle, you know, right now I would say it does fit on the food triangle because it is healthy it is good and whether it's cheap i don't know i can't particularly say it's cheap but um it is quite taste uh which i i hadn't i didn't think in the past but it's it's really grown on me i actually really like the taste of it Uh, at first i did not like the taste but now that i'm sort of used to it and i figured out that you have to add slightly less water than it tells you to it's actually really good I've, I've, I've completely 180'd on it. I think it's really nice. Uh, at least the, f- the flavors that I got. The, the, my favorite ones is probably the bolognese, which was at first my least favorite one. Uh, but oh, yeah, honestly, it's, it's quite tasty. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and of course, the fact that it's easy to prep is a massive fucking advantage. The fact that I don't have to think about it. I just boil water and then time five minutes of letting it sit. It's so fucking... That's that's actually exactly what I wanted, and it's working exactly how I wanted it to. So I'm actually very happy with that. Uh, I've completely come around on this, this Huels, because I was just so frustrated with having to constantly think about what food I was going to eat, and have how I was going to cook it, and buy ingredients, and cook them. And I already talked about You heard me rant about this and it turns out and I thought this would be a solution and it turned out it was a solution I feel much better now uh yeah we're currently on hour 11 of this podcast um but I'm about to run this whole thing through audacity's truncate silence feature and uh we'll see where that puts us and yes that means that part of the video will be untruncated but i'm interested to see how how much will we save by simply truncating the silences so we just cut out three hours worth of silence from this video now i don't personally like the effect of truncate silence not in a video this long it's good in a shorter video but I don't like it in a video this long. I feel like the fact that there's no breathing room, there's no space uh, and flow and, and sort of calm segments in the video gets a little overwhelming for this many hours. But we do it anyway for some reason. Uh, and you know what? I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna end this video here. I think I'm actually gonna do it. I think I'm going to end the video here so that I can start work on the next podcast because I think I've I've said my piece, said my pieces, unless I don't want to truncate the silence. Maybe I don't want to truncate the silence. Hmm. I'm going to listen back to a bit, see how it sounds, see if I like it. If not, I'll undo it. Yeah, I'm undecided. I think it might be a little tiring for long sessions to have the truncate silence feature turned on, but uh, also I I do think it adds a level of compactness, production value, de bloating almost to the to the the podcast. It sounds, you know, there's there's less time. It doesn't waste your time as much. I mean. For as much as a one of my slice of life podcasts could not waste your time, you know, it's a. I can understand in some sense, you know, it's a, treating the audience, time as if it's valuable. But on the another sense, I can see how it's it could be tiring to listen to for a long time, so I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've 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 started making thumbnails for every single video I make. Uh, most of them, or not all of them, but almost every single video, I try and make a thumbnail, and they're mostly just you know very simple black text on a white background, in order to sort of minimize clickbaitiness. Just to try and, I mean, look, I did put a big red arrow, in in my most recent thumbnail, but. It's okay. The I feel like the arrow is actually pointing to something useful. I don't I don't know. Also, I feel like it's okay to clickbait that video cuz it's meant for people who are searching for for the cool the anyway. I don't know. Kind of a I can understand if you think that's a stupid thumbnail. But yeah, trying to keep the thumbnail simple just sort of text. Uh the reason is 
that uh, one day I was like, I should go watch one of my old videos just to to have relive because it's like a diary, you know. And I was scrolling through and it's all just my face in various states from the video. And it's like, I can't tell these videos apart. And also, you know, it doesn't help with the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of feeling that I'm very narcissistic for even having this YouTube channel. That like, I scroll through and it's just my face, my face, my face. It kind of, kind of feels weird to look at. So that's why I tried to make more normal, more normal, th well, not normal, but just thumbnails at all. Um, just thumbnails at all. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, wait, sorry, got distracted. We're finishing this video now. So this is the the outro, right, yes, winding down. Uh, uh, so, one thing I want to say before I leave is I have an idea for a video, but the video requires spending money on something. It requires buying a product for about... It depends, but probably around 60 to 80 pounds. I, the, the price might change a little bit, but it requires buying an actual product to make the video. It'll be the first time that I've... It's an, it's an electronics product. It's a Linux-related video. Um, I'm not sure if I should do it because it that's, uh, you know, it's not a lot of money, but it is kind of a lot of money for a YouTube video that won't make me any money, if you know what I'm saying here, yeah, right? Um, I think it might be a good video, I'm not sure, uh, but if that sounds interesting to you, uh, you know, it, it, I would be buying this thing specifically to make a video about it. I have no other use case for it, but I think it would make for an interesting video. Uh, I'm trying not to give spoilers, uh, but if that sounds interesting to you, uh, consider going over to my Patreon and pledging some money. Uh, I will put my own money into it as well, but if that sounds like an interesting video, you know, go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm not super desperate for money, so obviously consider your own financial situation primarily. Uh, the video doesn't have to get made and so on, uh, but if I do decide to make it, it's more likely to happen if I have a little bit of extra from the Patreon to fund this particular purchase. Uh, also, my channel's been growing a little bit, which is nice. Uh, I don't know if it's that nice. Actually, you know what? I've changed my mind. It's kind of weird. I don't like it. Stop growing. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's the outro to this video. Uh, now I have to think of a title. Let's see. What's a good title? I, what did I name the last one? Seven hours and 48 minutes of podcast, because apparently that's just what I do now. And the previous one was the Unwatchable 12-Hour Podcast. And the previous one was six hours of podcast to relax slash study to. Uh, I could call it... Um, another Overly Long Podcast. Maybe. I'll, I'll think of something. Maybe I'll ask Bing to do it for me. Let's see what Bing has in store. Uh, um, come up with a title for a sequel to this video, and then I will copy paste the link. Life on on the planet. Shut up, me. Let's see what Bing AI has to say about that, eh? Oh, it's waiting. Welcome to silence, by the way. What the fuck? Bing is so shit. <laughs> it is so broken. For some reason, it thinks it thinks that the title is the the video you shared is titled BBC YouTube. Wait, did I fuck... And then the link doesn't even work. Bro, Bing is broken. I don't know how... Pe I, I don't know how people think this shit is good. After using it for a while, it is 
become patently obvious to me that this technology is not particularly good. Uh, I haven't talked about it much because everyone is... Uh, sorry, wrong, let me just uh, say I... Let's just pretend I got it wrong. Sorry, wrong link. Uh, this is the correct one. Okay. Uh, but yeah... Uh, everyone's always talking about AI so much these days that I just don't want to fucking annoy people by talking about it myself. I probably have talked about it too much already. Yeah, okay, this this Bing has no fucking clue what it's doing. It doesn't. It's just making shit up. The video you shared is titled Create Cars and Cause Chaos in Pit Crew Co-op Co Game Speed Crew and it is the trailer for a video game that is coming soon to Nintendo Switch and PC. Not, not correct. Nope, that is not what the video is. The video is... Uh, Seven hours and 48 minutes of podcast, because apparently that's just what I do now. Uh, what about a sequel to a video with this title? Let's try that. See if Bing can come up with anything interesting. That sounds like a very good... <laughs> it, Bing responded, That sounds like a very long podcast. A possible title for a sequel to a video with that title could be 8 hours and 12 minutes of podcast because I have no luck. Yo, this is actually good. 7 hours and 49 minutes of podcast because I'm addicted to this. 7 hours and 47 minutes of podcast because I ran out of topics. 7 hours and 50 minutes of podcast because why not? 8 hours of podcast because I'm trying to break a record. I like the I'm addicted to this one. That's pretty... F I, these are all good, actually. I like these a lot. Um... I'm going to use one of these. I think I'll do... It's not going to be the correct time, but let's see. It's going to be like eight and a half hours of podcast, or actually it's probably less than that. Should, should I just try and hit the, the, the eight minutes 30 mark? Uh, here, I'll, I'll just... Uh, well, I'll just end the video here, and I'll call it whatever the timestamp is. So uh, subscribe. Or don't. Actually, don't. I, I don't know why I said that. See, I'm fucking brainwormed by YouTube algorithm. I don't... You're, if you're at the end of this video, you're already subscribed. Let's be honest. And also, I don't care. I'm fucking brainwormed by the algorithm. I'm not immune to propaganda. I'm not immune to propaganda.